Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Exile's Honor, a novel of Valdemar, by Mercedes Lackey, narrated by Paul Woodson. Prologue Silver stamped restively as another horse on the picket line shifted and blundered into his hindquarters. Alberich clucked to quiet him and patted the stallion's neck. The beast swung his head about to blow softly into the young captain's hair. Alberich smiled a little, thinking wistfully that the stallion was perhaps the only creature in the entire camp that felt anything like friendship for him. And possibly the only creature that isn't waiting for me to fail, hoping that I will, and ready to pounce on me and cut me to pieces when I do. Life for an officer of Carsite troops was spent half in defeating the enemies of Carsi and half in watching his own back. Amazingly gentle for a stallion, Silver had caused no problems either in combat or here, on the picket line. Which was just as well, for if he had, Alberich would have had him gelded or traded off for a more tractable mount, gift of the voice of Vicondis' sun-lord or no. Alberich had enough troubles without worrying about the behavior of his beast. He wasn't sure where the handsome and muscular creature had come from. Shinain bred, they'd told him. The voice had chosen the beast especially for him, out of a string of animals liberated from the enemy, which meant war booty, of course, from one of the constant conflicts along the borders. Silver hadn't come from one of the bandit nests, that was sure. The only beasts the bandits owned were as disreputable as their owners. Horses liberated from the bandits usually weren't worth keeping. They were so run down and ill-treated. Silver probably came from Menmelith via Rethwellen. The king was rumored to have some kind of connection with the horse-breeding, bloodthirsty Shinain nomads. Whatever. When Alberich lost his faithful old smoke a few weeks ago, he hadn't expected to get anything better than the obstinate, intractable gelding he'd taken from its bandit owner. But fate ruled otherwise. The voice chose to honor him with a superior replacement, along with his commission. The letter that accompanied the paper pointing out that silver was the perfect mount for a captain of light cavalry. It was also another evidence of favoritism from above— with the implication that he had earned that favoritism outside of performance in the field. Talk about a double-edged blade. Both the commission and the horse came with burdens of their own. Not a gift that was likely to increase his popularity with some of the men under his command, and a beast that was going to make him pretty damned conspicuous in any encounter with the enemy. A white horse might as well paint a target on his back and have done with it. Plus, that's an unlucky color. Those witchy heralds of Valdemar ride white horses, and the blue-eyed beasts may be demons or witches, too, for all I know. The priests say they are. The priests call their owners the demon riders. The horse nuzzled him again, showing as sweet a temper as any lady's mare. He scratched its nose and its side with content. He wished he could be as contented. Things had been bad enough before getting his commission. Now. There was an uneasy, prickly sensation between his shoulder blades as he went back to brushing down his new mount. He glanced over his shoulder to intercept the glare of Lieutenant Herdal. The man dropped his gaze and brushed his horse's flank vigorously, but not quickly enough to prevent Alberich from seeing the hate and anger in the hot blue eyes. No, indeed, the voice had done Alberich no favors in rewarding him with the captaincy and this prize mount, passing over Herdal and Klaus, both his seniors in years of service, if not in experience. Neither of them had expected that he would be promoted over their heads. During the week's wait for word to come from headquarters, they had saved their rivalry for each other. Too bad they didn't murder each other, he thought resentfully then suppressed the rest of the thought. It was said that some of the priests of Vacandis could pluck the thoughts from a man's head. It could have been thoughts like that one that had led to Herdal's being passed over for promotion. But it could also be that this was a test, a way of flinging the ambitious young Lieutenant Alberich into deep water to see if he would survive the experience. If he did, well and good. He was of suitable material to continue to advance— perhaps even to the rank of commander. If he did not, 
Well, that was too bad. If his ambition undid him, or if he wasn't clever enough to see and avoid the machinations of those below him, then he wasn't fit enough for the post. That was the way of things in the armies of Carsey. You rose by watching your back, and if the occasion arose, sticking careful knives into the backs of your less cautious fellows and ensuring other enemies took the punishment. All the while, the priests of the Sun Lord, the ones who were truly in charge, watched and smiled and dispensed favors and punishments with the same dispassionate aloofness displayed by the one God. Carsey was a hard land, and the Sun Lord a hard God. The Sun Priests were as hard as both. But Alberich had given a good account of himself along the border, at the corner where Carsey met Men Melmoth and the witch nation Valdemar, in the campaign against the bandits there. Frankly, Herdal and Klaus put together hadn't been half as effective or as energetic as he'd been. He'd earned his rank, he told himself once again, as Silver stamped and shifted his weight beneath the strokes of Alberich's brush. The spring sun burned down on his head, hotter than he expected without the breeze to cool him, hot as Herdal's angry glare. Demons take Herdal. There was no reason to feel as if he'd cheated to get where he was. He'd led more successful sorties against the bandits in his first year in the field than the other two had achieved in their entire careers. He'd cleared more territory than anyone of lieutenant rank ever had in that space of time. And when Captain Anberg had met with one too many arrows, the men had seemed perfectly willing to follow him when the voice chose him over the other two candidates. It had been the policy of late to permit the brigands to flourish, provided they confined their attentions to Valdemar and the Menmeleth peasantry, and left the inhabitants of Carsey unmolested. A stupid policy, in Alberich's opinion. You couldn't trust bandits. That was the whole reason why they became bandits in the first place. If they could be trusted, they'd be in the army themselves, or in the temple guard, or even have turned mercenary. He'd seen the danger back when he was a youngster in the academy, in his first tactics classes. He'd even said as much to one of his teachers, phrased as a question, of course, since cadets were not permitted to have opinions. The question had been totally ignored. Perhaps because it wasn't wise to so much as hint that the decisions of the sun priests were anything other than divinely inspired. But, as Alberich had predicted, there had been trouble from the brigands once they began to multiply, problems that escalated far, far past the point where their use as an irritant to Valdemar was outweighed by their effect as a scourge on Carsey. With complete disregard for the unwritten agreements between them and Carsey, they struck everyone, and when they finally began attacking villages instead of just robbing solitary travelers or going after single farms, the authorities deemed it time they were disposed of. Alberich had spent a good part of his young life in the Carsite military schools, and had just finished cavalry training as an officer when the troubles broke out. The ultimate authority was in the hands of the voices, of course. The highest anyone not of the priesthood could expect to rise was to commander. But officers were never taken from the ranks. Many of the rank and file were conscripts, and although it was never openly stated, the voices did not trust their continued loyalty if they were given power. Alberich, and many others like him, had been selected at the age of thirteen by a voice sent every year to search out young male children, strong of body and quick of mind, to school into officers. And there was one other qualification, that at least half of them be low-born, so that they were appropriately grateful to the voices for their opportunity to rise in rank and station. Alberich had all those qualities, developing expertise in many weapons with an ease that was the envy of his classmates, picking up his lessons in academic subjects with what seemed to be equal ease. It wasn't ease. It was the fact that Alberich studied long and hard, knowing that there was no way for the bastard son of a tavern wench to advance in Carsey, except in the army. There was no place for him to go. No way to get into a trade, no hope for any but the most menial of jobs. The voices didn't care about a man's parentage once he was chosen as an officer. They cared only about his abilities, and whether or not he would use them in service to his god and country. It was a lonely life, though. 
His mother had loved and cared for him to the best of her abilities, and he'd had friends among the other children of similar circumstances. When he came to the academy, he had no friends, and his mother was not permitted to contact him, lest she distract him or contaminate his purity of purpose. Alberich had never seen her again, but both of them had known this was the only way for him to live a better life than she had. And there had been a half-promise, which she had no way of knowing was kept, that if he did well at the academy his mother would be rewarded, perhaps with a little house of her own, if she could manage to keep herself from further sin. He had trusted in that particular voice, though. The priest had no reason to lie to him, and every reason to give his mother that reward. After all, Carsey needed officers, willing officers, and young boys eager to throw themselves into their studies with all the enthusiasm of youth in order to become those willing officers, knowing that their parents would be taken care of provided plenty of incentive. And he had done better than well. He had pushed himself harder than any of his classmates pushed themselves. Friends? When did I have the time for friends? Up before dawn for extra exercise, all my spare time practicing against the older boys, and after dinner, studying by the light of Vacandus's lamps in the temple until the priests came in for midnight prayers. Alberich had no illusions about the purity of the one god's priesthood. There were as many corrupt and venal priests as there were upright, and more fanatic than there were forgiving. He had seen plenty of the venal kind in the tavern when they passed through his little mountain village on the way to greater places, had hidden from one or two that had come seeking pleasures strictly forbidden by the one god's edicts. He had known they were coming, looking for him, and had managed to make himself scarce long before they arrived. Just as, somehow, he had known when the voice was coming to look for young male children for the academy and had made certain he was noticed and questioned, and that he had known which customers it was safe to cadge for a penny in return for running errands, or that he had known that drunk was going to try to set the stable afire. Oh, that had been a tricky thing to manage, to stay awake despite aching eyes that threatened to close long enough to be able to stumble out of bed and into the courtyard in search of a drink from the pump, just in time to see the first flames. No matter how much noise is in a tavern, the sound of a child's shrill scream will penetrate it. No matter how drunk the inhabitants, the cry of fire will get the appropriate response. Somehow, that was Alberich's secret. He knew things were going to happen. That was a witch power, and forbidden by the voices of the one god. If anyone knew he had it, the fires and the cleansing... Oh, of course, those whom the one God favors are supposed to be able to endure the fires and walk from the ashes cleansed. Not that anyone has ever seen that happen. But he had also known, from the time that the visions first came on him, as surely as he had known all the rest, that he had to conceal the fact that he had this power, even before he knew the law against it. He'd succeeded fairly well over the years, though it was getting harder and harder all the time. The power struggled inside him, wanting to break free, once or twice overwhelming him with visions so intense that for a moment he was blind and deaf to everything else. It was getting harder to concoct reasons for knowing things he had no business knowing, like the hiding places of the bandits they were chasing, the bolt holes and escape routes. But it was harder still to ignore them, especially when subsequent visions showed him innocent people suffering because he didn't act on what he knew. He brushed Silver's neck vigorously, the dust tickling his nose and making him want to sneeze. And between one brush stroke and the next he lost his sense of balance, went light-headed, and the dazzle that heralded a vision to come sparkled between his eyes and Silver's neck. Not here, he thought desperately, clinging to Silver's mane and trying to pretend there was nothing wrong. Not now, not with Herdal watching. But the witch power would not obey him, not this time. No, Sun Lord, help me, not now. He believed in the Sun Lord, in his power and goodness, if not in the goodness of those who said they spoke for him. A flash of blue light, blinding him. Then came sight again, but not of the picket line, but another place. Where, where? 
Sun Lord, where? The bandits he'd thought were south had slipped behind him into the north, joining with two more packs of the Kurs, becoming a group large enough to take on his troops and give them an even fight. But first they wanted a secure base. They were going to make Alberich meet them on ground of their choosing, fortified ground. That this ground was already occupied was only a minor inconvenience, one that would soon be dealt with. He fought free of the vision for a moment, clinging to Silver's shoulder like a drowning man, both hands full of the beast's silky mane, while the horse curved his head back and looked at him curiously. The big brown eyes flickered blue briefly, like a half-hidden flash of lightning reflecting another burst of sapphire, and now, now he knew where. The bandit's target was a fortified village, a small one built on the top of a hill above the farm fields. Ordinarily, these people would have no difficulty in holding off a score of bandits, but there were three times that number ranged against them, and a recent edict from the High Temple decreed that no one but the Temple Guard and the army could possess anything but the simplest of weapons. Not three weeks ago, a detachment of priests and a voice had come through here, divesting them of everything but knives, farm implements, and such simple bows and arrows as were suitable for waterfowl and small game. And while they were at it, a third of the able-bodied men had been conscripted for the regular army. Alberich's own troops had acted as silent guards for the process, to ensure that there were no incidents while the conscripts were marched away, while the weapons were taken or destroyed. Yes, he knew this place. Knew it too well. These people didn't have a chance. The bandits drew closer under the cover of a brush-filled ravine. Alberich found himself on Silver's back, without knowing how he'd gotten there, without remembering that he'd flung saddle and bridle back on the beast. No, not bridle. Silver still wore the halter he'd had on the picket line. Alberich's bugle was in his hand. Presumably he'd blown the muster, for his men were running toward him, buckling on swords and slinging quivers over their shoulders. Blinding flash of sapphire, throwing him back into the vision, showing him what he would rather not see. He knew what was coming, so why must he see it? The bandits attacked the village walls, overpowering the poor man who was trying to bar the gate against them, and swarming inside. He couldn't close his eyes to it. The vision came through, eyes closed or open. He would look, because he had no choice. It hadn't happened yet. He knew that with the surety with which he knew his own name. It wasn't even going to happen in the next few moments. But it was going to happen soon. They poured inside, cutting down anyone who resisted them, then throwing off what little restraint they had shown and launching into an orgy of looting and rapine. Alberich gagged as one of them grabbed a pregnant woman and with a single slash of his sword murdered the child that ran to try and protect her, followed through to her... The vision released him, and he found himself surrounded by dust and thunder, still on Silver's back. But leaning over the stallion's neck, as now he led his troops up the road to the village of Sunsdale at full gallop, hooves pounded the packed earth of the road, making it impossible to hear or speak. The vibration thrummed into his bones as he shifted his weight with the stallion's turns. Silver ran easily with no sign of distress, though all around him and behind him the other horses streamed saliva from the corners of their mouths, and their flanks ran with sweat and foam as they strained to keep up. The lack of a bit didn't seem to make any difference to the stallion. He answered to neck rein and knee so readily he might have been anticipating Alberich's thoughts. Alberich dismissed the uneasy feelings that prompted. Better not to think that he might have a second witch power along with the first. He'd never shown any ability to control beasts by thought before. There was no reason to think he could now. The stallion was just superbly trained, that was all. And he had more important things to worry about. They topped the crest of a hill. Sunsdale lay atop the next one, just as he had seen in his vision, and the brush-filled ravine beyond it. There was no sign of trouble. This time it's been a wild hare, he thought, and his skin crawled at the thought that he'd roused the men and sent them here at the gallop, and there were sure to be questions asked, for which he had no answers. And I answer what? 
that I wanted to see how quick they'd respond to an emergency? That would hardly serve. He was just about to pull Silver up and bring the rest of his men to a halt, no point in them running their horses into foundering, when a flash of sunlight on metal betrayed the bandit's location. Alberich grabbed for the bugle dangling from his left wrist instead, and pulled his blade with the right. He sounded the charge and led the entire troop down the hill, an unstoppable torrent of hooves and steel, hitting the brigand's hidden line like an avalanche. Sword in hand, Alberich limped wearily to another body sprawled amid the rocks and trampled weeds of the ravine, and thrust it through to make death certain. His sword felt heavy and unwieldy, his stomach churned, and there was a sour taste in his mouth. He didn't think he was going to lose control of his guts, but he was glad he was almost at the end of the battle line. He hated this part of the fighting, which wasn't fighting at all. It was nothing more than butchery, but it was necessary. This scum was just as likely to be feigning death as to actually be dead. Other officers hadn't been that thorough, and hadn't lived long enough to regret it. Silver was being fed and watered along with the rest of the mounts by the youngsters of Sunsdale, the finest fodder and clearest spring water, and a round dozen young boys to brush and curry them clean. And the men were being fed and made much of by the older villagers. Gratitude had made them forgetful of the loss of their weapons and many of their men. Suddenly the army that had conscripted their relatives was no longer their adversary. Or else, since the troops had arrived out of nowhere like vengeance of the Sun Lord himself, they assumed the one god had a hand in it, and it would be prudent to resign themselves to the sacrifice. And meanwhile, the instrument of their rescue probably ought to be well treated. Except for the captain, who was doing a dirty job he refused to assign to anyone else. Alberich made certain of two more corpses, and looked dully around for more. There weren't any, and he decided, when he spotted a pool of clear rainwater a little farther down the ravine, that he had to wash. He had to get the blood off his hands, and the stink of death out of his nostrils. He picked his way down the rocks to the pool, not rainwater after all, but fed by a tiny trickle of a spring, a mere thread of clear water that didn't even stir the surface of the pool. He bent over it, and caught his own reflection staring back at him. A sober fellow, with a face of sharp planes and uncompromising angles, a stubborn mouth, his mother had always said, and eyes that stared unnervingly back at him. Hawk eyes, said some, with a fierce and direct gaze. Dark hair, cut as short as possible to fit beneath a helm's padding. Skin burned dark by the sun. He looked at the reflection as if he was looking at a stranger, hunting for... what? The taint of witchery? He saw only a toughened man with eyes that looked, perhaps, a trifle haunted. Suddenly he didn't want to look any more, or more closely. Introspection is for poets, not men like me. He bent quickly to wash, disrupting the reflection. When he straightened to shake the water off his arms and face... He saw to his surprise that the sun was hardly more than a finger's breadth from the horizon. Shadows already filled the ravine. The evening breeze had picked up, and it was getting chilly. Last year's weeds tossed in the freshening wind as he gazed around at the long shadows cast by the scrubby trees. More time had passed than he thought, and if he didn't hurry he was going to be late for sun descending. He scrambled over the slippery rocks of the ravine, cursing under his breath as his boots meant for riding, skidded on the smooth, rounded boulders. The last thing he needed now was to be late for a holy service, especially this one. The priest here was bound to ask him for a thanks prayer for the victory. If he was late, it would look as if he was arrogantly attributing the victory to his own abilities, and not the hand of the Sun Lord. And with an accusation like that hanging over his head, he'd be in danger not only of being deprived of his current rank, but of being demoted into the ranks with no chance of promotion. A step up from stable hand, but not a big one. He fought his way over the edge and half ran, half limped to the village gates, reaching them just as the sun touched the horizon. 
He put a little more speed into his weary, aching legs, and got to the edge of the crowd in the village square a scant breath before the priest began the first chant. He bowed his head with the others, and not until he raised his head at the end of it did he realize that the robes the priest wore were not black, but red. This was no mere village priest. This was a voice. He suppressed his start of surprise and the shiver of fear that followed it. He didn't know what this village meant, or what had happened to require posting a voice here, but there was little wonder now why they had submitted so tamely to the taking of their men and the confiscation of their weapons. No one sane would contradict a voice. The voice held up his hand, and got instant silence, a silence so profound that the sounds of the horses stamping and wickering on the picket line came clearly over the walls. In the distance a few lonely birds called, and the breeze rustled through the new leaves of the trees in the ravine. Alberich longed suddenly to be able to mount Silver and ride away from here, far away from the machinations of voices and the omnipresent smell of death and blood. He yearned for somewhere clean, somewhere that he wouldn't have to guard his back from those he should be able to trust. Today this village was saved from certain destruction, the voice said, his words ringing out but without passion, without any inflection whatsoever. And for that we offer thanksgiving to the Candis Sun Lord, Most High, One God, to whom all things are known. The instrument of that salvation was Captain Alberich, who mustered his men in time to catch our attackers in the very act. It seems a miracle— during the speech, some of the men had been moving closer to Alberich, grouping themselves around him to bask in the admiration of the villagers. Or so he thought, until the voice's tone hardened, and his next words proved their real intent. It seems a miracle, but it was not, he thundered. You were saved by the power of the one god whose wrath destroyed the bandits, but Alberich betrayed the Sun Lord by using the unholy powers of witchcraft. Seize him! His heart froze, but his body acted and he whirled. The men grabbed him as he turned to run, throwing him to the ground and pinning him with superior numbers. He fought them anyway, struggling furiously, until someone brought the hilt of a knife down on the back of his head. He didn't black out altogether, but he couldn't move or see. His eyes wouldn't focus, and a gray film obscured everything. He felt himself being dragged off by the arms, heaved into darkness, felt himself hitting a hard surface, heard the slamming of a door, then heard only confused murmurs as he lay in shadows, trying to regain his senses and his strength. Gradually his sight cleared, and he could make out walls on all sides of him close enough to touch. The last light of dusk made thin blue lines of the cracks between each board. He raised his aching head cautiously, and made out the dim outline of an ill-fitting door. The floor clearly was dirt, and smelled unmistakably of foul birds. They must have thrown him into some kind of shed, something that had once held chickens or pigeons. It didn't now, for the dirt floor was clean and packed as hard as rock. He was under no illusions that this meant his prison would be easy to escape. Out here the chicken sheds were frequently built better than the houses, for chickens were more valuable than children. Children ate. Chickens and eggs were to be eaten. Still, once darkness descended, it might be possible to get away. If he could overpower whatever guards the voice had placed around him, if he could find a way out of the shed, if he could get past the voice himself. There were stories that the voices had other powers than plucking the thoughts from a man's head, stories that they commanded the services of demons tamed by the Sun Lord, and he knew those stories were true. He'd heard the night demons ranging through the dark, off in the far distance. No dog ever produced those wails, no wolf ever howled like that, and no owl conjured those bone-chilling shrieks from its throat. And once, from a distance, he'd seen the result of one of those hunts. Whatever the demons had left behind wasn't human anymore. 
While he lay there gathering his wits, another smell invaded the shed, overpowering even the stench of old bird droppings. A sharp, thick smell. It took a moment for him to recognize it. But when he did, he clawed his way up the wall he'd been thrown against, to stand wide-eyed in the darkness, nails digging into the wood behind him, heart pounding with stark terror. Oil. They had poured earth oil, the kind that bubbled up in black sticky pools in this area around the foundations, splashed it up against the sides of the shed. And now he heard them out there, bringing piles of dry brush and wood to stack against the walls, the punishment for witchery was burning, and they were taking no chances. They were going to burn him now. The noises outside stopped. The murmur of voices faded as his captors moved away. Then the voice called out once, a set of three sharp, angry words, and every crack and crevice in the building was outlined in yellow and red as the entire shed was engulfed in flames from outside. Alberich cried out and staggered away from the wall he'd been leaning against. The shed was bigger than he'd thought, but not big enough to protect him. The oil they'd spread so profligately made the flames burn hotter, and the wood of the shed was old, weathered, and probably dry. Within moments the very air scorched him. He hid his mouth in a fold of his shirt, but his lungs burned with every breath. His eyes streamed tears of pain as he turned, burning staggering, searching for an escape that didn't exist. One of the walls burned through, showing the flames leaping from the wood and brush piled beyond it. He couldn't hear anything but the roar of the flames. At any moment now the roof would cave in, burying him in burning debris. Look out! He heard the warning, or how he knew to stagger back as far as he could without being incinerated on the spot he did not know. But a heartbeat after that warning shout in his mind, a hole opened up in the side of the shed with a crash. Then a huge silver-white shadow lofted through the hole in the burning wall and landed beside him. It was still wearing his saddle and hackamore, and it turned huge, impossibly blue eyes on him as he stood there gaping at it. It? No. Him. On! The stallion snapped at him. The roof's about to go. Whatever fear he had of the beast... He was more afraid of a death by burning. With hands that screamed with pain, he grabbed the saddle bow and threw himself onto it. He hadn't even found the stirrups when the stallion turned on his hind feet. There was a crack of collapsing wood as fire engulfed them. Burning thatch fell before and behind them, sparks showering as the air was sucked into the blaze, hotter. But amazingly, no fire licked at his flesh once he had mounted. Alberich sobbed with relief as the cool air surged into his lungs. The stallion's hooves hit the ground beyond the flames, and he gasped with pain as he was flung forward against the saddlebow. Then the real pain began, the torture of half-scorched skin and the broken bones of his capture, jarred into agony by the stallion's headlong gallop into the night. The beast thundered toward the villagers, and they screamed and parted before it. Soldiers and voice alike were caught unaware, and not one of them raised a weapon in time to stop the flight. Stay on, the stallion ordered grimly into his mind as the darkness was shattered by the red lightning of his own pain. Stay on, stay with me. We have a long way to go before we're safe. Stay with me. Safe where? he wanted to ask, but there was no way to ask around the pain. All he could do was to hang on, and hope he could do what the horse wanted. Through the darkness, under a moonless sky, through cold that froze him as his burns made him feverish, pain became a constant. He'd have screamed, but he hadn't the strength, wept, but his eyes were too sore and dry. Yet Alberich was no stranger to pain. It could be endured, and he would endure it. It could be conquered. He would not allow it to conquer him. Somewhere in the midst of the living nightmare came the thought that if he lived through this, his own mother would never recognize him, he'd been burned so badly. He would forever wear a face seamed by scars. An eternity later, dawn rising as red as the flames that had nearly killed him, the stallion had slowed to a walk. 
Dawn was on their right, which meant that the stallion was heading north across the border, into the witch kingdom of Valdemar. Which only made sense, since what he'd thought was a horse had turned out to be one of the blue-eyed witch beasts. None of it mattered. Now that the stallion had slowed to a walk, his pain had dulled, but he was exhausted and out of any energy to think or even feel with. What could the witches do to him, after all? Kill him? At the moment it would be a kindness, and anyway it was only what his own people wanted to do to him. The stallion stopped, and he looked up, trying to see through the film that had come over his vision. At first he thought he was seeing double. Two white witch-beasts and two white-clad riders blocked the road. But then he realized that there were two of them hastily dismounting, reaching for him. He let himself slide down into their hands, hearing nothing he could understand, only a babble of strange syllables. Then, in his mind, Can you hear me? I, what? he replied without thinking. Taver says his name's Alberich, came a second voice in his head. Alberich, can you stay with us a little longer? We need to get you to a healer. You're going into shock. Fight it for us. Your companion will help you if you let him. Is what? He shook his head, not in negation, in puzzlement. Where was he? All his life he'd heard that the witches of Valdemar were evil, but... And all our lives we've heard that nothing comes out of Carsey but brigands and bad weather, said the first voice, full of concern but with an edge of humor to it. He shook his head again and peered up at the person supporting him on his right. A woman older than he, with many laugh lines etched around her generous mouth. She seemed to fit that first voice in his head somehow. She was smaller than he, diminutive in fact, but she had an aura of authority that was all out of proportion to her height. So which are you, Alberich? she asked, as he fought to stay awake, feeling the presence of the stallion, his companion, like a steady shoulder to lean against deep inside his soul. Brigand or bad weather? Neither, I hope, he replied absently, clinging to consciousness as she'd asked. Good. I'd hate to think of a companion choosing a brigand to be a herald, she said, with her mouth twitching a little as if she was holding back a grin. And a thunderstorm in human guise would make uncomfortable company. Choosing? he asked. What, what do you mean? I mean that you're a herald, my friend, she told him. Somehow your companion managed to insinuate himself across the border to get you, too. That's how heralds of Valdemar are made. Companions choose them. She looked up and away from him, and relief and satisfaction spread over her face at whatever it was she saw. And the rest of it can wait. Aaron's brought the healer we sent him for when Taver told us you were coming. Go ahead and let go. We'll take over from here. If a healer can't save you with three heralds to support him, then he's not worth the robe he wears. He took her at her word, and let the darkness take him. But her last words followed him down into the shadows, and instead of bringing the fear they should have given him, they brought him comfort, and a peace he never expected. It's a hell of a greeting, Harold Alberich, and a hell of a way to get here. But welcome to Valdemar, brother. Welcome. Part One Exile's Choice 1. He was not dead, that much at least he was certain of. At times, between the long moments when he was unaware of anything, he hurt quite enough to be in hell, but hell was cold and dark, and he wasn't cold. And the few times he was able to open his eyes, the room he was in was bathed in sunlight. He couldn't be in heaven either. If he was in heaven, he wouldn't hurt. That was one thing that everyone agreed on. In heaven was an end to all pain and sorrow. Pain he had in plenty, and as for sorrow, well, he'd consider sorrow when the pain ended. Therefore, he must be alive. The rest of what was going on around him, well, it was a mix of what he thought was hallucination and what surely must be madness. Now that fit with hell, except that there weren't any demons tormenting him only his own flesh. 
Around him voices muttered in a tongue he did not understand, but inside his head another voice murmured, imparting to him the sense of what he heard. And that was where the madness came in. That voice, low and strong and uncompromisingly masculine, informed him that he, Alberich, sworn to the service of Carsi and Vacandis Sunlord, the One God, was now a herald of Valdemar, and the voice belonged to his companion, one Cantor. Impossible. Not at all, the voice insisted. It began to wear at his stubborn refusal. He could feel his objection thinning. It clearly was not impossible because it had happened. He might not like it, but it was not impossible. He slept, woke hurting, was murmured over and moved, fed and cleaned. The pain ebbed, and he slept again. From time to time the bandages on his face were taken off, and he could open his eyes for a little. He was in a cheerful room that seemed to be tiled, and the bed he was on was soft and comfortable, which was good, because his face and arms were in agony, his lungs stabbed with every breath he took, and if he didn't have broken collarbones they were at least cracked. When he could see, there were generally two or three green-clad people in the room with him, and he seemed to recall that outside of Carsey there were healers who generally wore green. So apparently, if he wasn't delirious, he was being tended to, outside of Carsey by foreign healers. So whatever had happened, he wasn't in heaven or hell or prison, which had been a third option after all. Over and over he slept to wake in pain was given something that stopped the pain, and slept again. There was no way to tell how much time had passed, and no way to sort what he knew had happened from what the voice was telling him. Except that bit by bit, the words being spoken over his head became more intelligible, as if the language was slowly seeping into his fever-ravaged brain. This tongue, this arcane language, was like nothing he could have imagined. The syntax was all wrong, for one thing. These people spoke backward, sort of. Not that he was any kind of a linguist, but for a long time he was confused as much by the order of the words as the words themselves. He must be in Valdemar. The language was as twisted about as the demon riders and their hell horses, with the verbs coming in the middle instead of properly at the end. How could you tell what a sentence was truly about if you stuck the verb in the middle? The meaning could be entirely reversed by what came afterward. How was he learning these things? What demonic magic was putting them inside his brain? Or was this all a fever dream, and was he lying in the embers of the chicken shed, dying of his burns, conjuring all of this up? He had saved the village with his witch power. He had been condemned to burn by a voice. He had been imprisoned, and his prison set afire. But after that, madness. Illusion, hallucination, delirium, surely. But the voice in his head told him otherwise, and as the moments of his lucidity came more and more often, it began to tell him things he could verify for himself, little things, but none of which he could have hallucinated for himself. That, for instance, the reason why he was not able to open his eyes very often was because they had been bandaged shut. At first the skin of his face hurt so much he hadn't actually felt the bandages, and the skin of his hands was in such agony that he tried not to move them to touch anything, much less his face, which he wouldn't have wanted to touch anyway, given how much it hurt. The voice warned him when he was to be fed, and what they were going to give him. All soup, of course, and juices, and very, very often. The voice warned him when his bandages were to be changed, long before one of those healer people even got within hearing distance. And the voice told him about a great many other things. There is a large crow outside your window chosen, it would say. It is about to sound an alert, so do not be startled and jump, or you will hurt. And sure enough, a crow would burst out with a raucous shout, but since he'd been warned, he was able to keep still. Or... The healers have come with a new potion for you, to soothe your burns. They think this will hurt so much that they intend to give you an especially strong dose of pain medicine. And indeed, he would then hear footsteps, feel himself tilted up, and he would drink what was put to his lips quickly, 
because the last time they had come up with a new potion for his burns, the pain had been excruciating. He had always been a great believer in empirical evidence, and here it was. Slowly and with great reluctance, he began to sort through his confused memories. With even greater reluctance, he had to accept that what he thought was madness and delirium was nothing of the sort. So during one of his moments of relative lucidity, he steeled himself and confronted the voice. Relative was the operative term. He felt that he should be angry, embittered, but there were drugs interfering with those emotions, keeping him oddly detached. Perhaps that was just as well. He needed to think clearly, unemotionally, and this was as close to doing so as he was likely to manage. He coughed, hoping to clear his throat, but the voice in his head forestalled his attempt to speak aloud. Don't, Chosen. You don't need to actually say anything. Just think it. Think it. Well, he talked to himself in his mind all the time. This shouldn't be any different. It isn't. Except that when you get an answer, you needn't be concerned that madness runs in your bloodline. Not that it's likely that it was true madness that struck your father, all things considered. If it were my case to judge, I would have looked very carefully at his wife's family, and considered all the reasons they might have had for saying he was mad. He'd have winced if he hadn't known how much wincing would hurt. How had this voice... Cantor, Alberich. My name is Cantor. Cantor, then. How had this being known about his past? You've been quite generous in sharing your memories. A hint of dry irony. Actually, you've been shoving them down my throat. I know that your mother was not married, that your father was a prominent man in your village, and she anything but. I know that he was her only lover, and that at some point, when you were very young, he was sent away with your priests, supposedly mad. Alberich would have been flushing had his face not been so painful. He was embarrassed, but embarrassed because he had been essentially blurting out every detail of his past life to a stranger, like the sort of drunk who would sit down next to you and begin telling you everything you didn't want to know. The very idea made him a little sick. Not that I mind, truly, the voice continued earnestly. It's only that Harold and Companion usually grow to know each other in a more leisurely manner, and as yet you know very little of me. Another suppressed wince. He didn't really want to know anything about this Companion, did he? No, he didn't. This was a place full of witches, of which you might be one. And demons, and Vicandus only knew what other sorts of horrible creatures, wasn't it? Surely it was. Nonsense. You may be many things, Alberich, but a coward isn't one of them. I've asked the healers to have your pain medicines, so that we can have this little discussion without the drugs interfering. There are several truths that you will have to face today, and the first of them is that virtually everything you think you know about Valdemar is wrong. Actually, the unsteady realization of that had been trickling down into his mind for the past however long it had been. It had probably started when he'd fallen into the arms of those white-clad riders just over the border. If they'd been half as evil as the priests painted them, he'd have been roasting in chains right now with demons nibbling at his soul. Excellent. That's another thing that you aren't. Stupid. Those weren't just any heralds, by the way. One was the king's own herald, Talamir, and the other was the Lord Marshal's herald, Joyeuse. We stumbled onto the end of a rather sensitive diplomatic mission, it seems. There was a hint of a chuckle, and Alberich got the distinct impression that they hadn't merely stumbled into those particular heralds, that Cantor had aimed himself quite deliberately in their direction. Well, no harm done. He gathered his wits and thought a question. I do not suppose that the rank of our rescuers has anything to do with the speed with which I was taken to further help? The impression of a knowing smile. Not entirely. All heralds are considered highly important, even the newly chosen. He let that settle into his mind. Even Carsites? Well, since we've never had a Carsite herald before, there's no basis for comparison. There was a definite undertone there. 
Alberich decided that he was getting rapidly better at reading around what Cantor was actually telling him to what Cantor would rather just imply. The undertone was that not everyone would have been as open to the possibility of an ally out of Carsey as Harold's Talamir and Joyeux. Excellent again. I do believe we are rather well matched, Chosen. I would not go so far as to say that other heralds would have run you through on sight, but we have been fighting a rather nasty undeclared war with you for some time, and there are some hard feelings on our side of the border as well as yours, even among heralds. A sense of pondering followed that statement. In truth, especially among heralds, since your lot enjoys killing us so very much. Now no herald would ever slaughter someone who had been chosen out of hand, but there are many, many of them, who are not going to welcome you as a long-lost sibling. Just his good fortune that he'd never led troops against anything other than bandits then. At least no one would be holding a personal grudge against him. He licked lips that were dry and cracked, and stared into the darkness behind his bandages. Inexorably it was creeping up on him, acceptance that he could never go home again. He was in the enemy's land. He was exiled inexorably from his own. He had witch powers, and they were not the curse he'd been taught that they were. And one of the hell horses, which were not hellish at all, apparently, had selected him to become one of the demon riders. Please, Alberich, heralds, not demon riders. And as for my being hellish, a pregnant pause, well, Although the people of Valdemar would say that we companions are the sweetest, most marvelous of creatures, I suspect that several of your men who got in my way would agree that I am hellish, assuming any of them survived the experience. Oh, on the other hand, if one of them had been that voice, he was, came the reply, with a certain grim glee, though I am not certain that anyone like that voice of yours— Someone who goes about blithely burning people alive has any right to make any judgments about who is hellish and who isn't. Ah, the fact that you have never personally fought against us will be useful toward having you accepted, Cantor agreed. And there is at least one thing I can promise you. We will never, ever, under any circumstances, ask or require you to do anything against your conscience with regard to your homeland. I shan't promise we won't ask you to act against those in power there. Just at the moment, he'd rather like to have the skinny or fat necks of some of those in power between his hands. Well put. Cantor seemed satisfied with his answer. Now, the healers will have my tail for a banner if I don't let them drug you again, so I'll ask you to mull this discussion over while you drowse, and we'll have another little talk in a bit. He couldn't have objected if he wanted to, and he didn't want to, because the pain was getting unbearable and he heard the welcome footsteps of someone bringing him relief. After a quick, nasty-tasting draft, he was drifting again, cast loose from consciousness and what he'd always thought of as the truth, a state in which it was easier to contemplate a new set of truths, or at least truisms, in place of the old. He dreamed. He sat in the midst of a vast expanse of flowering meadow, flooded in a haze of light that made it difficult to see for any great distance. He was warm, comfortable, without pain of any kind, and completely alone. He rose and started to walk, wading knee-deep through wildflowers and herbs that gave off a hundred luscious scents as he brushed them aside. No matter how far he walked, however, the scene never changed, and he never found a path. The only living things were the plants. There were not even insects or birds. He felt no hunger, no thirst, no weariness. This fit every description of paradise that he'd ever heard, except that there was no one in this paradise but himself. As beautiful and peaceful as this place was, he was trapped here. And he came to realize, as he walked on in the thick golden light, that the peace came at the price of being unable to escape, and completely alone. Not paradise. Not even close. That was the end of the dream. 
As abruptly as it had begun, it was over, and Alberich dropped out of the meadow and into the usual fever dreams that he had fought since being brought here. From fever dream, he moved into welcome dreamlessness, and from then into the pain that always woke him when his medicines wore off. But it was not as bad as it had been, and he knew that the drugs being given him were not as strong as they'd been at first. Someone gave him a different tasting drink then, and he drowsed for a bit. Some time later he woke to the sound of someone, no, two people, walking into his room. Is he awake? asked a voice that was strange to him. He should be. I gave him a draft that should, well, sober him up completely, replied one that was more familiar, one of the healers who spent a great deal of Alberich's waking time with him. There was a touch on his chest, where there were no bandages other than the ones holding his cracked ribs in place. Sir, I am going to take off the bandages on your eyes and leave them off. The skin there is healed enough that you needn't have them on any more. I understand, he said, stumbling over the foreign words. The healer moved him as gently as could be, propped him up with cushions, and took off the bandages. Alberich blinked and squinted in the sunlight, taking his first proper look at the room he'd been in for, well, he didn't know how long. And now that he was thinking clearly, the very first thing he felt was a smoldering resentment. A shaggy-haired man in stained and well-worn green robes was coiling up bandages at the foot of the bed, but Alberich had very little interest in him, or in the room itself at the moment. It was the other occupant of the room, the one sitting right beside him, that captured his attention. This was a demon rider. This is Talamir, the king's own herald. Cantor corrected gently, speaking into his mind for the first time since he'd awakened. Alberich's jaw tightened, but he tried to look at the man, rather than react to him. What he saw was a tall, a very tall, thin man with graying brown hair, perhaps forty or fifty years old, if Alberich's judgment was any good. His was a careworn, lean face overlaid with gentle good humor, but with a strong chin that suggested a stubborn streak and a determination it would not be wise to invoke if you intended to quarrel with him. And of course he wore that dreaded white uniform, the emblem of the enemy, a more elaborate version than Alberich thought prudent or practical for a fighting man. Those are formal whites. Talamir has just come from a council session at the king's side, defending your presence here in Valdemar, in Haven, in the ranks of the heralds themselves, may I add. Alberich refused to be distracted from his careful scrutiny. The uniform? I would never done anything like this, he told himself fiercely. A silver-laced white velvet tunic, with silver embroidery at the hems, over a heavy white Samite shirt with wide sleeves caught in deep cuffs at the wrists, and white satin breeches. A wide white leather belt ornamented with hammered silver supported a dagger in a matching sheath. He'd have called it foppish except that it wasn't, but he could not imagine himself ever wearing anything so extravagant. The fabric alone, if sold, could feed a family for a year. Ah, and of course the nobles of Carsey, the wealthy merchants, the ranking captains, and above all the voices of the Sun Lord, dress and live so very austerely, came the unwelcome reminder. Well, you have been here some two weeks, sir. Talamir said, his hazel eyes scrutinizing Alberich just as closely as Alberich was examining him. I'm sure you have been wondering. Wondering, yes, Alberich replied, giving away nothing, conceding nothing, offering nothing. Talamir sighed. You could be more gracious. Alberich, yes, we know what your name is. You must know that my Taver has been talking virtually non-stop to your Cantor. And what Cantor knows about you, so do I. Talamir's eyes became very penetrating. I know very well that you have a good command of our tongue now, and furthermore your Cantor can easily explain anything you don't understand immediately. I should prefer not to spend this entire first interview fencing with you, if you please. Well, that gave him the opening he'd been looking for. My cantor, is it? he asked resentfully. And when was their asking on my part for this choosing, 
this so-called honor? Talamir shrugged. You could be dead right now, he pointed out. Whether you consider it an honor or not, Cantor saved your life. For which blessing? To serve my enemy I am bound? There was a sour taste in his mouth, and his stomach muscles were so tight as to make his cracked ribs ache in protest. He'd not only been kidnapped, he had been reduced to simple-mindedness with drugs. But now that he was himself again, he had no intention of rolling over like a cowed dog and licking the hands of his captors. I was not aware that Valdemar had personally done you harm, said Talamir. Nor was I aware that any citizen of Valdemar had hurt you. I was under the impression that everything untoward that had happened to you was the responsibility of the denizens of your own land. If you can point out to me who and what on this side of the border has wronged you, I assure you it will be dealt with to your satisfaction. Even if it Cantor is? he asked, and looked Talamir straight in the eyes. There was silence in his mind. Cantor, Talamir gazed on him with astonishment. Your companion, who under false pretenses and a disguise attached himself to me, who carried me off, who brought me here, where I would not have gone had I a choice been given, who, perhaps, had to do somewhat with my witch sight coming so clear and in front of a voice. He saw Talamir wince and felt his own mouth tighten in grim satisfaction. Who therefore could the cause be that the voice to the fires condemned me? You would be dead right now, Talamir repeated uncomfortably. You couldn't have denied your gift. With or without Cantor, sooner or later it would have betrayed you, and you would still have gone to the fires. But my own death it was, and mine was the choice to face or to escape it he pointed out, anger and resentment coloring every word. That choice from me was taken. Perhaps the witch sight I could have fought, taken from me also, was the option to try. And in the first place, had not the witch sight come upon me when and where it did, condemned I should not have been. A village might have gone under the sword, though. The silence that fell between them was as heavy and uncompromising as lead. But it was not Talamir who answered him. I am sorry, Alberich, said the voice in his mind, humbly and full of contrition. You are absolutely in the right. You had a life and choices, and I took them from you. I shan't even bother to make all of the arguments that a Valdemaran would accept. You aren't a Valdemaran, and there is no reason you should accept them. For you... My actions were nothing less than arrogance and a smug certainty that I was in the right to run roughshod over you. All I can do is apologize and try to make it right with you. He closed his eyes, his own heart contracting at the hurt and pain in that voice, armoring himself against it with the anger and resentment in his. A better way there could have been found, he said aloud. In a sense, Talamir replied quietly. This is between you and Cantor, but ultimately all of us are responsible, so I must apologize as well. We take such pride in our freedom here, and then we turned around and robbed you of yours. With the best intentions in the world, even the voice that to the fires sent me, good intentions may have had, Alberich retorted, opening his eyes again. If not to save my soul, then those souls about me. Again, Talamir winced. Served my people, did I, and served them well, he continued, bitterness overflowing at the thought that he had been forced to abandon those villagers who depended on him to stand vigilant guard over their safety. Who now protect them, Will? The voices? Ha! <laughs> those who willed in my place to stand? He glared, daring Talamir to answer him. I do not know, Talamir admitted quietly. But I have already offered any remedy that you could ask. What do you suggest? Name it, and I will do my personal best to see it done. In the face of such a reasonable answer, Alberich's anger suddenly collapsed, like an inflated bladder with a pin put to it. I, 
he began, and rubbed his eyes faced with uncertainty of monumental proportions. I know not. Would you have us undo what we have done? Talamir persisted. Alberich snorted. And how? Return I cannot. Notorious I am, doubtless. If ever a time for remedy was, it now long past is. Talamir sighed. We tell our youngsters that companion's choice is irrevocable and for life. But that is not altogether true. The bond can be broken between you, if you both want it broken badly enough. It will leave you damaged, but it can be broken. That held him silent for a moment. There was a bond between them. And if breaking it would leave him damaged, what would it do to Cantor? He thought about the pain in Cantor's mental words when the companion apologized and winced away from the very idea. No matter what had happened to him, he could not be responsible for creating more pain. This moots nothing, he replied, stalling. Nowhere to go now, have I? Talamir nodded. Well, in light of that, would you consider giving us, giving life here, a trial period? Surely no choice can properly be made without all the information you need. Once you know us as we are, I believe you will choose to remain in Valdemar, to choose the heralds. He opened his mouth and closed it again, because logically and unemotionally speaking, he honestly could not think of a good reason why he shouldn't do as the herald asked. I wish you would, said the wistful voice in his mind. In the Sun Lord, I still believe he began, bringing up the only remaining stumbling block that occurred to him. That is not an issue. Talamir waved that objection aside. It never was. But perhaps you would rather hear that from a true priest of the Sun Lord. He blinked. A voice of Vikandis. Here? Not a voice, Alberich. But I should let him speak for himself. Talamir murmured something to the healer, who nodded and went to the door of this room. He passed out of it, and another, much older man stepped inside, accompanied by a second about Alberich's age. Talamir rose and offered his seat to the older man who took it. This is Alberich, Father Henrik, he said. Alberich, this is Father Henrik, and acolyte Garrison, his assistant. Alberich eyed them both with caution. Neither wore the red robes of a voice, nor the black of an ordinary priest. Instead, the older man sported a similarly cut gown of fine, cream-colored wool, and the younger, a plainer robe of unbleached linen. Both had the familiar disc of the Sun Lord on a chain that hung down over the breast of their robes, however. "'You serve the Candis Sun Lord?' he asked, rather doubtfully. Father Henrik nodded gravely. I was born in Asherbeg, Captain, he said in unaccented car sight. I was taken into the service of the Sun Lord when I was eight, and made a full priest at twenty. Even as you, I am a child of car soil, and I still serve the Sun Lord. And at twenty-one, I was ordered to cleanse three children from the border village to which I had been assigned. Alberich went very still. And? he asked. The priest made a rude noise. What sort of monster do you take me for, Captain? he asked. I couldn't, of course. They were children, guilty of nothing more than having powers that the voices find inconvenient. Instead of cleansing them, I took them and escaped over the border with them, where I met with a herald who in turn took me to the temple here. We don't call it the Temple of Vacandis, of course. We refer to it as the Temple of the Lord of Light— but those who attend know it, and us, for what we are. Powers, Alberich said, feeling very stupid all of a sudden, as his anger and resentment drained away, leaving nothing behind. Inconvenient? Father Henrik looked as if he had gotten a mouthful of green mead. Those abilities that you have been taught are witch powers, and signs of the contamination of demons are nothing more than than inborn powers that a child has no more control over than he does over whether or not he will be a great musician, or a great cook, or a great swordsman. He doesn't? Alberich asked dumbly. Of course not, 
the priest snapped. And when these powers are something that the voices find useful, if the child is young enough to be trained, it is whisked into the temple rather than being burned. It is only those whose powers are of no use to the son of the sun, or who are too old to be molded into a pleasing shape, that are sent to the flames. Albrecht was glad that he was propped up by pillows, else he would have been reeling. The priest looked as if he had plenty more to say, but his assistant placed a cautionary hand on his arm. Father, enough, the younger man said in Valdemaran. This poor fellow looks as if you had just stunned him with a club. In truth, that is exactly what Alberich felt like. I, he faltered, I had no notion. You are not a stupid man, Captain, the old priest said roughly. And you have a mind young enough to be flexible if you will it. Try opening it. He flushed at the rebuke and felt horribly uncomfortable. This priest reminded him all too clearly of the old priest of his home, a crusty old man who had the respect of everyone in the village and whose speech was as blunt as his common sense was good. So well was he regarded, despite a short temper and curmudgeonly demeanor, that when a voice wished to have him replaced by a younger man, the entire village rose up in protest and the scheme was abandoned. But, he began, in an attempt to explain himself that he knew before he started would be futile. But, indeed, you have been given a great gift, Alberich of Carsey, a gift that can serve you and our people, an opportunity that will lead, well, I cannot tell where it will lead. The old man glared at him from beneath bushy eyebrows. There is a reason for all of this, I'm sure of it, as sure as I am that it is men and not the Sun Lord, who have made Carsey and Valdemar enemies. You say that you want to help our people. Our people are led by frauds and charlatans. Half, if not more, of the voices are false, and every high-ranking priest is corrupt. And now this happens. A soldier of Carsey is chosen to be a herald of Valdemar, and I doubt not it is by the will of the Sun Lord himself does that not seem like the hand of the Sun Lord himself to you? Alberich was covered in confusion. I cannot tell. Well, then trust that I can, the old man snapped. This is a gift, an opportunity beyond price. If you piss it away, I shall be most angry with you. And rest assured that when the time comes and you stand before Vacandis' throne, he will ask you why you threw away the gift he placed in your hands. For the God's sake, man, can't you see your sacred duty when it stares you in the face? Faced with that stern face of authority, of legitimate authority, what could he do or say? He tried to wrench his gaze away from the priest's eyes so that he could think, and found that he couldn't. But I was given no choice, he tried to protest. The priest snorted. Don't be daft, he retorted. You could have stayed there to die, and you didn't. You made your choice when you sensibly took the rescue that was offered. And as for having your life interfered with, Balderdash, if your companion had never sought you out and that particular voice hadn't discovered your gift, the thing you call a witch power, another would have. Only this time there would have been no rescue. And what is more, your so-called guilt could have been used to bring others to the fires, others who were innocent of anything except supporting you. Talamir was standing very patiently to one side, pretending to pay no attention to what was going on. Although, Alberich had to wonder, given what he'd said about the companions talking to one another and to him, if he wasn't managing to follow the entire conversation, despite having no working knowledge of Carsite. The priest glared a moment longer, then abruptly his expression softened. Lad, you're angry and resentful that your life has been turned upside down. You wouldn't be human if you weren't. You're bitter and in despair at being betrayed. You should be. But be bitter at the right people, not those who want only your welfare. If you're not frightened at being caught up in something you don't understand, I'd be very much surprised and I'd suspect that one of those blows to your head had addled your wits. Now, you think you're utterly alone. 
Well, you're not. I didn't know about you until a moment ago, Alberich began. The old man shook his head. That wasn't what I meant. I've been living here for better than forty years, and I've learned a thing or two about Harold's. No, I meant something else entirely. Open your heart, and I mean really open it to your companion, and you'll see what I mean. Alberich meant to shake his head in denial, but another stern look from the priest killed the gesture before he could make it. Don't argue, he said. Don't think of an excuse, just do it. And while you're at it, open your mind as well as your heart. The old man rose. I'll be going now, but if you need me, they know where to find me, or where to send you if you'd prefer, once you're on your feet. For that matter, I'm sure your companion would have no difficulty finding me wherever I happened to be, without you having to ask anyone but him. With that he nodded to Talamir and shuffled out, followed by his acolyte. The door closed behind them, and Alberich stifled a sound that was midway between a sigh and a groan. His sacred duty to join the heralds, was it? Hard words— thrown in the face of one who had lived his life by cleaving to duty, sacred or not. Hard words, spoken by one who had been forced to abandon a potentially better life than anything ahead of Alberich, because he could not reconcile orders with duty. If anyone had a right to be bitter, it was the priest. But there was no bitterness behind that rough-hewn exterior manner, and no duplicity either. Nothing but unvarnished, unadorned truth, as the old man had seen it. As he sees it. But with forty years more experience of this place than Alberich had. He swore under his breath. Pardon, Talamir said. I didn't quite hear what you said. Alberich was going to growl, nothing, and then changed his mind. I said, make a trial of you, I shall he answered, so brusquely, even rudely, that he was surprised that Talamir didn't take offense. But the herald didn't. Good, he said instead, and moved to follow in the steps of the priest and his helper. But he turned when he got the door opened. In that case, there is one thing I should like to ask you to do, he said, with another of those measuring looks. Before the healer returns— I should like you to open your mind to Cantor. Completely. I think, I hope, it will make a difference to you. He left the room then without waiting for Alberich's answer. But then, given that the priest had virtually ordered Alberich to do the same thing, he probably didn't need to wait. He already knew that, eventually at least, Alberich would make a trial of that too. Eventually. In his own time. Two. The healer fussed over him for a bit, then prepared to leave. On a low table, within easy reach, were a pitcher of water, a cup, and a vial of one of the pain-killing potions. Take it when you need it and are ready to sleep, the healer told him. Or not at all, if that's your choice, but drink the water. Alberich couldn't tell if the man's brusque manner was his ordinary demeanor, or due to discovering where Alberich had come from. It could be both, and maybe, now that he knew Alberich was from Carsey, he might be having second thoughts. Maybe that wasn't just an ordinary pain-killing potion. On the other hand, the man was leaving him with the potion and giving him the option of drinking it or not. Unlikely that it was poison. Why waste all that time and effort in healing him just to poison him? If the situations were reversed, a guest of the Sun Priests would likely not be treated at all much less given a comfortable room and pain-killing drugs. The potion will wear off about dinner time if you choose to drink it, the healer continued. It's about time for you to start feeding yourself again, instead of having someone ladle broth into you. Evidently they were ready to see the last of him. Well, the feeling was mutual. Alberich was more than ready to do without healers altogether. Already he'd had more attention for his injuries now than he'd ever had for every other injury in his life combined. Then the man left, closing the door behind him, leaving Alberich alone in his tiny cell of a room. 
Not that his quarters in the barracks, when he'd actually been in them which was rare, were any larger, but the two rooms could not have been more different. The outer wall of this room held a large window with actual glass panes in it. The wall directly opposite held the door. The other two walls were blank, and the room was tiled in a pale gray-green. A restful color, if a trifle dull. Tiles on a wall, though, that was something odd. For furnishings? Well, there were the bed he was on, a little three-legged table, and a stool to match. Not much need for a clothes chest in a sick room, he supposed. He was, he discovered, wearing only small clothes beneath his blankets and sheet. And they weren't even his small clothes. Everything about him that was car sight was gone. On the other hand, perhaps that was just as well. The less to mark him as the enemy, the better. From where he was lying in bed, all he could see was a single white cloud, a mere wisp of a thing, drifting from one side to the other. Not a very inspiring view. In fact, there was nothing much in this place to occupy the mind. Suddenly, he wanted to actually look out that window. He wanted to see more than just sky and clouds. He felt stifled. This was the longest period of time that he had spent without seeing the outside world since, well, he couldn't remember. Even when he'd been a cadet, he'd been outside, riding, exercising, training. Even when he'd been hurt before, he'd been in his own quarters, able, indeed expected, to get about and take up light duties. His hands were still bandaged, but lightly, and they didn't hurt so much any more. He could use them, carefully. Well, the sooner he got out of bed, the sooner he'd finish healing. Gingerly, he slid his legs out from under the covers and put his feet on the cold, tiled floor, sitting straight up on the edge of the bed. There was a painful twinge in his chest, an ungentle reminder of broken ribs. Nothing wrong with my legs, anyway. There were some pink patches, healing burns, but at least no one had broken any foot or leg bones when they'd beaten him. A good thing, too. If his leg had been broken, he'd never have been able to get onto Cantor's back now, would he? He'd been hurt in the line of duty often enough to note a pause after every movement to see how badly he felt. There was no point in undoing the work of healing by passing out and falling on the floor because he tried to leap out of bed like a healthy person. So he hesitated for a moment, with his feet chilling on the tiles, testing for a sign of weakness, waiting for his vision to blur or fade out. But other than those twinges, he was fine. So far, so good. Now the true test, standing up. If that didn't make him pass out, nothing would. It didn't. Now to get to the window. Moments later, moments that had felt like far longer, as half-heeled bits of him protested his movement vehemently with every step, he stood at the window, sweating, shaking, but looking out. What he saw was not what he had expected. He supposed he would look out on an enclosed courtyard, certainly something with high walls around it. Surely they would not have put him inside anything less secure. Instead, he saw gardens, wonderful gardens, and they were extensive enough that he couldn't see the walls that must certainly be there. These were no common pleasure parks or bits of waste ground for just anyone to stroll about on. Directly beneath his window was a graveled path, bordered on either side with a low herbaceous hedge. To either side of that were trees in ornamental clumps with planted beds of foliage arranged around and among them. The gardens themselves must have been very old, for the trees looked ancient, the grass as smooth and even as plush, the bushes and flowering plants as if they had been there since the beginning of time. There were stone benches and individual seats placed to best enjoy sun or shade, and lanterns hung from wrought metal stands beside the benches. Nowhere were there fences to keep people away from the plantings, or even confine them to the paths, except for that little hedge, and it wasn't even knee-high. Once or twice, Alberich had seen gardens like this behind the homes of the wealthy, but never this extensive. His room was on the second floor of this building, giving him an elevated view. It was a uniquely advantageous one for determining what his surroundings were like. 
There must have been a door directly below his window, for the path led up to it, and people were entering and leaving from directly below where he stood. Young people, he saw with a start. They wore tunics and trues, or long robes, in a paler color of green than the healer he had seen. Some of them couldn't be older than ten. Those are healer trainees, said Cantor tentatively. Where we are, it's Healer's Collegium, where young healers are taught, as well as being a house of healing. You're on the grounds of a complex that includes Herald's Collegium, where the heralds are trained, Healer's Collegium, and Bardic Collegium. And the palace. That's why all the gardens, of course, the pleasure gardens for the palace, the herb gardens for the healers, and kitchen gardens. They're open to everyone within the walls. The palace? They allowed him, a car site, to be within the same walls that enclosed the palace. Granted he was hurt, but still, if he were an assassin, he wouldn't let a little thing like that stop him. And most of the time he was unwatched, unguarded. How could they possibly trust him? You're with me, Cantor replied simply. The simple, bald statement took him utterly by surprise. He was with Cantor, and these people considered that to be enough to trust him within reach of the rulers of their land. He recalled the attitude of the healer and revised that. Some of them considered that to be enough. Or maybe he's just like that with all of his patients. He looked out on the gardens for a little before answering. So these people train healers in one central place? Mostly. Sometimes they apprentice with an older healer, or are trained at one of the temples of healing, especially if they are uneasy about leaving their homes, but that's rare. We prefer that our healers come here to learn, so that we know that they've gotten a standard education, and any special training that their gifts and talents might warrant. Cantor paused. Would you rather I not speak to you this way? He thought about it for a moment. It seemed to him that this sharing of thoughts should have seemed like a violation, yet it didn't. He couldn't account for that very foreign feeling, unless perhaps he'd gotten used to it while he was semi-conscious, so now it just didn't raise the instinctive alarm in him that it ordinarily would have. And he could not deny how useful it was to be able to silently speak and ask questions about this place and these people. No, I would rather you helped me. I said that I would give all of you a trial. I don't know that I can manage that without you. But where are you? Right here. He would not have believed that anything as big as a horse could have hidden itself virtually in plain sight. But there was just a little movement, and Cantor stepped into view through a screen of bushes. He was followed by two more of the white companions, then another two. They all stood just below his window to one side of the path, looking up at him with eyes so vivid a blue that even from here they struck him with their intensity. We're all five of us waiting for our chosen to heal in there, he said with wry humor. Heralds have a habit of winding up in the hands of healers. These people permitted horses in their formal gardens? He could just imagine the mess that would have caused in the garden of the Son of the Sun. We aren't exactly horses, Cantor reminded him. And here at the Collegia, people know they can trust us not to step on or eat the roses, or in this case, rosemary. Everyone here knows exactly what we are, and we can pretty much go where we wish and do what we want, even into the palace if we need to. Alberich looked down on them with reluctant interest. Now, with four more of these companions to compare Cantor with, it was very clear that Cantor was distinct among his kind. It hadn't been obvious how powerful he was when Alberich had only been comparing him with ordinary horses. There was some illusion on my part as well, Cantor admitted sheepishly. I hid my eye color, for one thing. But the other four were, well like graceful acrobats or dancers. Cantor was far more muscular, his head perhaps a bit blockier, his neck arched and strong, his hindquarters and chest definitely deeper and with fantastically developed muscles. I am a warrior, companion to a warrior, 
My friends need speed and endurance more than they need strength. I need strength and sheer power as well as stamina. No matter where your duties take you, I will always be able to fight at your side and guard your back. Cantor seemed very proud of that, and for the first time, Alberich felt himself warm to the creature, just a little. They had that much in common, at least. A warrior, companion to a warrior. At the moment, he felt rather less than half of that. There was a growing feeling in his gut, as if he should be trembling, as if in a moment he would. He knew that feeling. It meant he was coming to the end of his reserves. In fact, it was becoming rather urgent to sit down. He was not going to be able to stand at all soon. Maybe he shouldn't be surprised, considering all that had been done to him, and how recently. But it did seem as if his reserves of strength were not what they should have been. Then it dawned on him why it was that he should feel weaker than expected. It had been a healer, a real healer, in the room with him. Presumably the others who had cared for him were healers as well. He hadn't just been physicked and doctored. He'd been healed as he would have been under the skilled ministrations of a healer-priest in a temple. And that shocked him. They had actually gone so far as to have him healed, not just wait for him to get better on his own, as had always happened in the past, except for one single time when he had been badly hurt in training. A pure accident, when a bolt of lightning hit the training field, killed three horses outright, and sent the rest into a blind panic, and he'd been thrown and trampled. So no wonder he felt shaky and weak in the knees. Healing took of your own strength and resources, speeding up what normally took days and weeks into hours and days. He probably even weighed a great deal less than he had when they'd brought him here. Small wonder the healer wanted him to start feeding himself. There was no way that he could get enough nourishment to sustain healing on broth. You should go back to bed, Cantor admonished. I believe that I will, and take that pain potion the healer left for me while I'm at it. He knew that part of the drill well enough. It wasn't the first time he'd been hurt, though it was the first time it had been at the hands of his own people. And that? Well... Just at the moment, he would rather go back to bed and to the oblivion promised by the pain potion than think about it. Harold Talamir finished his informal report on the car site and waited to see what his king would make of it. So, our newest trainee is not at all pleased about being chosen, eh? King Sendar asked, or rather stated. This was no formal audience. It wasn't even witnessed by another herald, unless one counted the presence of Sendar's heir, his daughter, Selene, who was halfway through her training as a herald. They were all in Sendar's study, in the royal suite in the palace, the private study, not the one where those who were not intimate with the royal family would see the king privately. This room had been the queen's solar, until Sendar appropriated it for himself. It faced south and looked out into the Queen's Garden, a courtyard that had no other entrance than the one in this room. Roses still bloomed out there beyond the glass, late though it was in the season, and it was home to other flowers and plants that needed tender sheltering from the worst of winter's wrath. It made a tranquil retreat for a harried monarch who wanted some peace, although there really was no way that Sendar could escape altogether from the troubles of the realm. Talamir shook his head. No, sire, he's not, the king's own replied regretfully. I must confess I'm at a loss as to how to proceed with him. This was hardly the response I expected. He knew Sendar better than anyone else in Valdemar, probably better even than the late queen had. But Sendar surprised him with his dry chuckle. I'm not, the king said. Truth to tell, I'm glad to hear it. I'm not certain I'd trust someone who would abandon everything he's believed in until now just because a talking horse tells him that he's been chosen to join the enemy. Oh, Talamir replied, blinking. But his own people nearly killed him in their fires. I thought... His own people had a perfectly good reason to burn him in their fires by their lights, Sendar pointed out, raising his eyebrow. 
And sooner or later he'll think of that for himself, assuming he hasn't already. Fine. Perhaps Cantor has managed to insinuate enough into his head while he's been healing to make him a bit more receptive to us. But a thinking man doesn't just suddenly go over to the enemy without reasoning things through for himself. And it will eventually occur to him that just because Cantor is mind-speaking to him, it doesn't necessarily follow that Cantor is telling him the truth. I would bet on that. Talamir sensed Tavor's surge of indignation at any such notion, and more remotely sensed Sendar's Lorenil's amusement at both of them. Well, Lorenil always had possessed a strong sense of irony, not to mention a sense of humor that was positively sardonic, rather like young Cantor in that regard. We're going to have to win this young fellow to us, old friend, Sendar said, as if he was completely comfortable with the notion. We'll have to be completely honest with him, or he'll figure out we've been shading the truth for his benefit. But we'll also have to show him why we're trustworthy and his own people aren't. He'll have to come to the conclusion that we're telling him the truth, and that he has a real and compelling reason to give us his loyalty all by himself. Anything heavy-handed, and we'll lose him. Sendar leaned back in his chair. A modest affair of simple design and unornamented wood and leather, chosen for comfort rather than ostentation, and bestowed a penetrating look on the king's own herald. He and Talamir had known each other and been friends for a very, very long time. In fact, their friendship dated from the hour that Talamir had been chosen by Tavor as king's own herald on the death of his predecessor. A premature death, brought on by too much stress, too much work, and a brainstorm. Talamir had been so young, uncertain in his office, and disoriented by the bond with Tavor, which was so strong and so life-altering. Sendar, on the other hand, had been a very young king, but not at all uncertain in his office. Young he might have been, but he'd been schooled in his duties since he could toddle. He'd been a handsome young man then, blonde and tall and strong, with chiseled features worthy of a god, and an idealistic nature tempered with that finely honed sense of irony. He was handsome still, though there was as much grey in his hair as gold, and age and care had continued to wield a cruel hand against those features, chiseling lines of worry that gave him a rather stern look. Kingly, but there was no doubt that people found him intimidating on occasion. His own sardonic sense of humor didn't help on those occasions. He rather enjoyed being intimidating now and again. He promised that he would give us a trial, Talamir told the king, knowing how Sendar would react. Sendar liked audaciousness. He'd loved it in his queen, who had boldly proposed to him rather than the other way around, who had met every challenge, even the illness that killed her, with spirit and determination. Sendar laughed as Talamir had expected, a dry little chuckle. His daughter, Princess Selene, who had been staring rather fixedly at nothing at all as she listened, made a face. I don't see what's so funny, she objected. Selene might one day grow into the dry wit her father possessed but at the moment she was in a stage where she took everything quite seriously and earnestly. Talamir found that uniquely endearing, as did her father. Not funny, my dear. Ironic, Sendar told her. A car sight, of all things, giving us a chance to prove our good intentions. If you'll recall your history, you'll know why that seems ironic. Selene hesitated toying with the end of her single braid, then evidently decided to be as forthright as her father. He must be a man of honor, or Cantor wouldn't have chosen him. So why should that be ironic? Can't Carsites have men of honor, too? It seems to me he has every right to require us to prove ourselves. Perhaps because the Carsite leaders have broken every pact they ever made, and have even made war on their own people? Sendar suggested mildly. She flushed as Talamir gave her an opaque look, but persisted. Why should that mean he shouldn't demand we prove ourselves, though? The Carsites, well, how much do we know about them? Next to nothing. Maybe in their minds they had honorable reasons to break their pacts. 
I mean, I should think that this man would have more reason to be suspicious. Sendar shook his head. Chosen, don't just dismiss her because she's young, Taver cautioned. Clearly this had gone from a discussion of one man to a more abstract problem. Well, I still don't see why, just because there are a few bad people in charge of things in Carsey, we should assume that nearly everyone that comes from there is bad, she said stubbornly. Well, look, one of them has just been chosen. I don't see why there shouldn't be as many men of honor there as here. The problem with that assumption is that once a man of honor sees what his leaders are doing is wrong, shouldn't it be incumbent on him to do something about it? Talamir asked the princess, who made a little grimace of impatience. With the sorts of things that the sun priests have been doing, even the most devout worshipper of Vikandis is going to run out of excuses for their excesses. What if he can't? she asked. Do something about it, I mean. If nothing else, he should leave, Sendar pointed out. By giving his support to a bad leader, he reinforces the position of that leader. People see that he is good, and since he continues to act in support of the leader, however inadvertently, they assume there must be very compelling reasons for the leader to act as he is, and they continue to bear the intolerable. Talamir nodded. Selene looked uncertain, but not entirely convinced. She'll learn, he decided. Experience, that was what she needed. The point is that it's rather ironic that this Carsite, who has already had his own leaders turn against him and try to execute him for the use of a gift that has been the saving of their own people, should then expect us to prove ourselves to him. Not that we blame him at all, we just find it ironic. I can see that, the girl replied with a frown but I can also see why he has even more reason to want us to prove ourselves. What do you propose we do with this fellow? Sendar asked, changing the subject. There are bound to be objections to his presence once more people discover where he's from. I don't see any point in even trying to keep that a secret, Talamir replied, shaking his head. It'll be out no matter what we do. It's a pretty problem, and one that isn't easily going to be solved. We can hardly expect people to set aside old grievances. It's one I wish we didn't have. Sendar looked as if he was getting a headache. I suppose all these things happen for a reason, but I would be happy enough for this to be occurring in someone else's reign. Everyone always says that, Taver observed. Taver should know. I suppose they do. So... So, so, you and I have enough on our plate, I would say, without complicating our lives with this most difficult of trainees. Sendar pursed his lips. Who can we delegate to bring the young fellow over to our side, and make him admit to himself that his own leaders didn't deserve his loyalty? Garrison, Talamir said instantly. That young sun-priest, he's, uh, he groped for words. He's transparent. Eventually, I suppose he'll learn to mask what he's thinking, but for now his openness will work for us. All very well, but what about within the Collegium? Sendar persisted. We need a herald. Jadis, I think. He's taking a turn at instructor this term. And Elkarth. Both of them are so utterly different from anyone Alberich will have encountered before. He thought for a moment longer. I'll have to keep an eye on things, though. The instructors can hardly be expected to act as nursemaids to him. I'd like to assign another trainee to him, but there just aren't any that are adult at the moment. I can't have anyone younger acting as his guide. He'll resent it. Sendar nodded, but Selene spoke up. Make him my bodyguard, she suggested. They both turned to stare at her. Well, she said defensively, if you make him my bodyguard, I can help him to settle in. He won't be offended, and in fact he'll probably be flattered. After all, it isn't as if a mere captain would ever be made the personal guard to anyone important in Carsey. Making him my guard will show that we trust him, and I think that could be very important in making him trust us, don't you think? Actually, Sendar said slowly, yes, I do. And while he's at it, he can teach me car sight. Someone ought to know how to speak it. Brilliant, 
Taver enthused. Absolutely brilliant. Even if the rest of the council will have apoplexy, Talamir asked dubiously. Selene raised her chin. Yes, and I think you ought to tell them that this was my idea. They might as well get used to the notion that I can think for myself. I'm too old to be chucked under the chin and called little one and told not to bother my pretty head about things. Which is going to come as a shock to no few of them. Talamir kept his size strictly mental. Evidently the gods had decided that he was going to have to make do with fewer candle marks of rest from now on because he certainly was not going to leave all of this to the sole attention of Harold's Elkarth and Jadis, worthy though they might be. So be it. Sendar gave his blessing and dismissal all in one, despite Talamir's misgivings. Admittedly, though, the misgivings were all concerned with other people's reactions to Alberich, and not anything having to do with Alberich's trustworthiness. Cantor was convinced. So was Taver. That was all that Talamir needed. Talamir, I'd like you to organize Elkarth and Jadis. Let them recruit Priest Garrison, not you. Oh, that shouldn't be difficult, Talamir admitted. I suspect that Garrison's superior already has something like that in mind, since he brought the fellow along this afternoon on his official pastoral visit. Then once he's on his feet, and ready to be integrated into the Collegium, Selene, I'd like you to see to the bodyguard business. Sendar continued. His daughter nodded, her eyes bright. Easily done, she replied confidently. She looked like a cat that had just made off with an entire jug full of cream and a brace of trout to boot. Very pleased with herself. She should be, Taver put in. Perhaps, but she still seemed very young to him. Too young to be so closely involved with this potentially dangerous situation. He could readily foresee council members suspecting that Alberich was subverting the young heir. Yes, but that's supposed to be what she is going to do to him, replied Taver. Really chosen if you think that a healthy young man is going to be indifferent to an intelligent and attractive young lady, and isn't going to be influenced by her— you're very much mistaken. You have a point, and I'm sure the thought has crossed her father's mind as well, he admitted. He sensed Taver's amusement. There you have it. If you take that line with the council, it will be clear that Sendar believes Selene can handle the responsibility. True. That would be all to the good. And if you point out that it was her idea... It gives her more validity in her own right. Also true. He was glad that Sendar was seeing to it that Selene was brought along as the heir in fact, as well as the heir in name. But it meant a lot of work. Still better a lot of work now than trying to bring her up to the job later in a crisis. Because kings, even the kings of Valdemar, were mortal, and no matter what the circumstances... King Sendar's death would precipitate a crisis. Now, is there any sign of a repercussion down there along the Carsi border from this incident? Sendar asked, and Talamir gladly turned the subject to the simpler one of espionage reports and troop movements. Well, relatively simpler. At the moment, the best guess is that the incident has been completely suppressed, Talamir replied. There are no reports, not even rumors, from what our informants can tell us. We don't even really know which little village Cantor won him out of, they're keeping it so quiet. We think it's Sunsdale, because that's the only one that recently beat off bandits, but there's no word of anyone escaping the fires from there. It must be an acute embarrassment to them, Sendar speculated. Good. Let's hope it stays that way. I would rather they didn't have any more excuses to prod at us down there. You have a talent for understatement, Majesty, Talamir replied, rubbing his brow absently with one knuckle. Prod is not precisely how I would put it, but the mission you sent me on in the first place is a complete success. Joyeuse has got a border watch based on the old fire watch towers everywhere along the border, except on Holderkin lands, 
and there's enough overlap that nothing larger than a bandit troop is going to slip past, even there. Then the damned stiff-necked Holderkin can fight off their own bandits, Sendar growled, and may they wallow in their pride until they choke on it. Her father's outburst caught Selene by surprise, and she directed a look of shock at Talamir. Talamir just raised his eyebrows in a silent signal that promised, I'll tell you later. She nodded very slightly. Joyeuse promised that she can have word to Haven of real troop movements within half a day at the worst, he continued. It isn't just on our side of the border that those old watchtowers exist. We can see theirs, and they can see ours. And there has been unofficial cooperation among the foresters for generations about alerting each other to forest fires. Sendar snorted. Fire doesn't stop at the border no matter how many guards you post. Talamir nodded. The point is, of course, that we can see their watchtowers, and now ours will be manned in or out of fire season. And we've got one more safeguard in place. If one of our informants has a message too urgent to be sent by hand, and he can get to one of the fire towers, he'll light a fire beacon or flash a mirror on their side. Not a big one, or for long, but it will be a signal. That will warn the local highborn that something is coming, and from what direction, which means we'll have even earlier warning, if not the specifics. Remind me to find some appropriate way to thank my idiot South Border Highborn for having the sense to cooperate with each other for a change, Sendar growled, though to Talamir's ears the growl sounded pleased and relieved. Remind me actually meant, Talamir, go figure it out for me, of course. This time, however, it was a request that had been anticipated from the moment that Joyos had gotten all of the heads of the noble families to sit down at the same table and begin ironing out their differences. That young woman had the most remarkable talent for diplomatic maneuvering and soothing ruffled feathers that Talamir had ever seen. A touch of empathy helped, of course, but mostly it was a knack for saying exactly the right thing at the right time— and being exquisitely sensitive to interpersonal nuances. She'd been utterly wasted on riding circuits. I'll see to it, Majesty, Talamir murmured, glad that there was at least one small task that would be relatively easy to discharge, unlike the untimely arrival of that unlikeliest of trainees. Now, what about that tannery that Lord Wardercan wants to put in? Sendar continued. He's been nagging at me for the last week. I know it's something he wants, but I'm not sure the market can absorb that much more leather. Talamir bent his mind to the business of the kingdom, allowing himself to put the matter of trainee Alberich aside for the moment. Untimely, unlikely, and oh so inconvenient as he was. 3. Alberich looked dubiously into the mirror at himself. The healers had done a better job on his face than he ever would have thought possible, but nevertheless he was scarred, and scarred badly. He looked as if someone had beaten his face with a red-hot whip several years ago. At least the scars weren't a livid, half-heeled red, or he'd be frightening children and horses. His weathered tan had faded as well in the time he'd spent recovering, and he was thinner— not that he'd been carrying any extra weight before. His cheekbones seemed especially prominent, and his mouth still stubborn, and they damned well better read it that way. He was wearing what was apparently the standard uniform for a Valdemaran cadet. A herald trainee, Cantor corrected. I don't believe that you will find that cadets and trainees are at all equivalent. This uniform was very new, and in fact had been made to his measure while he was still staggering about trying to get his strength back. Some strange little fellow had invaded his sick room one day, asked him to stand, measured him all over, took tracings of his feet, and vanished again. Today one of these uniforms had appeared, along with a gentle-faced herald he didn't know, and Harold Talamir. The cut and design of this uniform was identical to the herald's uniforms, well, all of the ones he'd seen other than Talamir's. The difference was the color, a dark gray. Alberich approved of that color, 
it was a great deal less conspicuous than spotless white. It also suited his own somber disposition. You cut a good figure, Talamir said approvingly. But then again, we don't often tailor a trainee's new outfits to him. It would be a waste of time and effort, since most of them are youngsters still growing. This isn't the usual color for a trainee, the strange herald, who had been introduced as Jadis, said apologetically. We're apparently out of the usual materials at the moment, and I'm afraid that you're a bit larger than our run of usual newly chosen, so you wouldn't fit into the old ones from the common stock. The man was older than Alberich, approaching middle age, with sandy hair and expressive features so open and honest that Alberich knew he would never hold his own in a game of chance. But the one thing that Alberich noticed most about him were his hands. Graceful, flexible, strong, but not powerful. They were not the hands of a fighter, not even an archer. The new herald smiled and shrugged. I suppose you're lucky, actually. When I say common stock, it's because the uniforms are all parceled out by general sizes. Hand-me-downs, to be honest, worn until they aren't fit to wear any more, and cycled among all of those who wear the same size. We find that it's not a bad thing, given that highborns, or their families, might be inclined to embellish any uniforms that were actually their property, which negates the whole point of having a uniform in the first place. Keeping to these, I think I will be, Alberich replied and shrugged. Conspicuous already I am. True enough, Talamir agreed. And perhaps by making you a trifle more conspicuous, we will at least make it evident that we aren't trying to hide you. Alberich flexed his arms and legs experimentally. It might be new, but this uniform had been laundered several times to soften the fabric. Linen shirt, a fine pair of well-fitting boots, heavy canvas twill trues, and tunic. At least it was a comfortable uniform practical and easy to move in. It could have been much worse. He supposed that these garments would have to be made to take a considerable beating if they were to serve several sets of trainees in their usual lifespan. Certainly Sunsguard cadets were hard on their uniforms, and he doubted that Valdemaran boys would be any different. And girls, Cantor reminded him. Talamir excused himself. He had, after all, only come along to effect the introduction of Alberich to Jadis. That left the two men alone, in an awkward moment of silence. Alberich stared at the older man, wondering what he saw. Alberich could no more disguise what he was than Jadis could disguise what he felt. So, Alberich observed finally, My keeper you are? To his surprise, Jadis laughed. Hardly that. No, actually, I'm one of your instructors. And since I have a smattering, a mere smattering, mind you, of car sight, I was nominated to take you around to the Collegium, get you settled in, and introduce you to the rest of your instructors. Alberich tried to keep his expression a neutral one, but he still wasn't at all happy about this whole Collegium business. He was the one giving them a trial, after all. So why all this business of putting him into the Collegium? Why couldn't he simply observe quietly so he could make an informed decision about what he would do next? Why start him on classes, when in a moon or two he might be shaking the dust of this place from his shoes? It seemed to be an exercise in futility, and one that might have a negative effect on people who would be wondering how much effort they should put into teaching him when the next day he might be gone. Yet even as he thought that, he wondered, as he recovered, he'd had several visits from the earnest young Garrison, who seemed convinced that none of this had been an accident, that the Sun Lord himself was behind all of this for some inscrutable purpose known only to the one God. He was trying, in his own self-deprecating fashion, to convince Alberich of this notion. Alberich was in something of a quandary over this. On the one hand, he had difficulty imagining why the Sun Lord would choose to put one of his Carsite people in Valdemar as a herald when there were better candidates who were born here. Surely someone who was Valdemaran was a better choice. He'd speak the language already, he'd know all about heralds and probably be thrilled to be chosen, and there would be no question of his being accepted by other Valdemarans. On the other hand, Vakandis did not move to interfere in the lives of his worshippers often. 
But when he did, there was a reason. And who was Alberich to try and understand or second-guess the motives and actions of the one God? That would be hubris of the worst sort. If a sun-priest thought he saw the hand of the sun-lord in this, he might be right. In that case, the wisest and best thing that Alberich could do would be to humbly bow his head and accept what Vikandis intended for him. But Garrison was young. He might be right, he might be divinely inspired, but he might well be merely enthusiastic. As for settling in, that was proving far more difficult than any Valdemarin would be willing to accept. Alberich felt, well, he couldn't put a name to it. Dislocated and adrift was part of it, unsettled far too mild. Utterly alien came close, but didn't address the feeling of having no support beneath him, as if he were at the halfway point of a blind leap. It was far too late to go back, but he wasn't sure he'd land safely, and he certainly didn't know what he'd find if he did. And that went for how he felt about the one God, too. For the first time, he'd had leisure to think about his religion and his own faith. He had questions, a great many of them, and none of them had answers. For instance, if Vikandis wished to make peace between Carsi and Valdemar, why not simply appear as he used to in the great temple? Why go to the trouble of having one single minor officer in the sun's guard chosen? It seemed an unreasonably convoluted path to follow to him. But on the other hand, once again the biggest stumbling block, who was he to be asking questions like that? He was only one man, one among many, who wasn't even a priest. How could he possibly know what was best for Carsey? But why had Vakandis' sun-lord left his land to fester on its own for so long? What had happened to all the miracles, the appearances of the ancient days? Where was the sun-lord that he allowed his shepherds to turn wolf and prey upon their flocks? He wrenched his mind away from the doubts and questions, and turned it squarely to face the here and now. You say the rest of my instructors, he repeated carefully. And it will take how long to learn to a herald be? If I ever wish to do so, that is. There was one clear answer to why this Jadis had been chosen to play guide to him. There was nothing intimidating at all about the man, and nothing of duplicity either. At least they were holding to their promise. They would let him decide for himself with no pressure on their part. The herald rubbed the side of his nose with one long finger. For the usual chosen who come in here at about age thirteen or fourteen, and who are uh, lacking in a lot of skills you already have, it takes about five years. For you, though, I don't know, Jadis replied honestly. Nobody will know, until we find out just how much you know. Plus, there is a very great deal about the heralds and this land that you must absolutely know before you can serve in the field, and— He paused and looked thoughtful for a moment as if he had suddenly come up with a novel idea. Actually, that may not quite be true. Something just occurred to me, and we might as well see if my option is a sound one right away. The herald smiled warmly. Let's trot you around, Alberich, and see what comes of it. The person I want you to see is on the way to the Collegium anyway. Well enough, Alberich replied with resignation. Lead, I follow. It was not his first excursion out into the grounds within the palace walls, but it would be the farthest he had gone since he'd been encouraged to start leaving his bed. The healers and his own caution kept him close to the building. He had not wanted to risk running into anyone who had the potential to be overtly hostile. He'd already had enough sour or sorrowful looks from some of the healers and healer trainees he'd encountered. Once it was widely known that he was Carsite, well, no one was claiming that Valdemarans were without prejudice or incapable of holding a grudge, though in this case he could hardly blame them. So he had gone out, but he hadn't taken the kind of long, arduous hikes he would have done had he been conditioning himself at home. Not that he was weak and shaky. He'd been putting himself through a course of physical exercise since that first hour of getting himself out of bed and looking out the window. He knew far better than the healers did what he was and was not capable of. 
and he knew very well that he was still young enough that his body would respond to being pushed to the limit by increasing where that limit stood. So at this moment he was as fit as he had ever been, if a bit thinner and paler. As it turned out, it was a very good thing that he was. Jadis led him through the gardens to a long, low building set off by itself. He had very little attention to spare for what were probably quite lovely gardens, once he realized just what that building was. There was really no mistaking it, not when he saw the practice field laid out beside it, with archery targets, pels, and other equipment, then the lack of ordinary windows, and the placement of clear-story windows instead made sense. This was a sal, a building devoted to the teaching and practice of arms, the kind of building that had been home to him for longer than any actual home, three years in the little hut he'd shared with his mother, then the rest of the time in the little inn where she worked as a serving girl and cook's helper. Indeed, he must have spent half his life in a similar building. As a cadet, he had divided all of his waking hours among formal classes, reading and studying on his own, and weapons work. He had never really taken any time for the recreation that the others did. As a low-born bastard, he was not the social equal of any of the others in his year, and he had figured out quite early that if he excelled in fighting, no one would bother him. He already had a certain advantage in knowing all the dirty tricks he could pick up in the alleys and stables. It wasn't long before the rest of the cadets knew better than to pick on him. And while no one was particularly friendly with him, they treated him with respect. Two of the weapons instructors, seeing his diligence, actually unbent enough to act as his mentors. It wasn't exactly paternal, since they were still very strict with him, but friendly in a distant fashion, and certainly encouraging. When it came down to it, Probably he'd spent the best times of his cadet period in the cell. There was a line of solemn-faced children in gray uniforms, practicing archery under the supervision of an older boy. He clearly knew what he was doing, Alberich noted with approval, correcting the stance of one, the grip of another, the aim of a third. But he hadn't been brought here to watch them. Jadis led him into the building itself without a pause. It was of a pattern with every other sal that he had ever been inside, from the sanded wooden floors to the mirrored wall to the clear-story windows above. It was superior to the sal he had been trained in, for the mirrors were silvered glass rather than polished metal. But the furnishings were exactly the same, dented and chipped wooden benches and storage boxes that doubled as seating. Practice armor of padded leather hung on the wall. Racks of wooden blades were beside the armor. Even the smell was the same. Clean sweat, leather, leather oil, a hint of sawdust. The sow was empty except for a single herald, an old gray-haired man, slightly twisted and with swollen arthritic joints. He sat on a bench with some of the padded armor over his legs, a threaded leather needle in his hand, and looked up as they entered. Jadis he acknowledged. That's the new one? Weapons Master Daythor, Jadis nodded. This is Harold Trainee Alberich, chosen of Cantor. Cantor, hm? Sensible lad, that one. Can't see him making a mistake. Well, Jadis, what did you have in mind, besides the usual? The Weapons Master stood up, and Alberich winced inwardly. The man was in pain, hiding it, but clear enough to Alberich's eyes. He'd seen this before, in men who'd fought too many fights. The joints would only take so much damage, too much, and as the years set in and the pains of old age crept on, all the places that had been abused would suddenly become doubly painful, swelling until it hurt to move even a little. Since he was a captain of the Carsite Light Cavalry, I did have a notion about him. Test him and we'll both see if I'm right, was the enigmatic reply. Isn't Kaimal about? He's usually here this time of day. Instead of answering directly, the old man barked, Kaimal, need your arm out here. Alberich expected another herald, but instead what appeared from a door at the back of the room was a man in a midnight blue uniform, similar to the heralds in cut, but trimmed in silver. I was about to go back to the barracks, weapons master, the man said. 
unless you've found someone to bout with me after all. The old man jerked his chin at Alberich. Don't know. Need this one tested. Jadis seems to think, well, just arm up and we'll see. The man glanced at Alberich, then did a double take, eyes widening. Alberich braced himself for a negative reaction, but the man showed nothing. Interesting to see which rumor is true, sir, was all the man said, and motioned to Alberich. If you would suit up and... Standard sword and shield first, the weapons master directed and put his mending aside, his eyes narrowed and attentive in a lean-lined, hard face. Alberich might look just like him one day. He hoped he would not have the swollen joints to match. He pushed that thought aside and selected leather practice armor and a wooden sword. There was more of the former to choose from than he'd thought. Evidently this man Kaimel wasn't the only adult coming out here to practice. The wooden swords and shields were much of a muchness, nothing to choose among them except for weight, and Alberich picked ones that were the most comfortable for him. Then he walked warily to the center of the room to face his opponent. Alberich then went through the most exhausting weapons session he'd had since he'd graduated from cadet training. It began with sword and shield, progressing through every other practice weapon stored in the sal and their corresponding styles. Then, as he waited to see what else the old man wanted him to do, the herald directed Jadis to lock the doors. Alberich was sweating like a horse at this point, a bit tired, but by no means exhausted, and he gave the weapons master a startled glance. Live steel next, the old herald said shortly in answer to the unspoken question. I don't want some idiot child wandering in here with live steel out and two real fighters having at each other. Ah, Alberich was perfectly satisfied with that answer. The weapons master was right. If mere untutored children had access to the sal, and he assumed they must, since having a weapons master implied that all of the young trainees got some sort of weapons training, there was always the chance that one would blunder into the place at the worst possible time. Even in a bout rather than a real fight, he knew his concentration was focused, and he wouldn't necessarily notice anything but his opponent until it was too late. He followed Kaimel to the cabinets on the wall, and took out real armor and real weapons. Working with live steel always gave him an extra, the pun was inevitable, edge. His awareness went up a degree, and everything seemed just that much clearer and sharper. Even his reflexes seemed to improve. He suited up, took the rapier in his hand, and faced his opponent with energy renewed. He assumed that he was expected to pull his blows when necessary, and given the way that the bouts had gone so far, he knew it was going to be necessary. Kaimel was good, very, very good, in fact. Alberich was better, and Kaimel was tiring faster. He wasn't going to be able to ward off everything that Alberich could throw at him, and he didn't. Alberich had chosen the rapier for that reason. The lightest of the real swords, it was the easiest to pull when a blow actually fell instead of being countered. The weapons master called a halt to the bouting when Kaimel was clearly on his last legs. That enough practice for you, my lad? He asked, a certain ironic amusement in his voice. The young man pulled off his helm, showing that his dark hair had gone black with his sweat. Enough, weapons master, he admitted. No matter what else you do, please make sure this fellow has a candle mark or so free every couple of days, so I have someone to bout with from now on. I'm getting soft, and by the havens it shows. He actually smiled briefly at Alberich. I'll do that, the old man said with immense satisfaction. It's about time I found someone to put you on your mettle. He turned to Alberich as the young man dragged himself toward the storage lockers to divest himself of his armor. Well, he barked, are you too tired for more work? Whatever was in this man's mind, Alberich was determined not to disappoint him. No, he said shortly, then added, sir. Good. Jadis, you can unlock the door. Trainee, we'll see how you are with distance weapons. Ah, Alberich was already impressed with this weapons master. He had to assume the man had trained Kaimel, and Kaimel was good.
Not quite as good as Alberich, but then his own weapons masters had trained many boys that were good, but few as dedicated to their craft as Alberich. There were those that were naturals at the art of war, and Alberich was one of them. But being naturally good at something only took one to a certain point. It was dedication and practice that took one beyond that point. Or, as his own weapons master had said, Genius will only take you to good. Practice will take you to master. Now this Daythor was a master. It showed not only in that he had trained Kaimel, but how he was testing Alberich's level of stamina, strength, and expertise. The point here was that the weapons master had waited until Alberich was tired to test him at distance weapons, when his aim might be compromised by arms that shook with weariness and eyes blurred with exhaustion. Clever, very clever. Now, under the curious eyes of the youngsters, as well as the critical eye of the old man, Alberich showed his metal, with the long bow, with the shorter horse bow, then finally with spear, javelin, axe, sling, and knife. He always hit the target. Not always in the black, but he always hit the target. By now he had an audience of wide-eyed youngsters, ranging in age from child to young adult. It wasn't likely that they were in awe of his targeting skills. It wasn't as if he was putting missile after missile into the same spot. Presumably they were dazzled because they had never seen one man use so many different distance weapons before. You're enjoying yourself, Cantor remarked with pleasure, and to his surprise Alberich realized that the companion was right. This, this is what I do well, he admitted. I'm not ashamed of doing it well. Did I suggest you should be? Cantor retorted. You are what you are, a warrior. Some must be warriors, that others may live in peace. You do not enjoy killing, but you are proud of your skill. I see no difficulty with this. A thoughtful pause. Better that you should be proud of your skill. When need drives, you cannot hold back. Sensible, quite sensible. He placed a final knife in the center of the target and turned to Jadis and Daythor. Jadis was looking at Daythor with an expression of expectation. Daythor was looking at Alberich. Right, he said. Carsite, what's the job of a weapons master? So that those he teaches, killed or injured, are not, Alberich said instantly and bluntly. However, whatever works, so that learn they do and well, shouts, scolds, b He paused. Not beating, perhaps. Sometimes, gentle, not often. Out in the world there will no gentleness be. Better harshness to see here and live than softness and die. Nah, these are none of your car sight thugs. No beatings. But all else I, and treat them gentle only when they're little scared sparrows. Gentle pats and cosseting, that's for them as will never need to fight for life. He turned a somewhat grim smile on Jadis, and the eyes of the children, the trainees, were getting round and apprehensive. Right. By the havens, I've got one now, and who'd have thought it'd be soft-handed, peace-minded Jadis who'd be the one to find him, realize what he was good for, and bring him to me? Alberich was beginning to get the glimmer of an idea of what was up, and the weapons master's next words clinched it. Daythor turned to him. Trainee Alberich, you're on notice. There'll be no riding circuit for you, and no riding internship. You'll be interning starting now with me as the next weapons master. Call it, well, it's no apprenticeship, for you're nothing like an apprentice. Call it whatever you like. You're going to be a trainee in name only. But the classes, he managed, as the children looked even more apprehensive, if that was possible. Daythor flapped his hand, dismissing the entire curriculum of the Collegium as inconsequential. Oh, you'll take him. You see to it, Jadis, but no more than three classes in a day, and I'd prefer one or two rather than three. And no housekeeping chores, and no dormitory for him either. We'll have him out here in my quarters, and he can start doing what I can't any more. Kernos's bones! What you thought you'd be doing, putting a grown man in amongst a lot of boys anyway? It's been done before, Jadis ventured. 
Daythor just snorted and looked Alberich pointedly up and down, then at the children, who had put a careful space between himself and them. Ah, Jadis said and grimaced. As Alberich had expected, the Herald was utterly transparent when it came to his feelings and what he was thinking, and right now he realized just how wary, even frightened, all those young trainees might be of Alberich. I suppose he's right, Alberich. I don't think you would fit in very well with the rest of the boys. I think not, Alberich agreed quietly. Although he did not know this man, Daythor, he knew the species, another warrior. Someone who would think as he thought, as comfortable a Valdemaran to share living space with as he was likely to find. Then have them fetch his things over. As of now, he's an internee with classes. I know the rules as well as you, but rules are made to be broken now and then. Just tell Talamir what I've done. Sendar will decree it, and there'll be an end to argument. This is better than I'd hoped for, Cantor said, sounding pleased. Daythor fought on the border, you see. We weren't altogether certain what he'd think of you. Why didn't you ask his companion? Alberich asked. Because Daythor doesn't have much consistency in the way of mind speech. Pashen doesn't always know what he's thinking. The bond is there, and they do just fine. But when Daythor closes up, well, he's unreadable, and he's been completely unreadable where you are concerned. Ah. That put a different complexion on things. I'll see to it, Jadis said, and turned to look at the gaping children. Shouldn't you be practicing? he asked pointedly. They flushed and looked guilty, especially the eldest, and gathered up their equipment and went back to the archery field. Alberich followed Daythor back into the building. At the back wall was a door half hidden in the paneling, the same door that Kaimel the man in the blue uniform had come through. Alberich followed Daythor through that door as well, into a long and narrow room with seating and a wall of windows that looked out on a rather unprepossessing stretch of meadow and bushes. Come in here, and I'll show you how to clean up, the old man said, waving him on. Apparently there was another entire suite of rooms here, behind the sow. Through another door, Alberich found Daythor waiting in a tiny room, tiled floor to ceiling in white ceramic, holding a lit fireplace squib. Take this, reach up and light that, the old man said, pointing to a metal container that looked very like a candle with an enormously fat wick. Pipes led up through the ceiling, and also from the bottom of the drum across to a perforated disc suspended from the middle of the ceiling. Then turn that spigot, and you'll get a warm rain shower out of that plate. There's a box of soap there, and I'll bring you a towel. By the time you're clean, Jadis will have brought your things here, and I'll have a new uniform for you. Then we can talk. Then we can talk. Words both ominous and positive. This man had fought against Carsey on the border, but he had just brought Alberich into his personal quarters, and he was going to talk. We're both warriors, he reminded himself. We speak a common language that has nothing to do with Valdemaran syntax and Carsite verbs. Alberich stripped off his sweat-sodden uniform and turned the spigot on the wall, and, just as Daythor had said, a rain of warm water came down from the perforated plate, draining away through a grate in the floor. This was an infinitely faster way of getting clean than a bath, not as luxurious, but much more efficient. There was a second door into this chamber, but for now, Alberich figured he could wait to discover what lay behind it. Daythor was as good as his word. By the time Alberich cautiously opened the door to the little room, there was a folded uniform and a towel in a pile beside it. He snuffed the contrivance that heated the water, then lost no time toweling himself off and getting into a brand new uniform for the second time that day. It felt good to be clean, to have all his muscles aching just a little from the exertion. For the first time since he'd come here, he felt entirely like himself. He joined his new mentor in the sitting area, hair still damp. Take a seat, the old man said. Alberich gingerly chose a chair facing his new mentor. Now, before we start out, I want everything straight between us said Daythor forthrightly. 
I don't particularly like car sites. He sucked in his lower lip. Mind it's the ones in charge I've got a bone to pick with. Your sun priests. Just the car site ones, mind. We've got a little sect of your lot on this side of the border, and I've no quarrel with them. Alberich nodded cautiously. Now you're a soldier. Reckon that mostly what you did was take orders. Question I've got for you is, just how much did you think about them orders when you got them? Daythor gave him a sharp look. Much, Alberich replied immediately, without even thinking about it very long. Look you, my duty, to what it was? My God and my people. He decided that he would leave his duty to the Condis between himself and the God. My people to protect, not to the fires to feed them, not to bandits to leave them. And if them priests had told you to attack us, you'd have done it. Daythor persisted. Alberich could only shrug. Then, you demon riders, lovers of demons, with which powers and which ways? Yes, a threat I saw you. Huh. Honest, at least. Now? Daythor asked. Now, there I am not. Here I am. He shrugged. What was the point in asking such a question? Already he was an entirely different person from Captain Alberich of the Sun's Guard. Tomorrow he might be a different person from today. Daythor sighed with some exaggeration. All I'm asking is, are you going to knife me in my sleep because I killed a baker's dozen of your folk and a couple of your priests a while back? Alberich gave Daythor the same answer he had given Alberich. You a soldier are, and your duty to your king and your people, this I understand. And if he asked me about questioning orders, I would suspect he thought about his before he obeyed them. Farmers killed you? he persisted. Craftsmen? He hunted for the word. Cantor helped. Civilians. Civilians? Never. Daythor replied with such matter-of-factness that Alberich couldn't doubt him. Unless you count the priests. Alberich dismissed the sun priests out of hand. Then no quarrel have I with you. Reckon you're ready to help me beat some skill into a pack of puppies that never saw blood? Daythor asked, the wrinkles around his eyes relaxing and a hint of ease creeping into his voice. Some of whom may grow up to slay more car sites. A question, he asked, and picked his words with care. The answer on your honor, swear. Do you of Valdemar? Do you make war and unleash demons my people upon? No, Daythor said, with such force that Alberich started back in his chair, his hand reaching automatically for a knife that wasn't there. No, the weapons master repeated, without the heat. I swear to you on my honor, on my gods, on my life, we do nothing of the sort. We'll defend ourselves, and there's bandits along the border that prey on both sides of it, as I assume you know well enough. But never once in my time have we even pursued an invading army past the border once we reached it. You already know that what you call white demons are nothing but our companions. If there are demons preying on your people by night— and a knowing glance told Alberich that this man knew that there were. Then I say, look to your own priests. We don't have anything or any one that calls up the likes of demons. And even if we did, we'd not set them on ordinary folk who'd just have the misfortune to live in the wrong place. Daythor's suggestion that Alberich look to the sun priests for those who let demons prowl the night was not unexpected, and it was true. This was a thought that had already passed through Alberich's mind more than once. He nodded, and he thought of those fresh-faced youngsters at the archery field, how unless someone taught them all of the thousands of ways in which they could die, and how to counter their opponents and save themselves, then they would die, for no more crime than serving their people as he had. This man would not have taken him, a foreigner, to apprentice as his replacement if he'd had any other choice. He could turn Daythor down and have all those needless deaths on his own conscience, or he could accept the position and accept that he was going to stay. 
You are needed here, Cantor said simply. Perhaps only a handful of people, even among the heralds, know this. But you are needed here. Whatever else comes, whether your god had a hand in bringing you here, whether or not he has further plans for you here, there is that. No one else can do what you can. Daythor has looked a long, long time for his replacement, and you are his last best choice. Then, yes, he replied, answering both Daythor and Cantor. Yes, learn I will, and teach. Then here's my hand on it. Daythor held out his sword-calloused palm, and Alberich clasped it. A powerful and strong hand that one had been. It was strong still under the swollen joints and past the pain. Now let me show you your quarters. Daythor got up out of his chair. Alberich forbore to offer him a hand. There would be time for that later. Right now Daythor could manage, and as long as he could manage alone, he would want to. Alberich rose and followed in the old man's footsteps. The quarters behind the salle turned out to be a series of interconnected rooms, with no space wasted on halls. This was a sitting room, primarily. The sun came in here on winter afternoons, which probably made it a good place for Daythor to sit and bask his bones. At the rear it led into the showering room, which had a cistern on the roof that fed both it and a privy on the other side of the room, which was where that second door led. On the other side of that was Daythor's bedroom, then a second room which looked mostly unused, but which did have a bed and a wooden chest in it then storage rooms and an office, which led in turn back into the cell. If one followed a path around, it would be in the shape of a U with the two points of the letter representing the two doors into the cell. A pile of clothing and gear lay on the bed in the second room, which Alberich assumed was going to be his. Jadis worked quickly, it seemed. The arrangement suited him, actually, and comforted him. There would be no one sleeping between him and a direct line out of here. Oh, there were windows to climb out of, but that was awkward and had the potential to be very noisy. This has always been laid out with the idea that the weapons master shares quarters with his second, Daythor told him, then grinned evilly. The second's closer to the cell, so if there's a crisis in the middle of the night... The second the one who answers is... Alberich said with mock resignation. Master. Exactly. Just got one question for you. I have them bringing my meals over from the Collegium. There's a fireplace in the sitting room where things can be kept hot. Wastes my time to be hauling myself over there and back three times a day. But you, you might be wanting to be around people more. It's too painful for him to be dragging himself back and forth. Alberich found it very easy to read between those lines. But he's lonely. No, I won't desert him, not even for meals. If you, my master and teacher, will be here, then going there of what use is? He asked logically. A waste of my time. Asking questions, having advice I could be. Besides, soldiers are we. Understand each other we do. Was it his imagination, or did Daythor actually soften a bit? You'll find that boy Kaimol is another of our sort, he said. Head of his majesty's personal guard, that boy, and hard on himself. Always after someone to make him better and keener, but he just hasn't what's needed to be weapons master. Trained him myself, though. Then on himself he would hard be. Alberich knew that much for certain. Like master, like man at home, we say. We say the same thing here, Daythor replied, and it seemed with some content. Not so different after all, in some things at least. No, Alberich agreed. Right, I have a gaggle of youngsters coming in a moment. You get this room arranged to your liking, then come out and give me a hand with them. No time like the present to start. Once again, Daythor was all brisk business and as he limped out, Alberich made haste to follow his orders. He made up the bed with the linens and blankets he found in the chest and put his things away. Not that he had a great deal to put away. Those uniforms, light ones for summer, heavier materials for winter, a cloak, some toiletries which he was pleased enough to see, 
He took the opportunity to give his short-cut hair a good combing, thinking as he did so that he probably ought to let it grow out now. Longer hair seemed to be the fashion in Valdemar, and there was no use in looking more conspicuous than he already did. You've decided to stay. Cantor exuded satisfaction. Yes. He knew he had made up his mind that the so-called trial was over, probably the instant that he realized Daythor wanted him to train as a replacement weapons master. Maybe that was all it had really taken, the knowledge that they weren't going to make work for him, and fit him in somehow, but that there already was a place here that was crying out for someone like him. Yes, he repeated. It seems I'm needed. Which was by no means a bad thing. Not at all. Four. Jadis returned about noon, as Alberich and Daythor were picking up the discarded bits of armor and practice weapons in the sal and putting things away. With Jadis was a young man in yet another sort of uniform, this time including a tabard with the Valdemar winged horse on it belted on over his clothing. A servant? It seemed so, since the fellow was carrying a set of stacked metal containers that fitted neatly into a common woven straw cover. Jadis and Daythor led the young man through the door into the living quarters, while Alberich put the last few bits in a cupboard and followed them. The young man opened up the straw cover and took out the metal containers one by one, and opened them in turn to disclose the components of their meal, kept hot. Clever, that. Alberich admired the arrangement. Certainly the Collegium was seeing to it that Daythor didn't suffer for taking his meals away from the rest. By Alberich's standards of camp cookery, it was a sumptuous meal. All of it was laid out in the sitting room, with cutlery and plates that Daythor produced out of a cupboard that Alberich hadn't noticed until Daythor opened it. The servant departed, but Jadis did not. Evidently he intended to share their meal. There were four different dishes, plus bread and butter. Alberich took an equal portion of each. Something like a stew, some sliced vegetable, beans, and what appeared to be baked apples. The flavors were good. When in the hands of the healers, he'd first noticed that the food was good, but not quite familiar. The spices were all different. Flavors he was used to were missing, new ones added. And these people didn't seem to use as much spice as Carsites did. It was good, but not exactly right. Even the bread was lighter in taste, texture, and color than carcite bread, and not as chewy. As much as the language, the food brought it home to him that he was on alien soil. Your classes won't start for another three days, Alberich, Jadis said, when the edge had been taken off Alberich's hunger. Daythor, up at the Collegium we've decided that you should establish a schedule with Alberich first, and we'll work his classes in around that. The herald sighed gustily. At the moment there are so many classes he will need to take, it won't be a problem to work a schedule of three in around whatever you set him up for. Daythor nodded and refilled all their cups. Alberich was mildly surprised to find that they were drinking not beer or common wine, but some rather tasty herb tisane. Tisane? Well, that just wasn't what a soldier generally drank. Not that Alberich had any objections to the beverage. After all, most of the beer he'd gotten over the years was indifferent at best and vile at worst, and all of the wine had been harsh and rough. Still, tisane. It conjured up images in his mind of little old ladies puttering at sewing and gossiping. Perhaps it was meant to serve as a good example to all those children populating the place. If so, well, if he was allowed to leave this place, he suspected he would be finding a tavern fairly soon. Perhaps, if he asked, someone would find him a little cask of some good strong ale. At any rate, you won't be seeing nearly as much of me, Alberich, Jadis continued. You've got another guide coming, a fellow called Elkarth, a bit of a scholar— you see, we reckoned he'd be the best one to help you over some of the classes I'm hopeless at. I'm to bring him around to meet you in the morning. Which really means what? he asked Cantor. What isn't he telling me? 
That you aren't everyone's favorite trainee, Cantor replied promptly. Elkarth is in line to become the dean, that's the head, of the collegium within the next ten years or so. He doesn't look like much, but he's as sharp as a poniard, and nothing gets past him. If he approves of you, no one is going to openly contest your being here. Cantor paused, and Alberich felt him ruminating. Our kings and queens, you see, don't rule so much as reign, and not at all autocratically. King Sendar will probably have trouble over you with his counsel for some time to come, but Elkarth, well, Elkarth comes from one of the most powerful families in the land, and he has a reputation for sharpness, as I told you. The dean has a traditional place on the council, but Elkarth is the one who's actually taking the seat for the dean in absentia. That gives us a majority if we need it. Alberich kept his face straight and showed no sign that Cantor had imparted this amazing information to him, but he had a very hard time doing so. The priests of Vacandis had things so completely under their hands and wills that he couldn't imagine a ruler who didn't rule completely. Oh, of course there was a king in Carsey, too, but he was no more than an impotent figure who didn't rule so much as preside over a gaggle of wealthy aristocrats and would-be aristocrats with nothing better to do with their time than vie for position in a do-nothing court that was little better than an elaborate social club. It was the son of the son who held the real reins of power, and behind him, so far as Alberich knew, ranged the solid phalanx of the sun priests, who fulfilled the son of the sun's orders with nary a murmur of discontent. Then again, what do I know of what goes on behind the closed doors of the temple? It might be the same there. Really, the most astonishing thing might not be so much that there was contention in the king's court, but that ordinary people seemed to know about it. That would be unheard of in Carsey. So much had happened to him in a few short marks. This morning he had been quite willing to walk out of here forever. Now he wasn't merely a trainee, he had a real position here. It felt a bit dreamlike, as if days had passed in the course of the morning. He had gone straight into the life of this place without a pause for breath. That wasn't like him. It made no sense. There was only one way to account for it. That blasted cantor. Me? His, his, companion replied, oozing innocence. Don't go laying your so-called conversion at my doorstep. I gave you every opportunity to escape. I even had Talamir tell you the great secret— that you could have shaken our bonding loose if you really decided you couldn't bear this life. How many people have been told that in the course of our history? How should I know? Alberich asked rhetorically. I was about to tell you. No more than a dozen, that's what. You're here now. Because you laid a trap for me, you and your precious heralds, and baited it with the one thing I'd find irresistible. Then that leaves him free this afternoon, Daythor asked gesturing with a slice of buttered bread. Good. We'll start you in as my assistant right now, Alberich. Get the youngsters used to seeing you as my assistant first, before they start hearing rumors about the evil car site trainee. Alberich nodded. Well, what else was he to do? He knew it was going to happen, the evil car site trainee business. How could it not? If the situations were reversed, not that they could be, the first sight of a white uniform, and the wearer of that uniform would find himself the object of target practice. Thoughtfully, he bit off a hangnail. The difference I see not, he offered. The weapons master, if good he be, always hated is. Daythor smiled wickedly. Better to have him hating you as the tyrannical weapons second, the brutal taskmaster. That way there'll be no room in those rattling little skulls for the evil Carsite trainee. He finished his bread in a way that suggested the devouring of small children. Alberich smiled, just a little. The weapons master was absolutely right, of course. Children, and, to be fair, a great many adults, were apt to label people and stick with the first label they'd come up with. A brutal taskmaster I surely will be, as ever he replied, with a touch of grim humor. My recruits ask. 
Daythor rubbed his hands together. I'll keep the small ones, but you, ah, you I intend to unleash on the older ones. I've been too easy on them, too damned easy, tell the truth. I can't bout him any more, and there's never anyone here consistently that can give him proper workouts. And, oh, glory, you've fought real fights. None of this court fencing, oh, no. That's the trouble with the teachers the highborn have. They learn to duel, to do fancy court fighting, but not how to fight. Plenty of heralds do, of course, most of them trained by me, but they're needed out there and can't be spared. He shook his head reluctantly. And truth to tell, it takes more than knowing how to fight to make a weapons master. Cantor put in a few words of his own. The older ones, the best fighters among them anyway, have been getting above themselves lately. We have a flock of them that are one, maybe two years from getting their whites that were almost all out of the high-born noble families. Before they were chosen, they got private swordsmanship lessons, and those continued even after. They think they're masters of the sword now, because they're so much better than the rest of the trainees. Daythor can't give them the sort of workout they need to show them that they aren't. Alberich knew exactly what Cantor meant, and was beginning to warm to his new task. And as for Daythor, well, it was clear that he was doing more than merely warm to the task. He bordered on gleeful. Alberich caught some of his spirit. It wasn't malicious, but there was a certain edge that suggested there were a couple of these adolescent heralds in training who were due for a comeuppance, thought themselves immortal and invincible, and it would have to get pounded into their skulls that they weren't. The usual adolescent hubris, of course. Over and over they came into the sun's guard, sure of their skill, and thinking only of glory and fame. Time after time, if they didn't learn that war against bandits was dirty, perilous, and inglorious, they got their fame by having their names inscribed on the tablets of the fallen in the great temple. At least none of these youngsters would be looking to make a name for himself by taking their officer out in a practice bout, or worse. Worse was an ambitious and unscrupulous recruit who was hoping to advance himself by removing the obstacle that Alberich represented, or to do the same at the behest of one of Alberich's under-officers. That sort I have seen, he said shortly, and left it at that. But he did get a bit of a shock when they finished their meal, a relatively light one, appropriate for two men who would be doing very physical work shortly, and he followed Daythor out into the sal again. Of the six adolescents choosing practice weapons or limbering up, two were female. Girls. True, one of the heralds that had first found him had been a woman, he vaguely recalled that now, but it hadn't really occurred to him intellectually, even though Cantor had reminded him of that fact that he would be teaching girls. Females just didn't put themselves forward. Not in Carsey, anyway. Females had very clearly defined roles in Carsey which did not include being fighters. Don't hold back with them, Cantor said instantly. You won't be doing them any favors. And when he still hesitated, Cantor added sharply, There are barbarians in the north, pirates and slavers in the west, and bandits in the south, and they will probably face all three before they're middle-aged, if they live that long. It will be one woman and one companion out there alone, and you have to prepare them for that. Yes, I do see that. It made him feel a little sick, but Cantor was right. They were trainees, they would be heralds, and he would do them no favors at all by going easy with them. In fact, he might well kill them, or worse. There was always the probability of an or worse. It was a simple fact that the probability was higher for a female. Or both, Cantor added grimly. They can't be as strong as the boys. You'll have to give them skill to make up for that. If anything, the girls will need your skills more than the boys. Well, trainees, I have a little surprise for you, Daythor said cheerfully. He gestured at Alberich, who lingered near the door. This is my new second, and from now on, he'll be putting you through your paces while I watch. 
Alberich had no difficulty in keeping his face expressionless. This was no different than facing a line of new recruits. Even the ages weren't that dissimilar. He guessed these youngsters to be between sixteen and eighteen years of age. He'd had recruits that young, although, since he'd been in the mounted troops, they'd all come from some background where they'd been riding since they could walk. And mostly the cavalry came from recruits rather than conscripts. He supposed trainees probably fell under the same banner as recruits. Surely he was the only trainee who had ever felt as if he'd been conscripted against his will. Not exactly the only one, but very nearly, Cantor said. In their turn, they eyed him without any shame, mostly with curiosity, although two of the boys had challenge in their eyes. Well, they'd soon see what he was made of. They were the two oldest, he guessed, definitely the two tallest. One very dark, muscular, and blocky, the other half a head taller, with brown hair and knowing eyes. Of the other four, the girls were a pretty creature, blue-eyed with a smooth cap of brown hair cut no longer than her earlobes, and a smaller, lighter girl with blue eyes, a generous mouth, and blonde hair done in a knot on the top of her head. The boys were both brown-haired, one of medium height and one short, both with grave faces. But it was the first two that held Alberich's attention. Just as you thought, those are two of your problem children. Mind, all you need to do is disillusion them. They've got good hearts. They're just, well, arrogant in some ways, because they're ignorant and don't know it, he supplied. Exactly. I can tell you that they are currently the despair of their companions. Nothing Trevor and Mick can say shakes them out of their conviction that they are never going to find themselves in trouble that they can't come out of covered in glory. At least he wouldn't have the problem with these boys that he often had with recruits. Bad attitude, bad breeding, either spoiled by indulgent parents and thinking that everything should be given to them, or beaten as youngsters, figuring it was every man for himself. Too many of the Sunsguard troops were like that, hardened with no morals to speak of. Why, Chosen, I believe you are beginning to like your decision to stay with us. Cantor said with gentle mockery. Alberich ignored him. I Alberich am, he said gravely, and waited for Dathor to give him his direction. Dathor, after all, was the weapons master here. It was Dathor who should set the lessons, and Alberich who should carry them out. He didn't notice any reaction to his name, which was nothing like a Valdemaran name, or at least so he supposed. It is the new weapon's second I am, he continued, meeting their eyes each in turn. Chosen by Master Daythor himself, who now direct us will. Daythor quickly divided the group into pairs and set them working with each other. Interestingly, he paired the girls not with each other, but with two of the brown-haired boys. The last two, the boys Alberich had marked as being a possible source of trouble, Daythor motioned to join Alberich. Sword and shield, and make them work, Alberich, he said shortly. These lads are ahead of the rest by a bit. Treat them as trained because they are. They can go two on one against you. The boys exchanged a look. The darker, more muscular one with a touch of smug glee, the other, the one who was taller, less blocky and brown-haired, with a look of dawning misgiving, which was replaced by anticipation when he saw the expression on his friend's face. His friend was wildly optimistic about their chances, and he had come to trust his friend's judgment. Alberich knew that look of old. Overconfidence, poor young fools, because they were large dogs in a pack of small dogs and had never been shown any better. They thought that they were the kings of the world and immortal. An attitude like that would get them killed. Unless Daythor and I can knock some better sense into their heads. Sir. Alberich acknowledged, and picked up a practice sword and shield from the piles at the side of the sow, while the boys did the same. They looked cocky. Alberich figured that they must have had sword training from the time they were barely old enough to hold a practice sword and shield. Five or six, maybe. From families of wealth or the nobility, he figured these were part of that flock of youngsters that Cantor had described. 
They had that particular healthy, confident, well-fed look that only being well-nourished from infancy imparted. Maybe only someone who as a child had never been certain whether there would be a next meal would have noticed the difference. But Alberich had learned early which were the well-fed children, and thus dangerous, for they could bully him with impunity, and which the starvelings like himself, which he could defend himself against without fear of retribution. Standard or special, sir? he asked Daythor, when the boys had finished arming themselves. He had not bothered with padding, arm or shin guards, or even a helmet. They had prudently taken advantage of all of these. At least that showed some sense of self-preservation. They were shortly going to be very glad of every bit of that protection. Oh, special second, Daythor replied airily, and he must have known or guessed just what Alberich meant by special. Thomas and Jahan have had plenty of standard training. I believe it's time they learned what real field fighting is like. Sir, Alberich replied and without a pause whirled and laid into the nearest. He didn't go at them as if this was a pitched battle, because he'd have taken them both out in moments. They'd been expecting the usual polite exchange of salutes, followed by a measured opening to the bout. Not an attack right out of nowhere with no warning, and that had been enough of a shock for them. He didn't need to go after them full out. And the way they reacted was telling. They both stood their ground, but neither close enough to defend each other, nor far enough apart to make him work harder to reach both of them. They might think they were trained, but they weren't. Not really. So Alberich knocked the first one's shield aside with a brutal blow that nearly knocked it from his arm, without regard for lines and the rules of sword play. He followed it up by ramming the boy with his own shield. The lad stumbled backward, and before his friend could come to the rescue, Alberich sidestepped, made a wide low sweep with the flat of his practice blade, and knocked his legs right out from under him. It was a good thing the boy was wearing shin guards, though he couldn't have been expecting the low blow, or he'd have guarded against it. He turned back toward the first as the second scrambled to his feet. Once again Alberich rushed the boy, this time herding him toward his friend with a flurry of blows. Predictably, they got tangled up with each other, and he backed off to let them sort themselves out, though the next time he did this, he wouldn't give them the respite. Then he simply chased them around the salle for a full circuit of the place, using all the dirty tactics he knew, and hitting them just hard enough that they would have bruises to show for it, even under the padding and protection. He made their ears ring a time or two as well, with unexpected blows to the helm. Neither of them, of course, got so much as a love tap on him. He hadn't bothered with a helm, because he wanted to be able to see them easily. He trusted his reflexes to keep him out of trouble. Oddly enough, he would have worn the helm and padding had they been utterly untrained, for there would be no predicting what they would do. Part of their problem now was that they were rather too well trained. If they were going to come up against lads who'd been trained by fighting and killing, instead of by self-styled masters of the sword or fellows with equally fancy titles, they were going to have to unlearn some of what was now ingrained. Good habits, if all you were doing was fighting other gentlemen, but very bad if you were going out to kill brigands. By this time he was just feeling warmed up and beginning to enjoy himself. Not a chance that they could even get a tap on him, not only because he was a far better fighter, but because they were so shocked by his tactics that they couldn't think. They were shocked. The patterns they knew were all disrupted, and they hadn't yet seen that what appeared to be random attacks had patterns of their own, more primitive and brutal, but the patterns were there. Not that fighting, in the front line, basic dirty fighting, had much to do with thinking. It was all muscle memory at that point, because before a mark was up, you'd be so tired that it had better be your muscles that remembered what to do. Your mind would be numb with fatigue, and no longer working properly. But what Alberich was doing was what any good bandit fighter would do two against one. He certainly wouldn't stand in one place and slug it out, nor would he move forward and back in a single straight line. The other trainees stopped their practice and watched him chase his two victims around the perimeter of the salle. 
They watched with their mouths hanging open in amazement, and no little shock and surprise. Daythor didn't make them go back to trading blows, so Alberich concluded that this, and not what they'd been assigned to do, was the real lesson today. Good. Let them think about it. Not now they were as shocked as his two victims, but they would remember and talk about this in their rooms together later. If they were smart enough, they would learn from what they watched now, and the next pair he chased around the sal would be better prepared for what he was going to do to them. He drove the boys back for a good while, which probably felt like an eternity to them, taking on first one, then the other. They fought as two separate individuals rather than a pair. Another mistake, for he could hack at one long enough for the other to take heart and try something, then move on the second boy before he'd rightly got his move started. And oh, they were not anticipating the shrewd blows to shins, the absolutely rude blows to the groin. The latter he pulled, and pulled hard. He didn't want to lay them out. He just wanted them to know what he could do if he wished, and what a bandit would do when they came up against him. And if he'd wanted to lay them out, helmets or no, he'd have had them measuring their length on the floor first thing. The ringing blows he landed on their helms, he hoped, would tell them that. He used the flat of his blade on the helmets rather than the edge, but one day when they were better prepared to counter him, he'd use the proper weapon against a heavily armored man, the mace, against them. He'd known men to die of mace blows to the helm with blood pouring from their noses and ears. Then he feigned getting tired, though he was barely warmed up, which, since they were feeling the strain themselves, they fell for. They pushed him for a few paces right into the position he wanted them, whereupon he turned the tables on them and dashed right between the two of them, catching both of them with blows in the back as he passed. Then he ran them around the sal in the opposite direction. They had probably thought they were fit, and by most standards they were. They were no match for a man who had spent the last seven years fighting and riding and living hard, and years before that in an infinitely harder school than this one. Never mind the past sen nights he'd been flat on his back with the healers. He'd been in top condition before that, and since he'd been allowed up, he'd been regaining what he'd lost. Besides, these two were nothing like a challenge. He took pity on them when he caught the telltale signs of true exhaustion. The stumbling, the uncertain aim, the trembling hands. He backed off, and they didn't follow. They just stood there, like a pair of horses that had been run off their feet and just couldn't go another step. Their weapons hung from their hands that were probably numb, and their heads drooped. In a moment, if he let them, they'd collapse on the floor where they stood. Enough, said Daythor, with immense satisfaction in his voice, the moment before Alberich would have said the same. Now this, my lads, is what I've been too creaky and gouty and damned old to do to you. You've just faced a real fighting man in his full-fit trim, and what's more, before luncheon he was given one of the guard a similar workout. This is what you'll be fighting when it comes to it, my children he continued, raising his voice so that it carried to the rest of the sal. This is what you'd better be ready to face when you're given your whites. And this is why Alberich is now my second. And it'll be his job to see to it that you can stand against him before you go out in the field. Any questions? Silence, broken only by the panting of the two boys that Alberich had just finished with. Right then, you two. Daythor gestured at the young men. Off with the armor, and walk laps around the sal until you're cool. Then you can go back to the collegium and clean up. Not before. You walk out of my door sore, but if you walk out stiff, it won't be my fault. A groan issued forth from one of the helmets, but both youngsters did as they were told. Alberich almost felt sorry for them. Hard luck on them to be used as examples, but they must have warranted the treatment or Daythor wouldn't have set them up to be knocked down a peg the way he had. Alberich recalled the expressions they had worn when the exercise began, and stopped feeling sorry for them. No, Alberich, do you note, my children, that he isn't even sweating heavily? 
Take young Thila here and show her what she's doing wrong. Young Thila, the girl with the short hair, looked as if she would much rather have died than have Alberich show her anything at all. But her problem of telegraphing certain overhand blows was quickly sorted, and Alberich went on to the next problem, at Daythor's direction. And while Alberich was dealing out lessons to each youngster in turn, Daythor was keeping an eye on the first two recipients of Alberich's attention, making them stop and do stretches at intervals to keep from stiffening up. As the lesson wore on, Alberich paid attention to what Daythor did and said, and when, whether or not it was addressed to Alberich himself. Daythor was brilliant, really. Despite that Alberich was doing the hands-on work of instructing the trainees, he was in control of the Sal and the trainees. There was never any doubt of that. Alberich was merely an extension of his will, precisely as a good second should be. But Alberich had to admire the man, for he manipulated the youngsters and the situation flawlessly, invisible. They never even guessed they were being manipulated. By the time the weapons master was ready to let them go, it was time for all of them to return to the Collegium. So if the two young men had thought they were going to get off early and sneak off to some sport or other, they were sadly disappointed. A great bell rang somewhere outside which was evidently the signal for the next class. This lot was off like a flight of arrows from bows, even as the first tone still shivered the air. Alberich looked sideways at Daythor, who chuckled. Now, why do I think that my new second is going to be the least popular instructor in the Collegium? The weapons master asked the empty air. Barring me, of course. The weapons master popularity cannot afford. Alberich said dryly, as he began picking up discarded weapons and returning them to their places. True, my friend, very true. And what did you think of the two young colts who think they're stallions? Daythor asked. That was easy to answer. All spirit, no sense, he replied shortly. Ah, but can you drive some sense into them? That's what I want to know. Daythor waited for his answer head to one side and interest in his eyes. Alberich snorted. Not I. Bruises. Pain teaches what I cannot. And Daythor laughed. But yes, learn they will, he continued. Stupid they are not, nor stubborn, ill-taught or mistaught, but unlearn they can. The next class was one in archery for younger children, and Daythor took this one himself. Although he commended one young lad to Alberich for some special attentions, precisely because the youngster was a natural marksman, Alberich soon had him shooting from several different positions and helped him find ways of getting a full draw even when shooting from a prone, partly hidden posture. Following that class was another like the first, weapons work in the sal with slightly younger trainees. This time there was a change in the uniforms, however. Among the herald trainee greys was a boy in pale blue, a boy in a sort of brick color, and a girl in healer trainee pale green. The boy in orange was quick but not very strong, the girl slow but patient and deliberate. Neither were very good, but eventually their determination would enable them to hit what they aimed at, though for now as many arrows flew over the targets or buried themselves in the grass in front of it as actually hit. At least they were both trying to the best of their ability, which was more than could be said for the third child that was not in trainee gray. The boy in blue looked bored and not at all interested in trying. He played at the archery, shooting haphazardly, not really aiming. Alberich waited for Daythor to say something or assign more special attention to that boy, but Daythor never did, and Alberich concluded that there must be something special about the blue uniform. There is, Cantor said into his mind, startling him, for the companion had been silent for most of the day. He's not a trainee at all. The students in light blue are the children of some of the nobles in attendance on the king. Their parents don't see any reason to hire tutors when the collegium is here, and perfectly capable of educating their children. But the blues don't have any real consequences to not learning, if their parents don't care about their progress, so... The pause invited him to draw his own conclusions. 
Ah, that certainly explained things. Are there consequences for beating their backsides with the flat of a practice blade? Alas, yes, Cantor said. Political consequences, I fear. Now the ones in that orange-red sort of shade are bardic trainees. They aren't required to learn weapons work, but they are encouraged to do so. Bards are often out in the wilds and in dangerous places, and while most of them can talk or entertain themselves out of trouble, it's a good idea to be able to fight your way out as well. But when you work with them, be very, very careful with their hands. The last thing you want to do is injure the hands of a bard. It would be a catastrophe for them. You could set their musical training back a fortnight or more, depending on how badly the hand was hurt. He made a mental note of it. Interesting. He knew what bards were, of course, but he had never seen one, much less heard one. Something more to look into. He ignored the boy in blue, but once it was clear that Alberich wasn't going to single him out for attention, the boy watched him with a kind of speculation in his eyes. Alberich wondered if rumor had already begun to spread that the dreaded Carsite trainee was one and the same with Daythor's new weapons second. It has, Cantor confirmed. Although I don't know that he would have heard it yet. The youngsters from your first class are beginning to put two and two together. I suspect that it will be one of the main topics of conversation over dinner. Certainly by nightfall the whole collegium will know. Unfortunately, it wouldn't stay there, and once it got out into the court, the nobles and the rest who hung about here, well, things were likely to get very interesting. Things are interesting now, Cantor said. If Alberich had been a stag, he'd have thrown up his head and sniffed the breeze at that, trying to find the scent of trouble. The statement boded no good, no matter what language it was spoken in. Just what does that mean? he thought probingly at Cantor. I'll tell you later, Cantor promised. But that was all the companion would say, and eventually Alberich gave up trying to extract something from him. Easier to pound sense into a foolish trainee. So Alberich set about doing just that. But it was going to be a long afternoon. 5. The sunset outside the sitting-room window made a fine backdrop for the meal that another servant had brought them. There were not too many different ways that one could roast a pig, nor stew apples in honey, and beans were beans no matter what you did to them, so at least this dinner had not left Alberich with that particularly odd feeling of dislocation when flavors he expected weren't there. A remarkable first day. Daythor said, with more than a hint of satisfaction. Hand me those plates, would you? Alberich handed over the stack of soiled plates, and Daythor packed them neatly in a straw container like the one that their dinner had come in. The servant that had appeared just after darkness fell waited patiently to take it away. The clean plates it contained, evidently meant for tomorrow, so that was where they came from, were already stowed in Daythor's sitting-room cupboard. Alberich could only shrug. And I would know this how? he asked logically. Daythor laughed, a sight which no doubt would have astonished his pupils. Weapons masters, of course, never laughed. They also, according to popular repute, never ate, never slept, and were possessed of the ability to know instantly whenever one of their pupils had done something he shouldn't because he was always punished for it with an extra-hard lesson the next day. It obviously never occurred to boys that their guilty expressions always gave them away. Don't get coy with me, my lad, Daythor replied. You know very well how remarkable it was. Alberich gave the servant a sidelong glance. The man took the hint, picked up the carrier, and took himself off. Daythor sat down beside the fireplace and motioned to Alberich to take his own seat. I... I feel unsettled, Alberich said at last. I'm treated as if I belong, yet I do not. I should not. So how comes it that it is as if I do? And how comes it that it feels to me as if I should? I wish I could tell you, lad, Daythor sighed, and stared out the window at the darkening trees. 
If I could, well, I suspect we'd not be at odds with your land. You're not the first Carsite to come over the border, as you know. Though I suspect you didn't until you found it out here. You're not even the first Carsite to be chosen, though all of the rest were tiny children when they escaped and were basically Valdemaran when they became trainees. But you are the first adult Carsite ever chosen, and I have to think that it's something in you that makes you different from your fellows. Well, that answered one question. Why Vacandis, if indeed his hand was behind all of this, hadn't arranged for one or another of the former Carsite children to be chosen? Clearly he had, and clearly whatever he wanted from such an arrangement hadn't happened. Alberich stared at the fire in the fireplace. But it is to Carsey, to the Sun Lord, that I belong, he said softly. He knew that. It was at the core of him. Nothing about that part of him had changed. If that part had changed, he would no longer be himself. Your God is no issue to us. We respect a man who keeps to his own gods, and it makes no difference to the heralds who another herald gives his soul to. But are you vowed to Carsey? Daythor asked shrewdly. Or to your people? That's two very different things, my lad. A country, well, that can be a lot of things to different people. Some would say it's the land itself, but land can change hands. Some say it's the leaders, but leaders die. Or the religion. But I'll tell you something you'll never have heard in Carsey, and that's this. Religions change. I've seen it happen. And I'll bet my boots that if you ask your priestly friends down in the city, they'll tell you that yours has changed from what it was. That was such an astonishing statement that Alberich could only stare at him. Change? How could a religion change? Didn't truth come directly from God? Daythor poked at a log sticking out on the hearth with his toe. Don't look at me that way. Ask your priests and see if I'm not right he said calmly. Ah, this is daft. I'm only giving you too much to think about. Look, Alberich, I know this isn't easy for you, and there isn't much I can do about that. You'll have to reckon out what's important to you and stick to that. Do that, and you'll have one thing you can hang on to, no matter how unsettled you feel. That'll give you a bit of firm ground to hold to, as it were, and once you've got that, you can take the time to figure out more. He raised an eyebrow. Have you one thing, right this minute, that's worth everything to you? Honor, Alberich said promptly, without thinking, without having to think, which meant he realized, even as the word left his lips, that the choice was right. Then you stick to that, and you'll be all right, and eventually you'll find your feet under you again, Daythor told him and yawned. Me, I'm off for bed. I may not have chased lads around the cell today, but it's been a long one for me anyway. He laughed again. Good thing I don't get fighting car sites turn up to become my seconds every day. Alberich immediately got up, but Daythor waved at him to seat himself again. Now that doesn't mean you need to. Maybe you wear greys, but you're no trainee. You set your own hours. Only so... I alert and awake will be when first arrives the class, Alberich replied dryly. Daythor chuckled under his breath, got stiffly out of his chair, and shuffled off into the shadows. Alberich sagged back into his own chair, but in the next moment he was on his feet, staring broodingly into the fire. He wasn't tired, not even physically. That single workout with the young guardsman had been good, but he was used to that sort of exercise all day long. When he wasn't drilling or actually fighting, he was riding, in all weathers, without the luxury of hot meals and showering baths. He was used to going perpetually short of sleep, riding before dawn and not finding his bedroll until after he'd stood first watch. When he got a bath, it was usually out of a stream or a rain barrel. When he got a meal, it was field rations, augmented by whatever someone had managed to shoot or buy from a farmer. No, he wasn't tired, not physically, and certainly not mentally. He hadn't heard anything in the back of his head from Cantor for a while, not since that class of children at archery practice. On the whole, that suited him. Cantor was very facile, very persuasive, 
and he didn't want any interference with his own thoughts right now. He wanted to work through them on his own. He turned away from the fire, clasped his hands behind his back, and began to pace up and down the long sitting room. He didn't trouble to light any of the lamps. He was used to firelight, and his night vision was very good. A suite of rooms, even a bed. I haven't slept in a bed for so long that it's going to feel strange. The last time he'd been in a bed, the one at the House of Healing didn't count, had been just over a year ago, and he hadn't had possession of it for more than a single watch before he'd been turned out by the man he was relieving. It hadn't been much of a bed, just a sack filled with straw in a box on four legs, but it had been better than sleeping in the mud that had passed for ground around there. Beds, hot meals, willing pupils to teach. Pupils who, with rare exceptions, were singularly devoid of attitude. Oh, this place, these people, they were so very seductive. If he could have said, This is what is wrong with my life, and this, and I would change this, and this is what I want above all else, and then have all of that come to pass in a single stroke, this is what he would have picked as the way to spend the rest of his life. The only trouble was, he wasn't where he should have been, and he was irrevocably bonded to a white demon. He wasn't in Carsey. These people were not his people. Their gods were not his god. All right, it wasn't a white demon, it was a companion, but Cantor was still keeping out of his sight, because he still got a reflexive chill whenever he saw the creature unexpectedly. And yet, and yet, if Cantor wasn't the best friend he had never had before, he was certainly the next thing to it. Uncanny, that was, the way they fit together. It was not unnerving, but that was only because Cantor's personality seemed to fit into his without a single rough edge. Strange, yet completely familiar. And the longer that this day had gone, the less possible it seemed that he could ever properly live without the companion's presence in the back of his mind. He paused, staring blindly out the window. Full dark it was out there, and as a consequence what he saw was himself outlined by the fire, reflected in the glass. Outlined in fire, well, that was appropriate. In a sense he had gone from one fire into another. As for the life he'd been offered, well, it was all there, virtually everything he could have asked for, even the fact that he was not being asked to fight any more. At least not for the moment, though that could change, and he was too wise in the ways of conflict not to know that. He hated fighting. Oh, not the physical exercise, that he loved. He loved the feel of a solid hit, the surety of a stroke, the way that his body knew what to do without his head having to tell it. Perhaps it would be better to say that he hated killing, despised hurting people. Even when he was ridding the world of bastards that pillaged and raped helpless villagers, left without even the means to defend themselves, he hated it. Intellectually speaking, there had to be a better way of dealing with those mad two-legged dogs than killing them. Practically speaking, there wasn't. Of course, not really. It was kill them or face the consequences of not killing them, and know that they would go on doing what they had been at before you caught them knowing that even if you locked them up, eventually they'd either get loose or kill themselves and probably others trying to escape. Then the deaths of people who absolutely did not deserve it were on your head. So he had long ago resigned himself to that fact, and concentrated on ridding the world of murderers as expediently, dispassionately, and humanely as possible. But there was a part of him that had uncomfortable questions about that. Questions he had tried not to think about until this moment. Brigands were not the only creatures that preyed on his people. Yes, indeed, when tax and tithe collectors strip folk of all but the bare essentials, leaving them sometimes not even that. And what of the sun priests and their fires, hm? Shouldn't you have thought about ridding the world of them, too? The fire popped and crackled as he passed it, as if his thought of the sun-priest's fires had somehow roused it. He shuddered as the memory of flame licking over his own flesh interposed itself between then and now. Before this moment, 
before he had crossed the border into this strange land, he had shied away from that question. He had told himself that priestly business was none of his concern. Well, except for the uneasy knowledge that they might one day come for him. But in truth, he had tried not to think about that at all, tried to focus on his duty, his men, the job at hand, and getting on with it. Was that cowardice? He had to admit that it probably was, and he was ashamed of it. But what could he, one single man, have done, more than he had been doing, other than declare himself against the priests, be denounced and sent to the fires himself? And that was even if they hadn't learned what he was, the powers he harbored, anathema, unclean. If thine eye gaze upon the forbidden, put it out with thine own hand, lest ye be tempted. That was the writ and rule, and he had not obeyed it. Yet how could he have eliminated something over which he'd had no control, except by denouncing himself? And if he'd done that, he'd have done the enemy's work for it, taking a competent fighter, a good officer, out of the fighting. Had he put so much effort into being a perfect soldier in Vicondus's service, so that he might somehow expiate the fact that he had those witch powers? which aren't evil. You know they aren't evil, and you knew it then, no matter what the priests claimed. You had no control over those dreams and visions. And what was more, the things they showed you actually helped you to protect Vacandus's people. So why would the sun priests say they were evil, unless there was something about those powers that they were afraid of? Was it that they feared one day you might see something about them that you shouldn't? It was twenty paces from one end of the sitting-room to the other, and he measured it a hundred times with his restless walking. He had prided himself to a certain extent on being brave. He just hadn't been brave enough. Honor. Dathor asked me what I cherished above everything else, and I said honor. But what did I mean when I said that? He fretted and gnawed at his own soul, tearing into it obsessively digging deeper than he had ever done before. He had never had so much time to think. Yes, he'd done a fair amount of contemplation while in the keeping of the healers, but most of that had been spent in fighting the assumption that everyone else here had taken as a given that he should be pleased, even thrilled, with this whole business of being chosen. He'd been so concerned with resentment that he hadn't really put any time into thinking about his position, kicking against the traces. Oh, what an image that conjured up, the war-horse pulling the cart and fighting every step of the way. And such a cart he was hitched to now, the entire burden of accepting companion, title of herald and all. But it included something he had wanted for so very long. Yes, I hitched myself to it. I walked into the harness willingly, because the harness was so handsome. To become a weapons master, Sun Lord, if anyone had ever asked him what he would have chosen to be above all things, to emulate the men he had most admired from the day he had stepped into the cadet corps. Those competent, strong men who, when he was a cadet, had offered their own austere brand of distant affection to him, who had counseled him and given guidance and an example to follow, who had given him, when he was forced to bid farewell to his mother, enough to feed his hungry heart. They must have taken the place of the father he had never known, and he wanted to be like them, had wanted it then and wanted it now. Others had called them heartless, but he knew, and he had always known that they were anything but heartless. They held themselves apart, not because they did not care, but because they feared to care too much. Even for him, though that resolution had not been proof against his need and theirs. There had been two of them, two he would have done anything for, men he would have rather died than disappoint. Berthold, aged Berthold, white-haired but still strong and vigorous, able to hold his own with men half his age. He was the man who was weapons master to the youngest boys, the ones who barely knew which end of a blade to hold. He was patient but unforgiving when it came to slackers. He had seen how Alberich was trying, watched him, though Alberich hadn't known it at the time, when Alberich had slipped into the unoccupied salle for extra exercise and practice. He had chanced upon one of those practices, 
and from that moment on had made certain that Alberich never had to practice alone. A pat on the back or the head, a few well-chosen words of praise or condolence, that was all the physical demonstration of affection he ever allowed himself. But Alberich would have gone through fire for such rewards. And when Alberich passed out of the junior class into the senior cadets, so Berthold had seen to it that his student, Axel, took up Alberich's education where Berthold had left off. Axel, a powerful little man as flexible as he was strong, probably knew more about fighting styles and weapons than any twelve ordinary fighters in the Sun's Guard. His first words to Alberich were, Berthold thinks you have it in you. If it's there, We'll bring it out together. Alberich had never known just what it was supposed to be, but Axel offered instruction and approval in equal measure, and Alberich had drunk it in as thirsty ground drank rain. They were the finest two men that Alberich had ever known. And they taught me what honor was. Which might be why, when Daythor had asked what he most valued, it was honor he had seized on instantly. He had learned from their example as much as from anything they actually said to him. Honor was never taking the easy way when it was also the wrong one, never telling a falsehood unless the truth was painful and unnecessary, or a lie was necessary to save others, never manipulating the truth to serve only yourself, protecting the weak and helpless, standing fast even when fear made you weak, keeping your word. Perhaps that was all part of the problem. Serving the sun-priests had turned him away from the path of honor. How was it protecting the weak and helpless, when he and his troops were turned aside from their duties on the border to shepherd a tithe-collector and his treasure-boxes from village to village? How could he keep his word when those about him were making idle promises that he was expected to fulfill, promises that again took him away from real duty to satisfy some idiotic whim or moment of vainglory? How could he speak the truth when the truth would simply have gotten him thrown to the fires? In the simpler world of the Cadet Corps, no such compromises had ever entered into his personal equation. They only came when he left that world. Perhaps that was why Axel and Berthold hadn't left it themselves. Perhaps they had known in their heart of hearts that going out into the world would only begin a long train of broken vows. Vows like the ones he broke when he accepted his place here, his position as the partner of a companion. But a vow went both ways. He had pledged himself to the service of Carsi and the God. Only later were vows required that he pledge to obey the word of any priest, and he'd had misgivings. But it was too late to try and back out at that point. At that same ceremony, though, there had been another set of vows. The priest who administered the oaths to the new officers had pledged, on behalf of all priests, to regard the new officers as Vicandis's chosen, to stand beside them if accused, and succor them in need. And he had quickly learned how little they honored those oaths. The sun-priests broke their vows to me long before I ever broke mine to them. Did that mean the pact between him and them was also broken? Was it wrong of him to feel that their betrayal released him from his oath? Or was he just trying to rationalize his own sins? He realized belatedly that all this pacing was probably keeping poor Daythor awake. A glance outside showed him that the moon was well up, and there was plenty of moonlight silvering the grass outside more than enough for him to pace all he wanted to, without tripping over something in the dark. With a silent apology, he let himself out through the sow, pacing across the wooden floor by the light entering through the clear-story windows, opening the outer door and stepping out into the waiting embrace of the night. The chill air carried a hint of damp and a scent of grass. From the distance came the sounds of voices, too far off to be more than a murmur. But the very cadences were strange to his ear, and he felt an involuntary shiver of alarm he couldn't suppress. Oh, these Valdemarans! Not four marks into his first real day among them. He couldn't count the time spent with the healers. And look what had happened. They had told him the one thing he longed to hear, and had not realized that he longed to hear it, that he was needed. 
They offered for his inspection a gaggle of green children, good children, and told him that these young people would go out unprepared against the kind of animals he had fought against, unless he helped train them. And how, how could he not have responded to that? To defend the weak and helpless. How much better could he do that by training others to do the same job? How could he allow anyone to send the weak and helpless, well, all right, the half-trained, out to throw themselves down and be trampled on when he knew he could remedy the situation? There was nothing dishonorable about taking that job. There was nothing honorable in refusing it. Yes but these are not your people. So where does your honor come into it? Or is there some reason why it doesn't further break your vows to train Valdemarans? But then came additional questions, when he already knew from the evidence of his own experience how utterly wrong some of the things he'd taken as truth were. Why should it? When had that definition of honor ever demanded absolute adherence to the sun-priests of Carsi? Just because the sun-priests would have put any Valdemaran they found to the fire and sword, well, he knew how wrong the sun-priests could be. He had found a sun-priest here, an upright man who everything in him cried out to trust, who had told him, in no uncertain words, that the Valdemarans were good and true, and that it was his duty to Vicandis himself to ally himself with them. So where did that leave his vows and his honor? He did not realize how fast he had walked or how far until an angry snort brought his attention back to his surroundings. He looked up and found he was in the middle of a meadow or clearing ringed with trees. From where he stood he could see some lights, a few, through the trees to his right. But otherwise he could just as well have been in the middle of a meadow in farming country. The snort had come from a very large, white, four-legged creature just under the trees in front of him. It moved out into the moonlight and quickly resolved itself into a familiar shape. A companion. It wasn't Cantor. It wasn't stocky enough, and besides, it didn't feel like Cantor. There was, in fact, a disturbing absence of feeling about this companion, as if there was a wall between him and it. A moment later it was joined by a second, then a third, a fourth, and a fifth. They moved toward him slowly but deliberately, and he hadn't spent most of his life around horses not to recognize the menace in their movement. Every muscle was tense. They weren't so much walking as stalking toward him, their narrowed eyes glittering in the moonlight. There was no mistaking their hostility, and he was the object of it. A chill ran down his back as he turned slowly, preparing to go back the way he had come, only to find his path to escape blocked by another pair of companions. He turned back to see that the rest had spread themselves out and were encircling him in an all-too-familiar pincer movement. A moment later, he was surrounded. They were huge creatures and came armed with their own hooves. Their weight... An ordinary horse in a panic could easily kill and trample a man. A trained war horse was as formidable an opponent as any warrior that rode him. How much more dangerous would companions be, who had minds and intelligence of their own? His heart hammered with a surge of fear, and his throat tightened. Your pardon, I beg, he said aloud cautiously as all the stories of white demons rose again in his mind, no longer tales to frighten a child into obedience, but very tangible. Intrude, I did not intend. His words had no effect, none at all. These creatures were so full of deadly malice that he could feel it where he stood. He didn't know what they intended to do to him, but their eyes glittered anger at him, and he felt exactly as he had at the moment that the sun-priest denounced him. Like the sun-priest, these creatures looked at him and condemned him. Like the sun-priest, they fully intended to wipe him from the earth. Sun-lord, shield me! Suddenly he heard the angry trumpet of a stallion and the thunder of hooves behind him, and dropped instinctively to his knees, knowing it would do no good— but trying to make himself less of a target anyway. The trumpet turned to a scream, 
and as he winced away, a new companion pounded out of the night, hooves throwing up clods of sod as it pounded toward him. But the new one charged through the enclosing circle, and brutally smashed his full weight into the shoulder of the nearest companion threatening Alberich. Knocking it half off of its feet, whirling to lash at another with flailing hooves, snaking his neck around to snap at the neck of a third, the new companion skidded to a halt beside him. And Cantor stood with his chosen, snorting defiantly, pawing the torn earth in challenge. Instantly Alberich rose to his feet, taking his stance at Cantor's shoulder. What did I do? What do they think I did? he asked as the other companions laid back their ears and tore the ground with their own hooves. Why are they so angry at me? It's nothing you did, Cantor replied shortly and rumbled warningly when another stepped forward a pace. His own ears were so flat to his head it looked as if they'd been cropped. It's what you are, Carsite, which they, young fools that they are, will not abide. Cantor whipped his head around, baring his teeth at all of the others, screaming defiance with voice and mind. But you are my chosen, and they will not touch you, nor will they reach you except going through me. But the others seemed just as angry, and just as determined, and there were seven of them to Cantor's one. They snorted and added their trumpeting to Cantor's, pawing up the sod savagely. Come then, Cantor shouted, so that Alberich winced at the strength of the voice in his mind, following the mental shout with a challenging scream. Try and take me if you dare, you impudent young puppies. Try and see what fools you are. Cantor, no, he protested, knowing that, no matter how formidable his companion was, he was still no match for the power of so many. Don't stop. The single word rang in his head like a gong, completely driving out everything else, so powerful was it. For a moment, it was as if he'd been punched in the gut, unable even to breathe. He was blinded and deafened, and when he was able to think again he found himself on his knees, as if the word had driven him there. He wasn't the only one so affected. Cantor stood with head hanging and eyes glazed, and the others were shaking their heads, staggering about, looking utterly dazed. He had recovered first, and so he was the one who saw the final companion come pacing into the meadow, striding as a king would stride across a royal carpet spread for his pleasure. This, this newcomer was the very essence of companion. His shining coat glowed pearly and silken in the moonlight, his mane and tail fell like waterfalls of silver, and his eyes held the wisdom of ages past and the knowledge of ages to come. And Alberich knew, in that moment when he looked into the stallion's eyes, that the knowledge held as much sorrow as joy. The stallion swung his head about to stare at the others, all but Cantor, that is, with the kind of look that Axel and Berthold would give pupils who had gone so far beyond merely disappointing their teachers that even the most irrepressible or arrogant of boys could not have gone unaffected. What is this? the newcomer asked, no, demanded, in tones of disgust. What do I find here? Companions threatening someone else's chosen. What were you thinking? How could you? One of Alberich's attackers raised his head and stared at the stallion. Alberich heard nothing, but he got the distinct impression that the other was trying to justify his actions, rather like a defiant little boy who knows very well he's in the wrong, but simply cannot bear to admit it. The others were making no such attempts. If a companion could have flushed or paled with shame, these would have done so. The stallion gave the defiant one short shrift. Enough, he said, but the effect on the other companion was as if he'd been struck between the eyes with a hammer. He literally dropped to his knees as the others winced. You, Jaska, the stallion said, more in sorrow than anger. What you and yours have endured is no excuse. What happened to these others is no excuse either. You should have learned that by now. 
The stallion swung his head around, and again Alberich felt the full force of his gaze. You, Alberich, chosen of Cantor, have you yourself ever brought harm to a single soul of Voldemar? Not unless bandits they were, and with a band of brigands riding, Alberich said truthfully. Claim I cannot that my men and I did not make it so that others freed were to come against your folk, but never a Voldemar and I touched, nor did any of those under my command. So I thought. The stallion turned his attention back to the errant one, who had all but shrunk into a mere pony beneath that gaze. Well, it was very clear that the defiant one was the target of a scathing lecture. He was not to hear what the stallion said to the other, but it made the formerly defiant one shrink even further. And if something the size and shape of a horse could have been said to slink on its belly, then that was precisely what the companion did toward Alberich. "'I beg your pardon,' the young one said, whispered, rather. "'I can't hear you,' the stallion rumbled, like a storm on the horizon. "'I most humbly beg your pardon and ask your forgiveness,' came the humiliated response. "'Chosen of Cantor, I acted vilely. I am unworthy.' "'I should say so!' Cantor snorted, ears laid back and teeth bared. Arrogant little beast, I should— Cantor, the stallion said warningly. But Cantor only raised his head and looked the other in the face, with no sign of the profound shame they displayed. I only said that I should, Taver. I should thrash this little cretin around Companion's Field twice, but I won't. I won't ever— because I'm stronger and a better fighter, and it would be no contest between us, so long as it was a fair fight, and not a case of a mob against one. Somehow the other's head drooped even lower. Cantor, I beg your pardon, too, came the sad voice, if a voice in the mind could sob. Alberich sensed that this one was on the verge of just that. Alberich decided that enough was enough. For whatever reason, this boy, and it might look like a horse, but it acted like a boy, had a grudge against all car sites. Apparently, he had decided on his own that Cantor had been deceived or subverted. And he elected to take out his grievances on this car site, Alberich, who had somehow come within his reach. Why the child felt this way, Alberich had no idea. But it was apparently a driving passion, and had driven him to gather up a pack of his cronies to act when Alberich had unwittingly put himself in a position where he could be attacked with relative impunity. But there was also no doubt in his mind that the boy, Colt, had been forcibly shown the error of his ways, and that his contrition was real, his repentance sincere, his shame overwhelming, and there was only one answer that Alberich could make to that. He stepped forward and put a hand under the colt's chin. The companion started at his touch and began to shake, his skin shivering with reaction, as Alberich forced his head up so that he could look into the colt's eyes. Pardon I give, freely, he said, as he felt the colt fighting to keep from bolting. But more, forgiveness I give also. Jaska, prompted the stallion. The youngster blinked, and Alberich was startled to see two crystal teardrops form in his eyes and slide down his pale, moon-silvered cheeks. I am so sorry. Thank you. From you I will have a promise in exchange, Alberich replied grimly. Never again to act without due thought, or so terribly without honor. I promise, the young one replied fervently, but Alberich was not finished. And you, the rest, he continued, raking them with as stern a gaze as the stallions. Never, ever again to let one with passion lead you to unreason. He heard murmurs of assent, so subdued that he could only hearken back to the day when Berthold had discovered that some of the cadets had slipped into his personal quarters to assuage their curiosity, and had been caught rifling through his possessions. Not Alberich. But he had witnessed the tail end of that confrontation when the miscreants had been brought up before the entire corps. 
Then your punishment to this gentleman I leave, he said. My forgiveness you have, his you must earn, I suspect. The stallion nodded gravely. A few more moments passed, during which there were, no doubt, a few more silent exchanges. Then the others slunk away. The stallion turned his attention toward Alberich and Cantor. Brave, Cantor, and very wise to call me, rather than take them on yourself. I am glad you took no longer to arrive. Cantor bowed his head. Taver, they are children, and we both know how Jasker— Well, one of us elders should have seen to him before this. We are fortunate that nothing worse came of this. Probably. The stallion's flanks heaved with a sigh. One cannot foresee everything. No, one cannot. Thank you, Taver. The stallion turned to Alberich, and suddenly he knew why he had that nagging sense of familiarity. You are of Talamir bonded, no? he asked. I am, and the chief of the companions, and as such it was by my neglect that this child was able to menace you. So I too ask your forgiveness. But Alberich interrupted him with a shaky chuckle. Nah, who can tell what in a boy's head will be? No need there is, and no harm either. But I think good it would be to return to my place. Taver's ears pricked forward. You are gracious. I am tired, Alberich corrected. And late it is. Good night, I bid you. Good night. And know that after this you will find a warmer welcome among us. No matter who else troubles you, you will always be welcome among the companions. The great stallion ghosted off after the others, leaving Alberich alone with Cantor. Thank you, he said to his companion. Cantor tossed up his head and looked satisfied, if still a bit ruffled. Jasker underwent much horror at the hands of the sun priests, Cantor explained. He and all his family, all lost and in great fear and pain. Family? Companions have families? He supposed on second thought they had to come from somewhere, and to lose one's whole family. Night demons? he asked with a shiver. He had seen what night demons left behind, or at least that was what he had been told had happened, and had heard the things only once, off in the far distance. He never wished to come that close again. The sun priests claimed that night demons were sent only against the traitors and heretics and enemies of Carsi, but Alberich could not imagine how those ravening horrors could determine just who was a traitor or a heretic, Yes, Cantor replied simply. Then I understand. The night demons did not leave very much to bury. Often it was only enough to tell whether the victim had been male or female, and sometimes not even that much. I hope that Taver will not be too hard on him. Shall we go back to the sal? You do have the first class in the morning, Cantor reminded him. I believe it would be wise. Then, very quietly, You are a man of much honor, Chosen. Alberich started, then slowly smiled. I hope I may be, he said after a moment. I only hope I may be. Six. Alberich contemplated a substantial pile of books waiting beside his chair in the sitting room with a sigh. If he'd seen half that number of books in the past several years, he'd have been very much surprised. Lessons, classes, at his age. Still only a fool wishes to stop learning. And he needed these classes if he was going to understand these Valdemarans. He had two of these classes, not three, for now, both of which entailed an enormous amount of reading. In the interests of preserving his authority as Dathor's second, however— he was not having his classes, his lessons, with the rest of the trainees. That idea had been suggested and discarded within two days of being officially appointed and functioning as the weapons master's second, four days after actually accepting the job. Daythor had been the one insisting on some alternate form of tutoring, though. Alberich hadn't had anything to do with that particular decision. 
Not that he'd been particularly enamored of squeezing himself into a desk beside a lot of children. It wasn't just that it was undignified. It was that he needed to impress those same children with his authority, and he wasn't going to do that if he was bumbling through classes as one of their peers. Evidently, Daythor felt exactly the same, and had gotten rather testy about it. In fact, he hadn't even seen the Collegium yet. All of his time had been spent in or around the Sal. When he wasn't kicking youngsters into shape, he was catching up on the thousand and one little things that Daythor hadn't been able to get to for the past few years, since the bone aches got into his hands. He tried, Sunlord knew, but he had to do things slowly, and the work built up faster than he could do it. And often enough, he couldn't do it at all. There was a shed full of practice armor and real armor discarded by the guard and heralds that needed only a bit of mending to be useful again. Shoulder plates and elbow and knee protection just needed broken leather straps or the padding replaced. The bit of chain lying about could be repaired with a few new rings and some patient weaving. Practice armor of leather and canvas generally had to have the same treatment, or tears, mended. It took a little bit of skill and strong fingers, nothing more. Then there were practice weapons in need of mending, and archery targets to be salvaged. The things that got mended soonest tended to be in the sizes that everyone could use, which left children who were smaller, taller, or thinner than the usual struggling with poorly fitting armor. He was fixing the odd-sized items first, and had the satisfaction of seeing at least two of his smallest pupils looking comfortable in practice. In the shed he had also uncovered two or three crates of oddments. The oddments were very odd indeed, and unlike the things needing mending, had been packed carefully away. Alberich hadn't had a chance to do more than look into the crates, but it almost appeared as if the weapons masters of the past had been collecting and storing anything that ever came into their hands that might have been a weapon, on the chance that some day someone might be able to add it to the weaponry lessons. Now Alberich just might be that someone, for Weapons Master Axel had learned a great many strange forms of weapons work over the years, and had passed it all on to Alberich, at least in the form of knowing what a particular piece was for and how it was handled, if not in expertise. He wanted very badly to go delving into those chests, but the Collegium had other ideas for his so-called free time. Those lessons, for instance. The first of which was history, not only of Valdemar, which he had expected, but also some of the history of their neighbors. It was a good thing that the understanding of the written language had come part and parcel with the spoken word, or he would have been floundering. Though how something that looked like a horse could come to know how to read, or have any reason to, was beyond him. At the moment he wasn't asking many questions of his world. He was just taking things at face value and trying not to think too hard about them. It wasn't that he didn't want the answers. It was that the answers only led to more questions, and those to more in their turn. He needed to budget his time carefully. He needed to concentrate his mind and his questions on the matters at hand. His history tutor was yet another herald, a little bird of a man called Elkarth, who had probably read more books in the past year than Alberich and any two other Carsite officers combined had seen in their lives. He did have a knack with history, though, being able to get at the story behind the history, and breezing right past the things that didn't have a lot of relevance to what was going on in the world at the moment. He'd concentrated on the founding of Valdemar in regard to Baron Valdemar's issues with the great empire and his decision to flee with his people, then skipped over all the years between settling and the coming of the companions with a dismissive hardship, suffering, sacrifice, the usual sort of tales of our heroic ancestors that you'd expect to see, and you can read about it all later then stopped on the tale of how Valdemar had prayed to all gods for help in ensuring that his kingdom was well led after his death. The answer had taken the form of the companions, which had given Alberich a double shock, for Elkarth had unearthed a dusty account of the event, too tattered and ancient to have been created just for Alberich's benefit. If it didn't date all the way back to King Valdemar, it was old enough to have been copied directly from a document of that time. 
and in that account was the supposed litany of all of the gods that Valdemar had prayed to. One of them had been Vikandis' sun-lord, which implied that either Valdemar had been familiar with Alberich's god, or the author of the account had been. Now in either case, the further implication was that Vikandis would be favorably inclined to Valdemar and her king. Oh, there were a lot more implications than just that one— but that single suggestion was enough to undermine everything he had thought of as history. But Alberich wasn't allowed to dwell on that, for Elkarth had accelerated past the rest of Valdemar's reign, and that of the next few of his descendants with, There are a great many legends, songs, and tales, and you can look into them at your leisure. Settling into the point where Valdemarans first encountered folk who were as strong or stronger than they were, who were self-sufficient and self-governing, and had no interest in uniting with them. Up until that point, as they expanded their borders, all they had come in contact with were small and isolated settlements that were perfectly happy to have the protection of the kingdom of Valdemar, or countries, more like counties, seeing that some of them could have been crossed in a day, that were willing to ally, and later be absorbed by, the greater nation. It was the kingdom of Hardorn that they initially contacted, in a cautious probe back in the direction from which they had come, and that was the chapter that Alberich was dealing with now. The other class was concerned with the government of Valdemar and how it worked. A good bit drier this was. He'd been given the books yesterday by Elkarth, with instructions to read the first twenty pages or so. Apparently his tutor would turn up this afternoon when Daythor would be instructing the youngest of the trainees in their first lessons in edged weapons. He'd read the first twenty pages, as he'd been told, and found it all rather different. A complete contrast with Carsey, which was ruled by the Son of the Sun, who was in turn selected from the priesthood by the Sun Lord himself. Supposedly. Alberich had never been near the great temple himself, never seen any of the priests of the upper hierarchies or their ilk, nor had anyone he had ever met. Not bloody likely he ever would have either. The common folk were not supposed to trouble themselves about such things. Writ and rule said that the son of the sun was selected by the sun lord, and that was the extent of his personal knowledge. He had suspicions, of course, that the sun lord had as much to do with the selection of his highest representative in Carsey as he did in selecting Daythor's favorite hat. When had there last been a son of the sun selected from the village priests, for instance? They all seemed to come from among the high-ranking lot that never stirred out of Sunum, and were ever increasingly out of touch with what was going on among the common people. Carsey actually had a king, but the position was purely symbolic and had been for centuries. King Ortrek largely presided over a court concerned with the social functions of the old nobility and moneyed classes. The sun priests made all the real decisions in so far as the actual running of Carsey. The king merely ratified what the priests decided, and occasionally the priests would in turn implement some small thing that the king wanted, such as the creation of a new title, or the granting of property to make a court noble into a landed one. This, of course, was probably one of the causes of strife between the two lands, that Valdemar was ruled by a purely secular figure, and Carsey by, supposedly, a divinely guided one. Alberich wished that he was far enough along in the history classes to see what had happened when the borders of Carsey and Valdemar first met. Had that been the primal cause of the enmity? Or had it been something else? The first few pages of the text on Valdemaran law and government had been perfectly straightforward. But then, toward the end of the assigned segment, he encountered a passage that left him blinking. Of course, in the circumstance, which has only occurred three times in our recorded histories, that there have been no children of the reigning monarch that were chosen, it falls to the nearest blood relative, who is also a herald, to take up the crown. The text had gone on to describe how such a selection was made, based less upon the degree of consanguinity than of ability. Most of that had seemed irrelevant to Alberich, until he came to the part that said, and the vote of the heraldic circle as a block in the election of a new monarch 
provided that the candidate is at least a trainee, if not a full herald, comprises one-third of the total, with that of the council comprising two-thirds. Ordinary heralds got a one-third vote in the selection of a king? That was tantamount to the officers of the Sun's Guard having a say in the selection of the Son of the Sun. He didn't know quite what to think about that. There was no question, however, that the heralds had as much to do with creating the laws and government as they did in disseminating and dispensing it. The morning classes kept him too busy to worry about all that, however, and by the time his putative tutor showed up, theoretical questions about the government of Valdemar had been pushed so far to the back of his mind that they didn't impinge on his thoughts in the least. Then, when he saw his tutor, the question foremost was if someone at the Collegium intended to mock him. The tutor was a young woman in student greys, slim and blonde, with a determined jaw and blue-gray eyes that considered him thoughtfully. He recognized her from the advanced weaponry class held at the very end of the day, although Daythor had never yet assigned Alberich to work directly with her. You might not remember me from the afternoon classes, Alberich, the girl said in a matter-of-fact manner, as she held out her hand. I'm Selene. My tutor you are, he replied, clasping her hand briefly. He didn't bother to hide the doubt in his voice. She laughed, which surprised him a little. Unlikely, I know, but the powers that be intend for you to get a practical exposure to how things are done in Valdemar— and they decided that we might as well, as the saying here goes, shoot two ducks with one arrow. You see, I'm the heir, Princess Selene, and every other afternoon I serve in the city courts. No one likes me being there without a bodyguard, and with you as my bodyguard you can observe, as Elkarth put it, government in action. Anything you don't understand I can explain, or can't or can. Meanwhile, your presence will make the council less nervous about my being there in the first place. Alberich controlled his expression and managed not to splutter. At your side, the presence of the Carsite less nervous will make them. But they won't know it's the Carsite who's my bodyguard, she replied with a bare hint of irony. Who I pick, with the senior collegium staff's recommendations, of course, to act as my bodyguard? is entirely the Collegium's business, not the Council's. All they will know, unless one of them decides to observe me, is that I've got someone in Greys to keep a weather eye on my safety. They'll rightly assume that since Daythor must have had a hand in picking him, my escort will be quite competent. Oh, they'll eventually find out. You can't keep anything like that a secret. But by that time it will be so long established that objecting to my choice would make them look like idiots. Don't spoil her fun. She's been planning this for a fortnight, Cantor advised. But to trust me with the safety of the air? He was utterly flabbergasted. He might have to look as if all this was just a matter of course, but at least he could drop any pretense of composure with Cantor, and he did so. Aren't you trustworthy? Cantor countered. I know you would be the best person for the task. No one would take it as seriously as you will, because the heralds all have a blind spot where the safety of Selene is concerned. They believe that no one realizes that trainee Selene and the heir are the same person, which is ridiculous. It's not exactly a secret, and even if it was, you couldn't keep information like that secure for very long. Not very bright of them. And just because no one has tried to harm her, no one ever will, hm? he replied. Perhaps it does take someone from outside to see that danger. Too true, I fear. And that isn't all, of course. You need to see how we work, so to speak, and you'll learn more from watching a common herald's court than you ever would from books. But when the great men find out who it is that is standing guard over their princess, by that time you'll have proved yourself, and no one will think anything of it. Cantor sounded very certain of himself. Alberich wasn't certain of anything except that there would be repercussions. But who would be the ones facing the repercussions? Not I. No, that would be Daythor, Talamir. The king, your father, he ventured. Knows he of this? Of course. He was the first one I suggested this to. I suppose you're ready. 
Selenay asked, as calm and casual as if he'd asked what time of day it was. Ready? What was he supposed to be ready for? You're coming down into the city with me, correct? As my bodyguard. You might as well start right now. She looked him up and down critically. That set of greys should do, I suppose. They don't look quite like trainee greys, but they'll be all right. Are there any particular weapons you'd like to carry? Weapons I would like to carry? he repeated, feeling as if he'd been run over by something. Uh, knives, a sword? Well, let's get them and get on our way. Selene waited for him to collect a set of plain knives and a common sword that he had just finished working on. He'd found them in the shed, and he had liked the balance immediately and had taken extra care with them, rewrapping the grips, cleaning, polishing, and sharpening. They were of sound make and good steel, and if old and much abused, at least he knew they were in decent shape with no hidden weakness in tang or blade. And he had never been the sort who got attached to a particular chunk of metal. As far as he was concerned, one blade was as good as another, so long as it was balanced and sharp. He'd never had any patience with those sagas wherein the hero found, or was given, or created a famous blade with a name of its own. Ridiculous. These things were just pieces of steel, not something sentient. And when you focused too much on my famous blade, Gazornenplatz, you were apt to forget that it was a tool to be used and as readily left behind if need be. Axel had felt the same, and when he'd caught cadets naming their blades and refusing to use any other, he often took the weapons in question to the forge himself and had them melted down, if they happened to have come out of the common arsenal. There wasn't a great deal he could do about heirloom blades or gifts, other than to ban them from the sow, but that's exactly what he had done. Fortunately, the question hadn't yet come up here, but if it ever did, Alberich intended to follow Axel's example. Alberich got sheaths and a belt and armed himself, while Selene waited with no signs of impatience. When they left the sal, he discovered that Cantor had managed somehow to get himself saddled and bridled, and was waiting with a companion mare in similar tack. How had he done that? Easy enough. When we show up at the stable door, the helpers know to get us tacked up. Don't forget, here everyone realizes very well that we aren't horses and treats us accordingly. Alberich shook his head a little and mounted. Selene was already in the saddle. The two companions wheeled and trotted away from the sow toward the collegium. I'm on a long track internship just as you are, Selene explained over the chime of bridal bells. When he looked at her without understanding, she quickly explained. When a trainee is considered ready to become a herald, normally they're given the white uniforms and they're sent out along with an older, experienced herald as a mentor. At first all they do is observe and discuss what the mentor did afterward. Then, over the course of a year and a half, they gradually begin to take on every task that the older herald does, until they are doing all the work, and it's the mentor that's observing. But I can't do that. Not wise. Pierre out alone with only one other to have as guardian? And not possible. Ordinary to be a troop of guards trailing, Alberich observed. Not wise as well the air to be out of reach, the countryside in, but worse the air to be unguarded, a strange city within. Therefore, here the only option is. She nodded. Exactly. The heralds and some of the council assume that staying within the city is safe enough, but not even the most optimistic of them is mad enough to send me out in the field on internship. And because I'm the heir, once I put on whites— I need to have every bit of the authority and experience of a seasoned herald. The moment I'm a full herald, I'll have a council seat and a lot of responsibility. So, instead of doing a regular internship in whites, I'm on a long-track internship in greys. I go sit in on Harold Mirrilin's sessions of the Court of Justice, and every so often he asks me to make a judgment or take an action. Rendering justice is a lot of what a herald does, you see, and you can study it all you like in books, but you never really understand it until you see it done and do it yourself. Justice isn't just laws. It's people. By this time they were approaching the graveled road that ran beside the enormous building of the Collegium. A herald waited for them there, 
a nondescript man with long brown hair and a single braid down his back and a small beard. He eyed Alberich with a stony expression. The new trainee, Selene, he asked. And my bodyguard, Harold Mirilin, she replied, with perfect composure. This is Alberich, and actually he's on a long internship just like I am. I should think so, Mirilin replied, giving him another stone-faced look. I will be interested in trying a blade against you at some point, Alberich. Alberich just bowed slightly. The Herald wasn't being actively unfriendly, so there was certainly no point in taking exception with his passive hostility, when all that Alberich was there for was to observe and watch out for young Selene. At your convenience, sir, he replied, making certain that his voice was absolutely neutral. They rode down into the city in silence. Alberich didn't care that Harold Mirilin made no effort at conversation. Most of his attention was taken up with watching for trouble, for if the council was nervous about Selene going out in public unguarded, there must be at least some reason for their concern. What little of his attention was left over was involved in simple observation. Even if he had not known very well where he was, he would have known immediately that this was not Carsey. Nearest to the palace and the collegium, just outside the complex walls, were the manors of the nobility and wealthy. In Carsey, such buildings were the property of the priesthood, each holding the staff and acolytes of one or another of the high-ranking sun-priests. There was a great deal of difference between these places that held secular families and those manses. For one thing, sounds. No sounds of prayer, chanting, that sort of thing. Dogs barking, occasional voices of children and young people, and also the sounds of domestic animals. Some homes had music drifting from them, some the sounds of a party or friendly gathering coming out of the gardens. The farther the three of them got from the palace, following a road that wound back and forth in a manner of which Alberich strongly approved, defensively it made sense not to have a direct path to the palace, the less expensive and more crowded the buildings became. And soon after that, rows of shops anchored by taverns, cookshops, or inns began to displace houses, and temple facades poked in among the shops, with shrines in city squares or on corners. The noise level increased with increasing traffic and population, of course. But again, it was obvious that this wasn't Carsey, because there were so many different temples and shrines and, as he noticed on closer observation, not all of the things that had appeared to be shrines were anything of the sort. Some were public fountains, some statues that, so far as he could tell, had no religious significance whatsoever. Some were clearly statues of Valdemar and heroes, and it was no surprise that a great many of them were heralds, who were invariably shown with their companions. Not all, however, which was interesting. Equally interesting were the statues that almost always surmounted the public fountains, which were not martial in any way. In fact, given that the figures were dressed in quite elaborate clothing and often held tools or implements, he had a guess, a quite astonishing guess, since nothing of the sort would have been permitted in Carsey. Common artisans and merchants no matter how wealthy or talented, should never be allowed to exalt themselves to the point of putting up public statues of themselves. The Countess frowned on spending money putting up vainglorious statues when the same money could be given to the temple, and at any rate, exalting yourself or your ancestors in such a fashion was an indulgence in the sin of pride. That is who? he asked finally, catching Selene's eye and nodding at a statue of a round, balding little man, who clutched a plumb-bob and compass and beamed at passers-by. Alberich rather liked his statue, for not only was there the usual spigot and basin of the public fountain, but the upper basin spilled over into a trough at street level, just the right height for dogs and cats to drink from. Selene followed his gaze and smiled. I don't know who that is, but I know what he is and why he's there, she said. These statues began going up in Elspeth, the peacemaker's time. Valdemar had been pretty much at peace for more than a generation, and a lot of people were getting very prosperous. 
so they started putting up statues of themselves, which rather annoyed my ancestor, who thought it was a silly waste of money. She made a law forbidding people to put up privately owned statues on public streets, so they'd have the statues put up, then give them to the city. So she had another law made that forbade the putting up of anything on public streets unless it served a practical use and was for the public good, and being able to tie a horse to it didn't count. Oh, and you had to leave money in your will to see anything you put up was kept clean and in working order. Alberich smiled at that. Clever, that was, he responded, and good for the city folk. Selene grinned. Especially since the corners in the best part of the city went early, so people who wanted to do things had to take what they could get. Most people went for fountains and water pumps. The Queen said it was a pity that we were stuck with all those statues of a lot of vain old men. But at least now every street had a public water supply without taxes going to pay for it. Marilyn overheard them, and unbent enough to smile slightly. A wise woman, your ancestor, he said mildly. If she had taxed them to pay for such things, they would have been calling for her head. But when they were able to make them into self-aggrandizing statuary, they were climbing all over themselves to oblige. Probably, Selene shrugged. I think she said something like that herself. At any rate, you'll find statues like that all over Haven now. When they aren't fountains and pumps, they can be almost anything useful. After a while, the artists that people hired to put up such things got to enjoy thinking up practical purposes. There's a clever basin over in the square, where Pitcher and Bright cross, where women can wash clothing. It was made that way on purpose. And there's dry mangers with stone canopies over them, for feeding your horses or whatever at nearly every market square. There are covered benches, too, with inscriptions instead of statues, and an enormous public pigeon coat which serves the purpose of giving poor people a place for birds for their pot, and gives the birds a place to go besides making nests in people's roofs. Both of them looked at him, clearly expecting some sort of comment from him. He thought about the larger towns in Carsey that he had been in. Nothing this size, of course, but the only public sources of water were the wells in temple courtyards, and to use them... To be fair, there were plenty of sun-priests who encouraged all comers to take the water freely. But, well, it seemed to him there were fewer of the generous ones from year to year, and more who at the least, if they did not exact a tithe of work, cash, or goods for the water, insisted on daily attendance at one of the services before you got your water. That may not sound like much, but in the day of a busy woman there were not many marks to spare, and in order to fetch her water, she might face a choice between leaving some task undone or walking farther to fetch water from another source. One wishes, he said slowly, that all leaders like-minded were. Selene beamed. Miralyn grunted, but at least he didn't seem displeased. The court of justice was held in a building over the corn market, literally over it, for it stood on four pillars above the valuable stall space. If the courtroom was filled, this covered space below, used on market days for the most valuable of merchandise and food vendors, enabled people who were waiting their turn to wait out of the weather or sun. Harold Miralyn was the sole arbiter here. Those who brought grievances to him either had tried the regular courts and were unsatisfied, or felt that a regular court would not be as responsive to their grievances as a single herald would. The herald sat at a table at the back of the room, within a sort of partition that took up the back fifth or so, divided from the rest of the room by a low balustrade. Those whose cases were being heard stood before him, while those still waiting and interested parties sat on rows of backless benches on the other side of the railing. Selene sat beside Miralyn, industriously taking notes, while Alberich stood behind them both, and attempted to look like a superfluous statue. As far as Alberich could judge, the people here ranged in income level from well-off to impoverished. In age they tended to be middle-aged folk, with a sprinkling of elders. The cases were astonishingly petty, which surprised him. Someone had loaned an object or money, and the person to whom it had been lent now claimed it was a gift. A child had vandalized something, and the parents disclaimed responsibility. 
A dog was permitted to run loose and had bitten someone. A chicken flew into a yard and ate seeds and young plants. The angry householder caught, killed, and ate it, and the owner claimed compensation. None of this was earth-shattering, and all of it would have been settled in Carsey with some form of personal confrontation among the parties concerned. In a village, it was usually the responsibility of the headman or council of elders to sort it all out. In a city, well, it generally came to blows. Alberich wasn't quite sure why anyone official was involved in these cases at all. And even if the idea was to keep public fighting at a minimum, there were courts to handle these cases, according to Selene. Why were heralds concerned with these ridiculous little domestic problems at all? More importantly, at least as far as this bodyguard business was concerned, what was Selene learning here that was vital enough to put her here, where she was very vulnerable? His questions remained unanswered for the moment. But he did gradually begin to see the shape of what was called justice in Valdemar. When a grievance was between a rich person and a poor one, it was settled in the favor of the poor one as often as not. In the villages of Carsey, rich men had influence. No one wanted to get on their bad side for the most part. They might be cordially loathed, but no one dared to offend them. At least no one dared except the sun-priests but even they tended not to upset the best source of their golden tithes. So justice tended, especially in small matters, to weigh in on the side of the fellow with the most coin. And in the cities of Carsey, justice was for open sale as often as not. But here, to his bemusement, justice was simply that. But the poor man didn't always win, not when the poor man was in the wrong. There was a case of a shabby, shifty-eyed fellow claiming that a merchant's horse had trampled him and broken his leg, and the merchant's coachman had agreed that yes, that was what had happened, when the shifty fellow had thrown himself deliberately under the horse's hooves. That was when Marilyn glanced over at the princess. "'Truth spell, please, Selene,' he murmured. "'Watch this, Chosen,' Cantor said instantly. "'This is important.' Selene nodded and closed her eyes, a tiny frown of concentration on her face, and slowly a faint blue glow began to gather over the heads of both parties, growing stronger and stronger, until it stood out clearly even in the well-lit courtroom. Alberich kept his face expressionless, but he felt the hair standing up on the back of his neck. When anyone in Carsey used magic— well, the only people who did were sun-priests, and the very few times they ever did so outside of the inner sanctum of a temple, someone usually died. Now, said Marilyn to the coachman, tell me again what happened, precisely. The coachman, an earnest old gentleman who kept his gaze fastened on Marilyn the entire time, repeated his story virtually word for word, while the light about him glowed steadily. He didn't even seem aware of it, although those in the courtroom who were paying attention to this case murmured with satisfaction. "'And now, sir, would you tell me what happened again?' Marilyn continued with a courteous nod to the shabby fellow. "'Nah, look at me leg!' the fellow bleated indignantly, gesturing at the limb in question, which was splinted and bound with clean rags, the only things that were clean about him. "'Anyone with half an eye can tell what's what!' Nevertheless, please tell me again, Marilyn replied, with far more patience than Alberich would have shown. The man began his tale with ill grace, but the moment he got to, And I stepped into the street, and this bastard comes whipping up his horses, the light went out. Although the man clearly was unaware that anything had happened at all, the onlookers saw what Alberich had, a gasp. Not of surprise, but of satisfaction, went up, and Marilyn cut the rest of the man's speech off with a wave of his hand. Sir, you are lying, and this man is telling the truth. He owes you nothing. Marilyn glanced meaningfully at the constables that waited just beyond the barrier. Now the penalties for perjury are substantial in a regular court. But since this is a heraldic hearing, and I have discretion, I shall allow you to leave in peace, providing you do leave quietly. I suggest that you find a more honest means of employing yourself from here on, because you are now in the official records as a perjurer, 
and the next court you bring yourself before will take that into account. The man followed Mirilin's glance and set his jaw angrily, but didn't even try to dispute the judgment. Instead he shuffled off, quickly getting himself out of the door, or at least as quickly as a splinted and wrapped leg would allow, while the coachman thanked Mirilin effusively. But Mirilin waved him off with a slight sign of irritation. Do not thank me for simple justice, he said. Now please, we have a heavy docket to see. The coachman took the hint and followed in the path of the accuser. That was the truth spell chosen, Cantor said with satisfaction. And it is nearly the only sort of magic that you will ever see a herald using. There's mind magic, of course, which is things like mind speech, foreseeing and farseeing. But unless you are the herald doing the mind magic, well, you aren't going to actually see anything. Mirilin is better at the truth spell than Selene, but he wants her to have the practice in setting it, because when she needs to use it, she'll be doing so with many more eyes on her. Is that all it does? he asked. Just show which person is telling the truth? There is a more powerful version that can compel the truth, but it's not likely to be used here. Cantor replied as an old woman with a cat came hobbling up to the table. That's saved for things that are a great deal more serious, and not all heralds can invoke it. You have to have a very strong gift, and it usually has to be one like mind speech. Will I? he began, and stopped. You will. You'll probably be very good at it. But Cantor was evidently sensitive to feelings as well as actual thoughts, for he quickly added, but given that you are going to be the weapons master, I doubt you'll be called upon to do it much, if at all. The afternoon trundled on, under its own momentum of petty grievances, minor misunderstandings, rancor, greed, selfishness, and bewilderment, hurt feelings, a certain amount of genuine grief, and the genuine trust that a herald would put things right. As the afternoon went on, there were several inheritance cases that came up, and in one Mirilin worked something like a miracle, not only getting compromise, but in getting all of the aggrieved parties to apologize to each other and reconcile. Sometimes both parties were equally right and wrong, and it was then that Mirilin truly showed his worth. Somehow he always managed to get both sides to see the rights as well as the wrongs of the case— and for the most part managed to get them to work out a solution without having to have him decree one for them. That was sheer genius, and Alberich did not see how he managed it. Astonishing. No wonder he's assigned to this, Alberich thought more than once, as Mirilin played near invisible midwife to yet another compromise. In many ways, Selene will have to do exactly this when she is queen, Cantor pointed out. A court is a little like a village or a neighborhood. Everyone knows everyone else. Everyone has his own particular agenda to pursue. There is an entire pecking order within the group that outsiders would never be aware of. And above all, you can never forget that someone has to be aware of all the undercurrents and keep conflicts from breaking out into actual feuding. The actual complaints here will be different from those within the court— but the dynamics of personality are fundamentally the same. So that was what Selene was learning here. Perhaps these people weren't as daft as he thought. The court was closed around dinner time with a backlog of people still waiting, but no one complained over much, perhaps because Mirilin had kept things moving fairly briskly. On the way back, Selene and her mentor discussed the intricacies of case and personality with great animation. Alberich achieved his goal of becoming unnoticeable as he rode behind them. This was good. He actually learned far more than he had expected as Mirilin offered the fruits of his hard-earned experience to Selene. And when Selene took her leave of Alberich, he found that he was looking forward to the next session down in Haven. If Mirilin hadn't exactly warmed to Alberich, at least he hadn't rejected Alberich out of hand. He returned to the salle and headed for his shared living quarters with the feeling on the whole that he was rather pleased than otherwise with the way that the day had gone. 
But Dathor's first words, spoken as he walked into the midst of a conversation that had certainly been going on for at least a mark before he arrived, put a chill on his good humor. There you are, Dathor said as the other two heralds in the room looked up at his entrance. What do you know about a group that calls themselves the Tedril Mercenaries? Seven. What of the Tedrils do I know? <laughs> Nothing good, Alberich replied, but only after standing there for a moment blinking stupidly. Such a completely unexpected question left him feeling slightly stunned. The Tedrils? What on earth could that sinister group have to do with Valdemar? And why ask him about them? Why? he asked as the others sat there looking at him, waiting for him to say something more. Because there's word Carsey is hiring them. Daythor's eyes could have pierced a hole in steel, but evidently Alberich's reaction of further shock pleased him, for his expression softened immediately. The Tedrils? Why would Carsey hire them? Who could have learned of them to hire them in the first place? Most people in Carsey had never heard of them, let alone anyone this far north. The only reason he knew anything about them was because of Axel. And the only reason that Axel knew anything about them was because he still had contacts within the mercenary guild, friendly contacts, which was not within the norm for anyone in the Sun's Guard. One evening Axel had told him that the mercenary guild was issuing warnings about the Tedril companies. Since that was just before Alberich was commissioned out of the cadets, Axel had seen fit to warn his protege in case he came up against any tedrils in the course of his duties. He'd shown Alberich the broadside carrying the message, in fact. Don't trust them, said those warnings. Don't fight with them, and don't take a fight against them. And the reasons for these flat edicts had been chilling. Now Carsey was not in good odor with the mercenary guild. The sun priests expected men to fight for the glory of the sun lord, and not for such venial considerations as money and booty. They had, on two separate occasions, hired guild companies and then reneged on the contract. They had paid for those mistakes. With full guild backing, enough caravans led by Carsite merchants crossing the southern border of Carsey had been confiscated to pay for the arrears— and since it had been high-ranking sun-priests who had backed those caravans with their personal fortunes, the bird of ill luck had come home to roost in the right nest. But the guild companies now refused any and all overtures from the sun-priests, and of all of the military leaders in Carsey, only Axel, who was not a leader as such, still had friends in the guild. That had all fallen out while Alberich was still sweeping out the stables to earn extra coppers for his mother. By the time he was in the cadet academy, Carsey was learning that not even non-guild mercenaries would take their coin. Being cut off from the guild left Carsey without a reliable source for extra troops. Being refused by nearly everyone left them forced to supply their needs from within. And therein lay the rub. The regular troops were few. Standing armies were expensive beasts to maintain. Men had to be recruited or conscripted, and if you took too many men off the land, who would till and plant and harvest the fields or tend the herds? Once you had the men, you had to train them, and house and feed them while you were training them. Then, when they weren't actually fighting, which was most of the time, you still had to feed and house them. The sun priests might be able to induce religious fervor enough to get their men to fight without pay, or at least with minimal pay, but they still couldn't get by without food and shelter, no matter how fanatic or pious or even desirous of paradise they were. And besides that, there was a limit to how many troops you could recruit in the first place. Many places in Carsey had poor soil. Poor soil meant that a great deal of work had to be put into a farm to make it prosper. The boys might get dreams of glory in the sun's guard, but their fathers would see to it that they didn't run off when they were needed at home. No matter how hungry for the land and riches of other realms the sun priests were, they were not mad enough to deplete their own land of the very people needed to keep the farms going. By the time Alberich was about to get his first commission— 
They had conscripted so many of the poor in the cities that there was an actual labor shortage, and women were taking jobs that once only men had filled. That had been the reasoning behind permitting bandits to use Carsey as a base to raid into Valdemar. Bandits didn't require the support of the state, and they kept up the ongoing feud with Valdemar without, in theory at least, costing Carsey anything. Except that, of course, bandits didn't keep their bargains, which had required the sun priests use all of their sun's guard to quell them, leaving no fighters for any other little projects they might have in mind. Which left hiring troops as the only viable option, if troops were needed for a campaign against anyone. That meant either mercenary guild companies, which were trustworthy, would not loot or otherwise molest your people, and in general were welcome in the lands of those who hired them, or non-guild troops, which were unpredictable at best, and a hazard to those who hired them at worst. By betraying the mercenary guild, the sun priests had shaved those options to a narrow little rind, because not even the non-guild companies operating anywhere near Carsey would touch a contract. Of course, the only reason why you would need more troops was if you were going to start a war. The last time when the rulers Carsey had reneged on a guild contract, the war had been internal. Some madman out of the hills had decided that Vicandis spoke through him without any evidence or real miracles to back up his assertions. But his cause was convenient for some of the nobles, moneyed merchants, and even a few priests, so they backed him and began a civil war. Both sides of the conflict had been decimated, which was in part how a bastard-born peasant like Alberich had managed to get into cadet training. And if it came to more than border skirmishing, frankly, in Alberich's opinion, Carsey couldn't possibly raise the troops needed from among its own people. If Carsey was planning a real war again, non-guild mercenaries were the only way in which an army could be raised in a hurry. But the Tedrils? Could they possibly be mad enough to use the Tedrils? A war? With whom? Rethwellen, perhaps. In the last conflict, Rethwellen had seized the opportunity to increase its borders, and the sun priests badly wanted the province of Menmeleth. Not Valdemar, surely not. Surely the lessons learned in the past were enough by now. No matter how fanatically the sun priests hated Valdemar and the demon riders, surely they knew better than to engage in open warfare. Now, Rethwellen? That made more sense, and there was some justification for warfare with that land. Menmeleth had once been Carsite. Very, very long ago, of course, but the sun priests had long memories. But to use the tedrils, the very idea made him feel a little sick. Honor. It was hardly honorable to hire creatures like the tedrils for anything. They followed none of the laws of combat. They were more apt to turn to massacre civilians than they were to fight the battles for which they'd been hired. But little I know, Alberich said slowly. And that, hearsay for the most part is, Figure we know less, Daythor said, settling back in his chair and motioning for Alberich to take the one remaining seat left. Alberich did so, but not with any feeling of ease. He sat on the very edge, back straight, muscles tense. It is said, he began, and long ago this was, three, perhaps four generations, that a war there was, in a land south and far, far east of Carsey. Brother fought brother, in a cause none now recall. But those who the Tedrils became lost that war, and instead of surrender into exile went. Determined they were to gain back what lost had been, a land their own to call, where called they no man lord, but nothing they had except their skill at arms. And so mercenaries they became, all of them, company after company after company, which even in defeat enough men was to fill up a country. Now it was his turn to watch as Daythor's eyes bulged just a little with shock. An entire nation of mercenaries, the weapons master asked, aghast. Alberich nodded. Interesting that Daythor had not known that, 
which was the thing most notable about the Tedril companies. Now that was long and long ago, and wanderers they became as well. No wives would they take, except those who would wander and consent to being the property of those who could hold them, and no women in their ranks as fighters at all, camp followers only, have they decreed that women may be. And he found this next part difficult to articulate, but he tried. They altered, it is said. In what way? one of the others asked, abruptly cutting into his narrative. It was the king's own Talamir, not in one of his more elaborate uniforms, but in a set of whites like everyone else's. No wonder Alberich hadn't noticed him until he spoke. Talamir here and waiting to hear what I know? It may be rumor, but they are taking the rumor seriously. Once they had honor and purpose, and things they would not do. Now, he shrugged, nothing there is they will not do, should the reward be high. Anything for loot. War they bring against the unarmed, as well as fighting true battles. I have heard dreadful things. He had to pause, shaking his head. With no wives, only women held by the strongest, no families, their ranks then grew but slowly, and difficult it was to replace those who fell. So now, anyone they take into their ranks who presents himself, thief, murderer, it matters not, has he a strong arm. And thus, cruelty upon cruelty piles. Dathor and Talamir exchanged a worried look. But Alberich wasn't quite finished. The greatest change is this. No more seeking the home. They look only for a home. Should any offer a new land in reward, it is said, it is said that there is nothing they would not do. He gnawed his lower lip, thinking about the cold-blooded killers that Axel had described, and what they would willingly do for anyone who was so foolish as to offer them a new homeland. His blood ran cold at the very idea. But this hearsay only is, he amended. None I know has seen them, spoken to them, fought against them, nor with them. Should any in Valdemar seek them to hire, warned they should be. It is said, moreover, that no sworn word do they truly hold by but their own, to their own, and they can and have turned against those who hired them. Someone had better find a way to get that message across to your own people, Daythor replied grimly, because word has reached us that they're thinking about hiring the Tedril companies, and not just one of them, all of them. Now Alberich went icy cold all over with sudden dread, and was glad he was sitting down. Hiring one or two of the Tedril companies he could just barely see, Axel was not high enough in the ranks for his warnings to be heeded over much on that score. But all of them? There was only one reward that would tempt all of them together. Madness, he said flatly. Surely not. Surely not even the maddest and most fanatical of priests would hazard all to cast their lot with the Tedrils. That would be insane. As Axel had described them, having the Tedrils in one's midst was like playing host to a large pack of wild dogs. So long as they were full-bellied and content, the worst that would happen was that there would be a little damage to small towns here and there, if the scum that now filled out the ranks of the Tedrils grew bored. Perhaps rape, a bit of looting, possibly a few houses burned. The worst that would happen if they are satisfied. Rape, looting. Oh, my poor people. His stomach turned over. He thought about his border villages, and his throat and chest tightened, his gut roiling. No worse, perhaps, than the bandits were already doing on the borders. But to face it from bandits, and then receive worse from those beasts, who in turn were hired by the priests, supposed to protect them, that would be bad enough. But if the pay chests were not as full as promised or stopped altogether, the pack would turn and fire and the sword would rain at least until the pay chests came again. His chest felt too tight. His heart ached at the mere thought. If this were true, the only way to hire the whole nation was to promise a homeland. Would Carsey offer Menmelith? 
Possibly. Menmeleth was no great prize. But would Carsey then want the Tedrils as neighbors? So it would be Valdemar. The priests hate Valdemar enough to allow anything, so long as Valdemar is left gutted, kingless, and without the heralds. Carsey as a new homeland probably would not tempt them. It was too hard a land. They wanted something like that dream that their land had become for them, a place fat and rich, soft and sweet. But they would take out their spleen on Carsey if it promised them such a homeland and failed to deliver it into their hands. That's what we've heard, Daythor said, shrugging. Anything more you can tell us? Alberich shook his head. What more could he say? Dread was a sickening lump in his belly. This rumor? I hope it false proves. Our sources are good, was all that Talamir would say. The third man, who was not in whites and did not identify himself, only grunted. He looked about as friendly as Mirilin, which was to say not at all. There was no doubt in Alberich's mind that the third man did not trust him. And why should he, if even some, if not most, of the heralds were ambivalent about Alberich? But we aren't, Cantor said with some force. The warmth that followed that pronouncement made the cold nausea lift a little and eased some of the churning of his gut. It certainly made him feel less as if he was standing alone facing a suspicious mob. I know, thank you. Knowing that the companions now accepted him helped a little, but he knew what he wanted to say, that he had given up everything, everything when he was brought here, that he had thrown his lot in with Valdemar, given his word, and that word was not given lightly. Couldn't they see that? This unknown man who watched him from under furrowed brows, didn't he realize that? And he wanted to say that if his own people had sunk so low as to hire the Tedrils to do their dirty work, then surely even the Sun Lord would abandon them. But he said none of this, for it would not matter if he did. Instead he sat, stone-faced and silent, and waited for the others to say something, even if it was only to suggest that he leave. Finally, Daythor hissed a little between his teeth. I don't suppose, he said carefully, that you'd know anybody likely to, well, be helpful, inside Carsey, that is. We'd like to know more about these rumors from someone with good, hard facts. That was a little better. Even if it sniffed around the edges of that promise they'd made him, the promise never to ask him to work against his own people. But if those who are supposed to lead my people have already betrayed them, how can knowing if that betrayal is true or false be acting against the people? Depend it does, Alberich replied just as carefully. On what it is by helpful, you mean. Information, Talamir said. Nothing more, and nothing that would hurt Carsey. Only what will protect us without hurting your people. Alberich turned Talamir's words over and over in his mind as the other three watched him, because he did know someone who might, just might, be willing to be helpful. Of all the people that Alberich knew, Axel Tarseline was the most likely to be enraged and offended if this tale of hiring the Tedrils was true and was, because of his own contacts, the most likely to know if it was truth or rumor spread to discomfit the enemies of Carsey. For Axel Tarseline, trainer of cadets, had already been a deeply troubled man when Alberich knew him. Someone, another young high-born officer, had once described him with a sneer as one of the old school, as if being a man of honor and integrity, whose word was seldom given and always kept, was somehow unfashionable and old-fashioned. And the shifts to which the son of the sun had fallen by the time Alberich had been commissioned had left Axel profoundly disturbed. He was glad, he had confessed, to the younger Alberich when the two of them had shared a farewell flask on the night of Alberich's commission, that he was no longer in a position where he found himself forced to obey orders which went against his conscience. And it is a harder world today he had said sadly, staring at the last few drops in the bottom of his flagon. 
you may discover that you have to stop thinking or stop obeying. I hope that the Sun Lord will guide you, young one. He had said no more on the subject, but Alberich knew which path he had taken, though not without qualms and not without remorse. I stopped thinking, at least until Cantor came to me. Just as he knew that Axel had not stopped thinking, that was not Axel's way. But as long as Axel remained a weapons master to cadets, he would never be given an order that forced him to disobey either. Axel held fast to his own honor only by making sure he was in a place where he would not have to sacrifice it. Which of them had been given the easier path? Was it better to obey and not think, or think and try to ignore and be glad you personally didn't have to obey? Possible it is, he said very slowly, that there is a man, but possible it is not directly to approach him, Friends he keeps in the mercenary guild. There it is you must go. Speak with you he may. Deny you he may. Alberich shrugged. I cannot say. His own decision he must make. Fair enough. And we've got enough friendly contacts with the guild to ferret out whoever knows him, Daythor said, nodding agreement. His name? Axel Tarseline, weapons master to the Sunsguard cadets. Once again, Daythor and Talamir exchanged a look, this time a startled one. Should he add something from himself, so that Axel knew who had revealed him? Do you think your name would make Axel change his mind? Cantor asked. It might. The now familiar sickness rose in him again. And would you want it to? Cantor continued. Or would you rather— I would rather there was no pressure on my old teacher but that of his own thoughts— Alberich said firmly. Cantor let the matter drop. And to his immense relief, Daythor made no request for some token from Alberich. Nor did the third man, who felt perhaps that a message from one already branded as a traitor would do his cause with Axel no good. Axel Tarseline. Daythor and the third man exchanged a look, and the third man grunted. That's one more name than we had before especially if he decides to talk. Yes. Alberich didn't elaborate. Daythor didn't pressure him to. The third man got up to leave. Daythor poured a tankard full of beer and pushed it across the table to Alberich as the third man turned at the door, gave Talamir and Daythor a little nod, and walked out. Alberich picked up the tankard and drained half of it in one gulp. He felt a great need of it at that moment, and it did a little, a very little, to settle his unsettled stomach and nerves. It is only a rumor, Cantor said suddenly. That is all. No matter that this spy of Sendar's has convinced everyone that it is more than that. He has no proof. He has only heard stories and a name. For no one he has spoken to has seen the Tedrils or their captains, or even an agent that may be said to come from them. Relief made Alberich's hands a little steadier as he put down the tankard. If anyone will know the truth of the rumor, it will be Axel, he replied. And if it is true, I believe that Axel will speak. And in any case, it is out of your hands. Well, no matter what, Talamir, it's out of our hands, Daythor sighed, echoing Cantor's words. This is a thing for those with talents you and I don't have nor Alberich either. Alberich regarded him broodingly. I could, but a pledge you made to me. And we'll keep it, Talamir said with finality. Though I will admit to you freely that this is one reason why the Lord Marshal's man was here. He wanted us to pressure you into crossing the border again, to spy for Valdemar. Wordlessly, Alberich shook his head. Daythor snorted. Aye, we told him as much, then asked him to his face if he'd really trust you if you agreed. And he had to admit that he wouldn't, so what's the point? We know you're as sound as a good apple, but to the likes of him, a man that turns may well turn again. God's help us, though. I sometimes wonder what we're to do with you. Alberich eased his dry mouth with another swallow. What you have done. There is what else to do to bring trust where there is none. Not much. 
doubters can't accuse you of much here with my eye on you, and keeping you apart from the rest means that nobody's going to try and make trouble for you. What do you think of young Selene? An abrupt change of subject, but Alberich answered it quickly enough. Steady, thoughtful, careful, and untried. He saw the questions in Dathor and Talamir's eyes, and tried to answer them. No opposition has she met. No loss, no pain. No great joys, either. No love. With the single eye she sees now, clearly in black and white, as young things do. Until she has more wisdom, well, who knows how she will see then. When great events come upon her, then you will see of what she is made, not until but the makings of a king she has. And she thinks, which, with more than most young things, is not the case. Told you so, Dathor said in an aside to Talamir. The king's own just shrugged. Dathor turned back to Alberich. She came up with this bodyguard notion on her own, but I think it's no bad idea having you instead of one of the guard, especially when she's with Marilyn. Lad in a guard uniform puts people on edge. Fella in whites makes them wonder if the heralds have some reason to haul in more than one for a simple herald's court. But a fellow in greys? Nah, that makes them relax. We want someone with her to keep her back covered without making people nervous that he's there. People don't necessarily expect a fella in greys to be much of a fighter, and they don't think of him as a fancier sort of constable. They'll take you, I'll be bound, for another trainee on internship. Maybe another highborn. Alberich smiled slowly, seeing what Dathor was getting at. Talamir only looked strained. But once the council finds out there will be difficulties, the king's own said reluctantly, then shook his head. Yes, and I admit, it is my responsibility to smooth them out. Well, the easiest way will be by simply not saying anything for now, I suppose. I'll have a word with Mirilin. We already have via Eston, and he won't be mentioning Alberich's presence as the heir's bodyguard to anyone, not even to other heralds, Cantor said promptly, and by the sudden startled look on Talamir's face, Tavor must have said the same thing at the same moment. Dathor laughed aloud. The word must have reached him as well. Talamir coughed. Well, apparently you have far more friends here than I had thought, Alberich. So, unless someone from the council actually sees you at Selene's back and realizes who you are, apparently we'll keep that much from their attention for a while. His face grew distant again for a moment, and he added, Long enough that perhaps by the time the council realizes just who Selene's bodyguard is, there will be far fewer doubts about you. Occurred to you, had it, that we being managed are... Alberich asked him, in a moment of stark frankness. By them? They knew who he meant. The companions. He half expected Cantor to be annoyed by the statement, but he sensed instead a dry amusement. He got a look of startlement, then one of understanding from both the heralds. Oh, always, at least to an extent, Talamir replied, with the same utter honesty. And in some cases that's all to the good. His voice took on a different coloring then, a hint of wry tartness. But let me tell you a bit of home truth, Alberich of Carsey, something that I do not tell the children, because they are children and need managing. It is your right and privilege to tell your beloved companion just where he can shove anything he tells you or asks of you, if it goes completely against your better judgment. He raised an eyebrow. As even my Tavor has found, to his occasional shock and dismay. Dathor whooped with laughter and applauded. By the gods, Talamir, good for you, and well said. Now Alberich expected Cantor to be completely offended, but instead he heard an ironic chuckle in his mind. Tell the king's own that it is our right and privilege to do the same with our chosen, you know. Alberich started to repeat the remark, but Talamir held up his hand. Never mind, Tavor has said the same as your cantor, I expect. My point is that we are adults, and although the companions have certain abilities and information that we their heralds may not, well, the reverse is true as well. 
You've got a mind of your own and experience that your companion doesn't have, and I presume sound judgment. Don't be afraid to use them, and if you feel strongly about something, be prepared to insist you be heard. The companions don't know everything. As Taver pointed out to a few of them the other night, they aren't infallible. They can make mistakes, and advice can go both ways. Harold and companion are meant to be partners, not superior and servant. In the beginnings for most trainees, exactly because they are younglings, that isn't always the case, Daythor put in. Sometimes chosen and companion are the same age and learn together, but sometimes one's full grown while the other's still a child or just a little older. But in your case, you're both adults, and you start out with a partnership from the beginning. Talamir nodded emphatically. We each give and we each take, and what we do should be the result of cooperation, not dictation. Don't forget that. I shall not, Alberich replied. But for the moment, Cantor it is who knows this land and people, not I. True enough. Talamir hefted his tankard and looked at Daythor, who poured him, and without his asking Alberich as well, another round. The beer foamed up, leaving a pleasantly bitter aroma in the air. Daythor and Talamir exchanged another pregnant glance. Alberich's neck prickled. Something was still in the air. Talamir was not here only because of the rumors coming out of Carsey. Alberich, I'm here for more than one reason. I think that you already have some inkling of this, so I'm going to put it in plain language. Talamir continued, rubbing his thumb along the side of the tankard. As a fighting commander, I suspect that you have, more than once, had to do what was expedient rather than what was... Ideal? Alberich suggested. An idealist I never was. Liar, Cantor objected mildly. Who was it agonizing over the fate of the border villages just now? Who is it that values honor above everything else? Hush! He flexed his shoulder muscles. They felt tense. Something was coming. He was just beginning to make out the shape of it, and he wasn't certain he was going to like it. You have a thought? More than one. Actually, I have... We have a job that needs doing. It's something I used to do before I got too crippled up, Daythor said, with just a hint of regret, bitterness, that he was no longer what he had been. I don't know that you'd have the stomach for it, but I've got to tell you, Alberich, for all your skill, you're the last person I'd have looked to for this, except for one thing. Taver trusts you. He thinks you can do this, so Talamir says. Taver said to ask you. Talamir added and sighed, his brow furrowed with concern and uncertainty. Taver might have made a suggestion, but Talamir is not completely certain how good an idea it is, Cantor put it. Well, that was clear enough. Talamir cleared his throat awkwardly. You saw the Lord Marshal's man. You know that there are such things as agents. Well, we heralds have them as well, and we need another. He nodded warily, but might have prevaricated, except that in that unguarded instant Cantor simply edged into his mind and showed him what it was that Daythor and Talamir wanted him to do. Agent was too small a word to encompass the task. In fact, Alberich was more uniquely suited to the job than even Daythor had been, because of his foreign origin. There were places where Daythor would always stand out, because Daythor was nobly born for all that he pretended he was common. What you'd been born and bred to was difficult to hide, especially when you were under stress. But Alberich was as common as clay, and used to moving in the lowest of circles. Under stress, he slipped into that world as easily as a bottom fish slipping into the muddy river bottom. Mostly, Daythor had collected information, in the court and out of it, from the servants' common room in the palace to the vilest alleys near Exile's Gate, to the scented rooms where courtiers fenced with words. Mostly, but a time or two, Daythor had done more than collect intelligence and pass it on to Talamir. 
a so-called agent who was also a herald, had an extraordinary degree of freedom to act as he saw fit, and once Daythor had used his knowledge of traps to cause a single fatal accident. And he had agonized over that murder, for murder it was, and never mind that the man had been the hidden heart of a vile trade, and no one had been or would be able to bring him to justice. Daythor had murdered and knew it, and still agonized over it. As you would, as you would act, if there was no other way and you would be decisive about it. Yes, he would on both counts. But although he would regret murder, for he hated killing, he would not allow such a thing to ride him with guilt afterward. He felt his pulse throbbing in the hollow of his throat, and his collar felt too tight. Yes, he would. Some things had to be done. And was it better to stain innocent hands with blood, or add one more stain to the sleeve of one already steeped in it? The king could have agents like the Lord Marshal had, men who would take their orders and carry them out, and leave the question of whether the orders were morally justified to someone else. The king did not want that. He wanted a herald. He wanted someone who did not simply take orders. He wanted someone who would think, weigh, and act, and agonize over it afterwards, perhaps, because there would be that necessary question when it was all over. But it had to be a particular kind of herald, and such folk did not emerge from among the children, children with their shining certainty of right and wrong, that came with their companions to fill the rooms of the Collegium every year. He would not besmirch those pure hearts, would not twist them into something that they were not. It took a herald like Daythor, like Alberich, who was chosen as an adult full-grown, who knew about moral ambiguities and difficult choices, like Daythor, who had himself been one of the Lord Marshal's agents before he was chosen, like Daythor's master, the weapons master before him, who had grown up a child of poverty, seen the evils of the world, very young, wiser than his years, though his parents had sheltered him from what they could. No such man, or woman, though perhaps it would have been harder for a woman, had come to Daythor and Talamir until now, and they were not altogether certain that Alberich was the right material for this task. But he was what they had, and they were in terrible need of some man for the job. Talamir was altogether too recognizable and too desperately needed to have the time for such covert walkings, and as for Daythor, who could barely hobble to the Collegium for a council meeting or a meal now and again, well... All this poured into his mind as the other two sat quietly, waiting for him to assimilate it all. Did they know what Cantor was showing him? Of course they know. It is our way. I can show you in moments what would take them days to explain. Ah, expedience, so the companions knew it too. Somehow that made him feel more akin to Cantor, not less. He took a deep breath and regarded both of them with somber eyes. It is much of me that you ask, he said slowly. It is surprised I am. When I have here been how long? Conscious or unconscious? Daythor retorted and shrugged. You've been a real part of things for maybe a fortnight, and I would never in a hundred thousand years think to trust you with this, except for Tavor. Why Tavor? he asked Cantor silently. Why, if companions are as fallible as any other? Because Tavor can make mistakes, but never that kind of mistake. Never ever a mistake in judging a person's character, his heart and soul came the reply, and then he got the sensation that Cantor was conferring with someone else. Talamir and Daythor watched him closely, weighing his least expression, just as Cantor added, Come outside if you trust me. There is something more you need to have that Tavor wishes to share with you, and not just for making this decision. There were so many overtones to that deceptively simple statement that it was Alberich's turn to start with surprise. There was more than a hint that this was something as important as anything that anyone had ever told him in all of his life, something life-shatteringly important, and a subtle shading that this was something Tavor had never shared with any other herald. 
Not even Talamir. Not even Talamir. Suddenly he had to know what this thing was. Rude I do not wish to be, he said abruptly. But think on this, with no eyes on me, I must for a little. He stood up even as he said this, and the other two heralds watched him measuringly, but with a leavening of understanding. You don't have to give us an answer right away, Talamir said, as if making up his own mind about it. But if you would consider it... Tedrils, and now this... Alberich shook his head. I must think alone, but consider it with all seriousness I will, and I will answer you soon. He did not define soon. The other two remained in their seats as he stalked off, heads swirling dizzily with a dozen contradictory thoughts. He wanted to go back to Carsey. The very notion of the tedrils being near there made his skin crawl. He wanted to hide here and never hear of Carsey again. He didn't want this new job that Talamir and Dathor had suggested. And yet if he didn't take it, the tasks would be done, but by men who left their thinking and their morality in the hands of others and merely followed orders, and never cared what the repercussions would be, never wondered if they had done the right thing, never thought at all. The bare idea was repugnant. And he wanted to see just what this secret that the companion Taver held could be, and how it could possibly, possibly have any relevance to him. Taver was waiting outside, just out of sight of the windows of Dathor's sitting-room, with Cantor beside him. The sun was setting, and the air lay thick and sweet and still among the trees around the sow. But there was a hint of the bitterness of dying leaves in the sweetness, and the poignant suggestion of autumn coming soon. Soon. Thank you for coming, Taver said gravely directly into Alberich's mind, startling him. Taver's mind voice was distinctive, rich and deep, with a little breath of echo to it. There was a certainty and stillness to it, as if Taver was a great tree, with his head in the clouds and his roots reaching down to the bedrock, and powerful, without ever making Alberich feel the power as anything other than potential. You're welcome, Alberich replied awkwardly, pulse hammering in his throat, feeling as if he was the one being granted the favor. This was strange. This was very strange. Perhaps the strangest thing that had happened to him since he had arrived here. That odd thing that they called his gift fluttered in the back of his soul with something that was not quite warning. I think, I hope, that what I have to show you will make many things clearer for you, Taver said with infinite gentleness. Please. Come and place one hand upon my neck, and look into my eyes. Puzzled, Alberich did as he was told. He touched the electric softness of Taver's neck, looked into living blue, and paradise engulfed him as the heavens opened up and spilled out glory. And when he came to himself again he was lying on the grass, staring at the hooves of the two companions, Silver hooves, why didn't I notice that before? With a mind so full, it felt as if it couldn't possibly fit in the narrow confines of his head. Mortal men should not look into heaven. If they do, they should not be surprised when all they can remember is that they were there for one brief, radiant moment. He certainly was not. But that moment had given him something he had needed and had not known he needed until the need was not there any more. He sat up slowly and felt the back of his skull gingerly, but the lump he expected to encounter and the headache he anticipated were not there. I took your body and caused you to lie down rather than fall down, Alberich, Taver said as Cantor wuffed at his ear. I knew what would happen— and it was no thought of mine that you take hurt from it. Alberich stared at the companion, who was more, so much more than he appeared, that it made him dizzy even to nibble at the edges of the thought. You've never done this to Talamir. Talamir never required it. He is of Voldemar, blood and bone. You were floundering, 
drowning without a foundation. I think you were not even aware of it, except that you sought for it desperately without knowing what you sought for. Have I given you what you needed? He had been looking, and yes, desperately, Taver was right. He thought that he'd been thinking, but he'd really been cluttering up his head with the minutia of his new life here, so that he didn't have to think about anything deeper. But if it came to that, he'd been looking for that foundation all his life. He'd tried to make his honor into a place to stand, but honor needed something to be based in. Ah, there was contentment in that thought. Good. Good. Oh, this was so much more than good. He had been drowning with no land in sight, yet suddenly Taver had put firm ground beneath his feet. Uncertainty that had been with him for so long it had become an uneasy part of him had been dispelled, popped like a bubble, exploded like the inflated bladder that it was. The monster in the closet was gone, and something so much better had taken its place. Taver nodded his graceful head. Alberich, will you trust me again? Alberich blinked at such nonsense. Trust him? Trust him? Trust to so pure a spirit? A being so near to the divine that he could scarcely believe there was no glow of holiness about him? Trust a being that he should by all rights be worshipping? Taver shook his head and mane and wickered a laugh. Oh, come now, Alberich, I am not so much as all that. A servant only, nothing more. A servant? As much a servant as, as the firecat of legend, he whispered, hardly daring to speak. As the guardian of the gates of paradise. Exactly so, no more than that. Taver bent to touch a soft and very, very material nose to Alberich's ear. Come, stand into his eyes as you did mine, and this time open your heart to him as you have not yet done. Give up your walls, Alberich of Carsey. Take them down and let him inside. He could fight the command of one of Vicandis's priests. He could no more stand against the same command as given by Taver than he could have fought a whirlwind. He did as he was told. He looked deeply into those sapphire eyes and opened his heart, and Cantor stepped gracefully into it and filled it, and until that moment he had no notion how empty it had been, nor how lonely he had been. And as all of the knowledge and understanding and revelations that had come to him in the past few moments settled into place, like doves coming to rest on their proper perches for the night, he knew truly and completely, that there was something above them all. Call it Vacandis Sunlord or any other name. He could no more understand that something than a flea could understand a man. But it was there. He would continue to have other doubts, other fears, but that one was gone. And there was something else, much nearer and homelier, that would also be with him as a certainty as rock-solid as the earth beneath him, and undoubted as the sky above. No matter what happened, in the next moment, or moon, or year, or lifetime, he and Cantor would never be alone or lonely again. Chosen, he whispered, and buried his face in Cantor's mane. Chosen, Cantor replied with all the love that great heart could hold. And it was, oh, yes, it was more, so much more than enough. <laughs>